Preface to Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso, translated by Henry P. Horton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso, M.D., Professor of Psychiatry and Criminal Anthropology in the University of Turin, translated by Henry P. Orton, M.A., with an introductory by Maurice Parmeli, Ph.D., Assistant Professor of Sociology in the University of Missouri, author of Principles of Criminal Anthropology, etc. Copyright 1911 by Little Brown and Company. All rights reserved. General Introduction to the Modern Criminal Science Series At the National Conference of Criminal Law and Criminology held in Chicago at Northwestern University in June 1909, the American Institute of Criminal Law and Criminology was organized, and, as a part of its work, the following resolution was passed. Whereas, it is exceedingly desirable that important treatises on criminology in foreign languages be made readily accessible in the English language, resolved that the President appoint a committee of five with power to select such treatises as in their judgment should be translated, and to arrange for their publication. The committee appointed under this resolution has made careful investigation of the literature of the subject, as consulted by frequent correspondence. It has selected several works from among the mass of material. It has arranged with publisher, with authors, and with translators, for the immediate undertaking and rapid progress of the task. It realizes the necessity of educating the professions, and the public by the wide diffusion of information on this subject. It desires here to explain the considerations which have moved it in seeking to select the treatises best adapted to the purpose. For the community at large, it is important to recognize that criminal science is a larger thing than criminal law. The legal profession, in particular, has a duty to familiarize itself with the principles of that science as a sole means for intelligent and systematic improvement of the criminal law. Two centuries ago, while modern medical science was still young, medical practitioners proceeded upon two general assumptions, one as to the cause of disease, the other as to its treatment. As to the cause of disease, disease was sent by the inscrutable will of God. No man could fathom that will, nor its arbitrary operation. As to the treatment of disease, there were believed to be a few remedial agents of universal efficacy. Calomel and bloodletting, for example, were two of the principal ones. A larger or smaller dose of calomel, a greater or less quantity of bloodletting, this blindly indiscriminate mode of treatment was regarded as orthodox for all common varieties of ailment. And so his calomel pill and his bloodletting lancet were carried everywhere with him by the doctor. Nowadays, all this is past in medical science. As the cause of disease, we know that they are facts of nature, various but distinguishable by diagnosis and research, and more or less capable of prevention or control or counteraction. As to the treatment, we now know that there are very specific modes of treatment for specific causes or symptoms, and that the treatment must be adapted to the cause. In short, the individualization of disease in cause and its treatment is a dominant truth of modern medical science. The same truth is now known about crime, but the understanding and the application of it are just opening upon us. The old and still dominant thought is, as to cause, that as crime is caused by inscrutable moral free will of the human being, doing or not doing the crime, just as it pleases, absolutely free in advance, at any moment in time, to choose or not to choose the criminal act, and therefore in itself the sole and ultimate cause of crime. As a treatment, there are just two traditional measures used in variant doses for all kinds of crime and all kinds of persons. Jail or a fine, for death is now employed in rare cases only. But modern science, here as in medicine, recognises that crime also, like disease, as natural causes. It need not be asserted for one moment that crime is a disease, but it does have natural causes, that is, circumstances which work to produce it in a given case. And as to treatment, modern science recognizes that penal or remedial treatment cannot possibly be indiscriminate and machine-like, but must be adapted to the cause and to the man as affected by those causes. Common sense and logic alike require, inevitably, that the moment we predict a specific cause for an undesirable effect, the remedial treatment must be specially adapted to that cause. Thus the great truth of the present and the future for criminal science is the individualization of penal treatment for that man and for the cause of that man's crime. 
Now, this truth opens up a vast field for re-examination. It means that we must study all the possible data that can be causes of crime. The man's hereditary, the man's physical and moral makeup, his emotional temperament, the surroundings of his youth, his present home, and other conditions, or the influencing circumstances. And it means that the effect of different methods of treatment, old or new, for different kinds of men and of causes, must be studied, experimented, and compared. Only in this way can accurate knowledge be reached, and new efficient measures be adopted. All this has been going on in Europe for 40 years past, and in limited fields in this country. All the branches of science that can help have been working. Anthropology, medicine, psychology, economics, sociology, philanthropy, penology. The law alone has abstained. The science of law is the one to be served by all this. But the public is general, and the legal profession in particular have remained either ignorant of the entire subject or indifferent to the entire scientific movement. And the ignorance or indifference has blocked the way to progress in administration. The Institute therefore takes upon itself, as one of its aims, to inculcate the study of modern criminal science as a passing duty for the legal profession and for the thoughtful community at large. One of its principal modes of stimulating and aiding this study is to make available in the English language the most useful treatise now extant in the continental languages. Our country has started late. There is much to cap it up with in the results reached elsewhere. We shall, to be sure, profit by the long period of argument and theorizing and experimentation which European thinkers and workers have passed through, but to reap that profit, the results of their experience must be made accessible in the English language. The effort in selecting this series of translations has been to choose those works which best represent the various schools of thought in criminal science, the general results reached, the points of contact or of controversy, and the contrast of method. Having always in view that class of works which have a more than local value and could best be serviceable to criminal science in our country. As a science has various aspects and emphasis, the anthropological, psychological, sociological, legal, statistical, economic, pathological, due regard was paid in the selection to a representation of all these aspects. And as the several continental countries have contributed in different ways to these various aspects, France, Germany, Italy, most abundantly, but the others each chair. The effort was made also to recognise the different contributions as far as feasible. The selection made by the committee, then, represents its judgment of the works that are most useful and most instructive for the purpose of translation. It is a conviction that this series, when completed, will furnish the American student of criminal science a systematic and sufficient acquaintance with the controlling doctrines and methods that now hold the stage of thought in continental Europe. Which of the various principles and methods will prove best adapted to help our problems can only be told after our students and workers have tested them in our own experience. But it is certain that we must first acquaint ourselves with these results of a generation of European thought. In closing, the committee thinks it desirable to refer the members of the Institute for purposes of further investigation of the literature to the preliminary bibliography of modern criminal law and criminology. Bulletin number one of the Gary Library of Law in Northwestern University, already issued to members of the Congress. The committee believes that some of the Anglo-American works listed therein will be found useful. Committee on Translations Chairman John H. Wigmore Professor of Law in Northwestern University, Chicago Ernst Freund Professor of Law in the University of Chicago Maurice Parmel Professor of Sociology in the State University of Missouri Roscoe Pound, Professor of Law in Harvard University. Robert B. Scott, formerly Professor of Political Science in the State University of Wisconsin. W. M. W. Smithers, Secretary of the Comparative Law Bureau of the American Bar Association, Philadelphia, PA. Introduction to the English Version the treatment of the criminal up to the latter part of the 19th century is dominated by the theories of the classical school of criminology. This school was based upon the thought of the 18th century philosophers. Its chief founder was the distinguished Italian criminologist Caesar Beccaria, in his great work entitled Crimes and Punishments, published in 1764. He condemned the almost unlimited power which judges frequently had in determining the punishment of criminals. This power frequently led to inhumane and unjust treatment of the criminal. Filled with a humanitarian feeling, 
and dominated by the democratic ideas of the time, Beccaria insisted that no punishment should be greater than the crime warranted, and that all men should be equal in the eyes of the law. Thus the fundamental principle of the classical school was that the treatment of a criminal should be determined by the character of the crime that he had committed. In each criminal case, it was to be determined what crime had been committed, and then the penalty designated by the penal code was to be applied regardless of the personality of the criminal. We can now discern many variations in the treatment of the criminal from the principle laid down by the classical school. Criminals guilty of the same crime are very frequently not subjected to the same penalty, and the variations in their treatment are not usually due to the differences in their social standing as is frequently the case previous to the time of the classical school. The treatment of the criminal is being based more and more upon his own characteristics rather than upon the character of the crime he had committed. How has this great change come about? The latest credit for it is undoubtedly due to the great Italian criminal anthropologist Cesar Lombroso, who died in October 1909. Few men have suffered the amount of criticism and abuse that Lombroso experienced during his lifetime. But if the degree of interest and difference of opinion aroused by his ideas and the extensive literature devoted to the discussion of them are any indications of his influence, Lombroso is certainly the most important figure in criminological science since Beccaria. Let us see what were the characteristics of his teaching which gave them so great an influence. Lombroso was one of the group of great thinkers of the 19th century who had the courage and the wisdom to apply the positive inductive method of modern science to the study of human and social phenomena. He was not the first one to search for the causes of human conduct in the physiological and mental characteristics of the individual for others, such as Galenus, Gaul, and Morel, have preceded him in this study. But no one of these had carried his analysis very far, and the methods used were not always very scientific. Lombroso devoted his whole life to his study and used thoroughly inductive methods. His teachings immediately aroused great opposition, in the first place because the prejudice which existed against attributing human conduct to natural causes. But because of this opposition was also due to the fact that in his first writings he attributed criminal conduct almost entirely to the characteristics of the criminal himself. That, however, he recognised later in the social cause of crime is indicated by this book in which ample weight is given to these social causes. Lombroso commenced his studies by spending several years in studying the characteristics of the criminals in the Italian penitentiaries. In 1876, he published the first edition of his Le Homo Delinquente. In this book, he set forth his theory that crime is caused almost entirely by the anthropological characteristics of the criminal. But in later editions of the same work, he gave more and more weight to the social causes of crime, and ultimately published the work of which the present volume is a translation. While several of his less important books have been translated into English, neither of his two principal works have ever before been translated. Thus, it is that the English-speaking world is acquainted with his theories largely through hearsay. The Committee on European Translations of the American Institute of Criminal Law and Criminology has chosen the second of his great works for translation in the belief that his theories should be better known in the country. The Institute devoted itself to the work of applying science in the administration of the criminal law, and we are glad to know that Lombroso approved of its work in the following words written shortly before his death. I beg to express my satisfaction at learning of the call for the National Conference on Criminal Law and Criminology to take place in Chicago. It will mark a new era in the progress of criminal law. If I could offer any suggestion to so competent a body of men, would be to emphasize the importance of apportioning penalties, not according to the offence, but according to the offender. To this end, the probation system, which it is the great credit of America to have introduced, should be extended so as to suit the offender's type and individuality. It is futile to fix a term of imprisonment for the born criminal, but it is most necessary to shorten to the minimum the term for the emotional offender and to modify it for the occasional offender and to place a letter under the supervision of a judge, and not to let the fate be so fixed that it amounts merely to a modern form of slavery. The present volume discusses, in the main, the social causes of crime. It has seemed well to the committee that in this introduction there should be given a critical summary of Lombroso's theory as to the anthropological causes of crime 
is set forth in his great work on Criminal Man. A quotation from Lebozo's opening speech at the 6th Congress of Criminal Anthropology at Turin in April 1906 will give the key to the first stage in the development of his theory. In 1870, I was carrying on for several months researches in the prisons and asylums of Pavia upon cadavers and living persons in order to determine upon substantial differences between the insane and the criminals without succeeding very well. At last I found in the skull of Rigand a very long series of atavistic anomalies, above all an enormous middle occipital fossa and a hypertrophy of the vermis, analogous to those that are found in inferior vertebrates. At the sight of these strange anomalies, the problem of the nature and of the origin of the criminal seemed to me resolved. The characteristics of primitive men and their inferior animals must be reproduced in our times. Many facts seem to confirm this hypothesis, above all the psychology of the criminal, the frequency of tattooing and of professional slang. The passions, as much more fleeting as they are more violent, above all that of vengeance, the lack of foresight which resembles courage and courage which alternates with cowardice, the idleness which alternates with the passion for play and activity. His first conception of the criminal, which was greatly modified later on, was, then, that the criminal is an atavistic phenomenon reproducing a type of the past. In order to find the origin of this atavistic phenomenon, he goes back not only to savage man, but also to animals and even to plants. Crime and criminals are, strictly speaking, human phenomena, and are, therefore, not to be found outside of human society. But when a criminal displays a strong tendency towards crime which results from abnormal or pathological, physiological and psychological characteristics, it is necessary to search in the lowest species for characteristics which correspond to those of the criminal. The acts which result from these characteristics Lombroso called the equivalents of crime. Among plants he finds such equivalents in the habits of the insectivorous plants. It is questionable, however, if the so-called murders of insects by these plants can be considered as equivalents of crime, since they are committed by one species against another and belong in the same category with man's habit of eating animals and plants. But among animals are to be found veritable equivalents of crime, and as contrary to the general habits and welfare of a species by one of its members. Cannibalism, infanticide, and parricide frequently occur, while murder, maltreatment, and theft are used to procure food, to secure command, and for many other reasons. In the past, the idea that crimes are committed by animals was so strong that in ancient times and in the Middle Ages, animals were frequently condemned according to juridical forms or acts harmful to man. Various causes for these equivalents of crime among animals have been noted, as for example, congenital anomalies of the brain. Veterinary surgeons recognize these anomalies to give them as the causes for the misbehavior of horses. Other causes are antipathy causing murder, old age resulting in ill temper, sudden anger, physical pain, etc. Not only the equivalents of crime, but those of punishment also have been noted among the lower species. Many cases are on record of a group of animals having torn to pieces one of its members who had committed an act contrary to the welfare of the group, or had failed in performing its duties towards the group. In this blind act of vengeance, we see the embryo of the form of social reaction called punishment. There are also many habits of the lowest species, which, because they are natural and normal, cannot be called the equivalent of crime, but which, when reproduced among civilized men, become criminal. The same is true of many habits of savages. For example, Homicide is frequently practiced under social sanction, such as infanticide, murder of the aged, of women, and of the sick, religious sacrifices, etc., or cannibalism is prevalent in many tribes. Theft also exists under social sanction, though it is not so common because the institution of private property is not highly developed among savages. The veritable crimes among savages are those against usage in which an established custom or religious right is violated. In like manner, as among the savages, characteristics are to be found in the child in a normal fashion, which will be criminal in an adult, such as anger, vengeance, jealousy, lying, cruelty, lack of foresight, etc. For the first year or more of its life, a child lacks a moral standard, and its development is determined largely by its surroundings. There are, furthermore, many abnormal children 
in whom a tendency to cry manifests itself early. It was the consideration of these facts with regard to the lower species, savages and children, which led Ambroso to formulate his first theory that crime is atavistic in its origin. This theory, as we shall see, he modified greatly later on. He discusses the atavistic origin of crime in the first part of his work, and then proceeds to the study of the constitution which the criminal inherits. This we will now briefly summarise. The first series of the characteristics of the criminal is the anatomical. The study of 383 skulls of criminals gives him the results which he sums up in the following words. On considering the results that these 383 skulls give us, it is found that the lingens most frequent are great prominence of the superciliary arches, 58.2%, anomaly in the development of the wisdom teeth, 44.6%, diminution of the capacity of the skull, 32.5%, Synostis of the sutures, 28.9%. Retreating forehead, 28%. Hyperostis of the bones, 28.9%. Plagiocephaly, 23.1%. Warmian bones, 22%. Simplicity of the sutures, 18.4%. Prominence of the occipital protuberance, 16.6%. The middle occipital fossa, 16%. Symbolic sutures, 13.6%. Flattening of the occipital, 13.2%. Osteophytes of the clovis, 10.1%. The incas or impactical bone, 10.5%. A union of many of these anomalies is to be found in the same skull in a proportion of 43%, while 21% have single anomalies. But these figures would have little value if not compared with the corresponding figures for non-criminals, such a comparison results in destroying the significance of some of these anomalies, since they prove to exist in about the same proportion among the latter. But there are others, on the contrary, which are present in a double or triple proportion in the criminals. Such are, for example, sclerosis, the abactyl bone, asymmetry, the retreating forehead, exaggeration of the frontal sinus and the superciliary arches, oxycephaly, the open internasal structure, anomalous teeth, asymmetries of the face, and above all, the middle occipital fossa among males, the fusion of the atlas and the anomalies of the occipital opening. Comparison with the skulls of the insane shows that criminals surpass the insane in most of the cranial anomalies. Comparison with savage and prehistoric skulls shows the atavistic character of some of these anomalies. Atavism, however, does not permit us to explain over the frequent obliquity of the skull and of the face, or the fusion and welding of the atlas with the occipital, or the platyocephaly, and the exaggerated sclerosis, anomalies which seem to be the result of an error in the development of the fetal skull, or a product of diseases which have slowly evolved in the nervous centres. As to the significance of the cranial anomalies, he says, Is it possible that individuals afflicted with so great a number of alterations should have the same sentiments as men, with a skull entirely normal? And note that these cranial alterations bear only upon the most visible modifications of the intellectual centre, the alterations of volume and of form. A study of the convolutions of the brains of criminals reveals many anomalies, of which he says, it would be too rash to conclude that at last have been found, with certainty, anomalies peculiar to the cerebral circumvolutions of criminals. But it can be very well be said already that in criminals these anomalies are abundant and are of two orders some which are different from every normal type, even inferior, as the transverse grooves of the frontal lobe found by flesh in some cases, and so prominently that they do not allow the longitudinal grooves to be seen. Others are deviations from the type, but recall the type of lower animals. As a separation of the colcanian fissure from the occipital, the fissure of Sylvius, which remains open, the frequent formation of an operculum of the occipital lobe. The histology of the criminal brain also shows many anomalies due in most cases to arrested development. Anomalies of the skeleton, heart, genital organs and stomach are also noted. Then he passes to the study of the anthropometry and physiognomy of 5,907 criminals examined by himself and about a dozen other criminologists. In the anthropometric measurements it may be noted that the type usually reproduces the original type, that they reach from finger tip to fingertip, with the arms outstretched, is usually superior to the height, frequent left-handedness, and prehensile foot in which the great toe is mobile, 
has removed an unusually long distance from the other toes. Precocious wrinkles, absence of baldness, a low and narrow forehead, large jaws, etc. In the physiognomy, he discusses peculiarities of the hair, iris, ears, nose, teeth, etc., noting difference between different kinds of criminals. In general, many criminals have outstanding ears, abundant hair, a sparse beard, in almost frontal sinuses and jaws, a square and projecting chin, broad cheekbones, frequent gestures, in fact a type resembling the Mongolian, sometimes a Negro. In summarizing the anatomical study of the criminal, he says, The study of the living, in short, confirms, although less exactly and less constantly, this frequency of microcephalies, the asymmetries of oblique orbits, of prognathisms, of frontal sinuses developed, as the anatomical table has shown us. It shows new analogies between the insane savages and criminals. The prognathism, the hair abundant, black and frizzled, the sparse beard, the skin very often brown, the oxycephaly, the oblique eyes, the small skull, the developed jaw, the zygomas, the retreating void, the voluminous ears, the analogy between the two sexes, a greater reach, a new characteristic added to the characteristic observed in the dead which bring the European criminals nearer to the Australian and Mongolian type, while the strabism, the cranial asymmetrics, and the serious histological anomalies, the ostomates, the meningetic lesions, the hepatic and cardiac, also show us in the criminal a man abnormal before his birth, by arrested development, or by disease acquired from different organs, above all from the nervous centres, as in the insane, and make him a person who is, in truth, chronically ill. The study of the anatomical characteristics of the criminal enabled him to separate the born criminal from the criminal of habit, of passion, or of occasion who is born with very few or no abnormal characteristics. Leaving aside for the moment the latter classes of criminals, he takes up the biological and psychological characteristics of the born criminals, the first being the psychological characteristic of tattooing. One of the most characteristic traits of primitive man, or of the savage, is facility with which he submits himself to this operation, surgical rather than aesthetic, and of which the name even has been furnished to us by the oceanic idiom. By means of the statistics of 13,566 individuals, of which 4,376 were honest, 6,347 criminal, and 2,943 insane, he shows that tattooing is quite common in some of the inferior classes of society, but is most common among criminals. It may be said that for the last, it constitutes an account of its frequency, a specific and entirely new anatomical legal characteristic. He cites many causes for tattooing, such as religion, imitation, carnal love, vengeance, idleness, vanity, and above all, atavism. But the first and principal cause which has spread this custom among us is, in my opinion, atavism, or this other kind of historic atavism called tradition. Tattooing is in fact one of the essential characteristics of primitive man, and of the man who is still living in a savage state. After noting peculiarities of the molecular exchange, as indicated in the temperature, pulse, and urine, he discusses the general sensibilities of the criminal. The special taste of criminals for a painful operation so long and so full of danger as tattooing. The large number of wounds their bodies present lead me to suspect in them a physical insensibility greater than amongst most men, an insensibility like that which is encountered in some insane persons, and especially in violent lunatics. Numerous experiments have revealed obtuseness in the sensibility of many parts of the body. Peculiarities have been noted in the visual acuteness and visual field, in the smelling, the taste, and the hearing, in the motility, in the reaction to various external influences, and the vasomotor reflexes. From all of these facts, it could be deduced that nearly all the different kinds of sensibility, tactile, olfactory, and of the taste are obtuse in the criminal, even in the occasional criminal as compared with a normal man. While in the criminal, as in the insane and hysterical, the sensibility to metals, to the magnet, and to the atmosphere is exaggerated. Their physical insensibility recalls quite forcibly that of savage peoples who can face, in the initiations of puberty, tortures which a man of the white race could never endure. From this study showing the marked analgesia of the criminal, he passes to his affected sensibility. In general, the criminal man, the moral insensibility, is as great as the physical insensibility. Undoubtedly, 
the one is the effect of the other. It is not that in him the voice of sentiment is entirely silent, as some literally men of inferior ability suppose, but it is certain that the passions which make the heart of the normal man beat with the greatest force are very feeble in him. The first sentiment which is extinguished in these beings is that of pity for the suffering of another, and this happens just because they themselves are insensible to suffering. Then he discusses various psychological characteristics of the criminal, showing his instability, vanity, lasciviousness, laziness, lack of foresight, etc. He shows that his intelligence varies greatly among the different classes of criminals. He discusses at some length the argot, or professional slang of criminals. Atavism contributes more to this than any other thing. They talk differently from us because they don't feel in the same way. They talk like savages because they are veritable savages in the midst of this brilliant European civilization. In a similar manner, he studies the hieroglyphics, writing, and literature of criminals. In the first volume of this work, Lombroso describes the characteristics of the born criminal, who, as we shall see, he believes represents a distinct anthropological type. In the second volume, he takes up first certain analogies which he believes exist between the born criminal and certain other abnormal types and then deals with the other classes of criminals. At first he deals with the analogy and indeed the identity which he believes exists between congenital criminality and moral insanity. The characteristics of the born criminal that we have studied in the first volume are the same as those of the moral imbecile. Under the name of moral imbecility, psychiatrists have classified the insane, whose most prominent pathological characteristic is a complete or almost complete absence of moral feeling and of moral ideas. The famous English alienist Henry Maudsley has described this class in the following words. Notwithstanding prejudices to the contrary, there is a disorder of the mind, which without illusion, delusion or hallucination, the symptoms are mainly exhibited in a perversion of those mental faculties which are usually called the active and moral powers, the feeling, affection, propensities, temper, habits and conduct. The effective life of the individual is profoundly deranged and his derangement shows itself in what he feels, desires, and does. He has no capacity of true moral feeling, or his impulses and desires, to which he yields without check, are egotistic. His conduct appears to be governed by immoral motives, which are cherished and obeyed without any evident desire to resist them. There is an amazing moral insensibility, the intelligence often acute enough being not affected otherwise than in being tainted by the morbid feeling under the influence of which the persons think and act. Indeed, they often display an extraordinary ingenuity in explaining, excusing, or justifying their behaviour, exaggerating this, ignoring that, and so coming the whole as to make themselves appear the victims of misrepresentation and persecution. Such a person may very easily become a criminal. A person who has no moral sense is naturally well fitted to become a criminal, and if his intellect is not strong enough to convince him that crime will not in the end succeed, and that it is Therefore, to the lowest grounds of folly, he is very likely to become one. Moral insanity may be caused by various abnormal or pathological mental characteristics, congenital or acquired in the individual. Whenever one of these characteristics destroys the capacity for moral feeling and for comprehending moral ideas, the individual becomes a moral imbecile. Moral insanity, therefore, is not a morbid entity in the sense that it arises out of one pathological mental characteristic or state of mind. It is, on the contrary, as Bayer has said, a symptom common to various cerebral diseases. Lombroso, however, apparently regarded it as such an entity, for he frequently spoke of it as if it were a distinct disease, and furthermore, he identified it with a born criminal who he considered a distinct type. He cites a good deal of evidence in support of this identification. One of the things which proved directly the identity of moral insanity and of crime, and which at the same time explains to us the doubts with which the aliens have been possessed up to this day, is the extreme rarity of the first in the insane asylums, and its great frequency, on the contrary, in the prisons. After supporting this statement with statistics, he demonstrates many likenesses between the moral imbecile and the born criminal, with regard to the weight, the skull, the physiognomy, the analgesia, tactile, sensibility, tattooing, vascular reaction, affectability, etc. By contending that there is an identity between the moral imbecile and the born criminal, 
It does not, however, mean that every moral imbecile is a criminal. For that matter, not every person born with a criminal temperament becomes a criminal, for external circumstances may resist and overcome the innate criminal tendencies. But he believes that in physical constitution and mental characteristics, the two are fundamentally alike. This identity of the moral imbecile with the born criminal is, he believes, still more conclusively proved by a similar likeness which he finds between the criminal and the epileptic. The objection has justly been made against this fusion that the cases of true moral insanity that I have been able to study are too restrictive in number. That is true, but is after all very natural, for precisely because moral imbeciles are born criminals, they are not found as frequently in the asylum as in the prison, and it is also for that reason that it is not easy to establish a comparison. But there exists in epilepsy a uniting bond, much more important, much more comprehensible, which can be studied upon a great scale, that unites and bases the moral imbecile and the born criminal in the same natural family. As in the case of the analogy between the moral imbecile and the born criminal, he demonstrates many likenesses between the epileptic and the born criminal, in height, weight, the brain, the skull, the physiognomy, the flat and prehensile foot, the sensibility, the visual field, motility, tattooing, etc. Criminality is therefore an atavistic phenomenon which is provoked by morbid causes of which the fundamental manifestation is epilepsy. It is very true that criminality can be provoked by other diseases, hysteria, alcoholism, paralysis, insanity, prenasthenia, etc. But it is epilepsy which gives to it, by its frequency, by its gravity, the most extended basis. But while all born criminals are epileptics, according to Lombroso, not all epileptics are born criminals. In all three, congenital criminality, moral insanity, and epilepsy, we find the irresistible force which results in crime or similar irresponsible acts. The perversion of the affective sphere, the hate exaggerated and without motive, the absence or insufficiency of all restraint, the multiple hereditary tendencies are the source of irresistible impulses in the moral imbecile, as well as in the born criminal and the epileptic. These two analogies between the born criminal and the moral imbecile and the epileptic mark the second stage in the development of his theory. The studies which form the first part of this volume accord admirably with those which have been developed in the second and third parts of the first volume to make us see, in the criminal, a savage and at the same time a sick man. In other words, he no longer sees in the born criminal only an atavistic return to the savage, but also arrested development of disease, thus making the born criminal both an atavistic and a degenerate phenomenon. He now passes to the treatment of the classes of criminals, other than the born criminal. The first of these is the criminal by passion. Among the criminals there is a category which is distinguished absolutely from all others. It is this of the criminals by passion, who ought rather to be called criminals by violence, because as we have seen, and as we shall see better still in their etiology, all these crimes have for substratum the violence of some passion. These criminals are quite rare are usually young, have few anomalies of the skull, a good physiognomy, honesty of character, exaggerated affectabilities opposed the apathy of the born criminal, and frequent repentance after the crime, sometimes followed by suicide or reformation in prison. A larger percentage of them are women than among other criminals. The passions which excite these criminals are not those which rise gradually in the organism, as avarice and ambition but those which burst forth unexpectedly, as anger, platonic, or filial love, offended honour, which are usually generous passions, and often sublime. On the other hand, those which predominate in ordinary criminals are the most ignoble and the most ferocious, as vengeance, cupidity, carnal love, and drunkenness. But in them, as in ordinary criminals, are found sometimes the traces of epilepsy and impulsive insanity, shown by the impetuosity, suddenness, and ferocity of their crimes. The frequency of suicide among criminals by passion also indicates a pathological state of mind. A special kind of criminal by passion is a political criminal. In nearly all political criminals by passion, we have noticed an exaggerated sensibility, a veritable hyperesthesia, as in the ordinary criminals by passion, but a powerful intellect, a great altruism pushed them towards ends much higher than those of the latter. There is never wealth, vanity, the smile of woman, even though often eroticism is not lacking in them, as in Garibaldi, Mazzini, Cavour, which impel them 
but rather the great patriotic religious scientific ideas. Statistics show a much higher proportion than the average of insane persons among criminals, and therefore Lombroso deals next with insane criminals as a special class of criminals. A study made upon 100 insane criminals, chosen by preference from those who had become insane before the crime, with the exception of the epileptics, has shown to me the frequency of the criminal type. This is to say, the presence of five or six characteristics of degeneracy, and especially outstanding years. Oileo Zanans. Frontal sinuses, a voluminous jaw and zygoma, a ferocious look or strabism, a thin upper lip, in the proportion of 44%. This fact, however, does not lead him to identify the insane criminal with the born criminal, but he finds numerous analogies between the two in the weight, height, skull, tattooing, etc., and also many psychological analogies in the manner of committing a crime. He connects certain kinds of crime with certain kinds of insanity. I've just mentioned the existence of certain kinds of insanity, which reproduce each other subspecies of criminality, so that to the judicial figure of incendiarism, of homicide can be opposed the psychiatric figure of pyromania, homicidal monomania, paradoxical sexuality, etc. Thus he opposes to the judicial figure of theft the psychiatric figure of kleptomania, to habitual drunkenness, dipsomania, to rape and bedistry, sexual inversion, to crimes of lust, cetriasis, and nymphomania, to idleness and vega bondage, to neurasthenia. He then discusses the psychological differences between the born criminal and the insane criminal with respect to the different kinds of mental maladies and to the differences in motives for crimes and the manner of committing them. He finishes the study of the insane criminal with a study of three special kinds, the alcoholic criminal, the hysterical criminal, and the criminal metoid. The last part of his work is devoted to the occasional criminal. Of this study, he says, If I have been forced to delay for several years the publication of this book, it has been on account of this part in particular. For though in possession of numerous documents, direct contact with the facts failed me in the measure that I was trying to approach myself to them. The abundance of the facts also, their excessive variety, constituted for me a cause of uncertainty which prevented me from reaching a conclusion. The first group with which he deals is that of the swear criminals. These criminals are those who commit crimes involuntarily, who commit acts which are not perverse or prejudicial to society, but which are called crimes by the law, who commit crimes under very extraordinary circumstances, such as in defence of the person, of honour, of all the substance of the family. These crimes are rather judicial than real, because they are created by imperfections of the law rather than by those of men. They do not awaken any fear for the future, and they do not disturb the moral sense of the masses. The next group is that of the criminaloids. Here, the accident, the all-powerful occasion, draws only those who are already somewhat predisposed to evil. The occasions out of which these crimes arise are the temptation to imitate, the constant opportunities offered by the commercial profession for fraud, abuse of confidence, etc. The associations of the prison are passion less intense than the criminal by passion which draws an honest man slowly to crime. The criminal couple, the stronger member of which, having evil tendencies, perverts the weaker epidemic, allurement, etc., these are individuals who constitute the gradations between the born criminal and the honest man, or better still, a variety of born criminal who has indeed a special organic tendency but one which is less intense, who has therefore only a touch of degeneracy. That is why I will call them criminaloids, but it is natural that in them the importance of the occasion determining the crime should be decisive. While well, it is not so for the born criminal, for whom it is a circumstance with which he can dispense, and with which he often does dispense, as for example, in case of brutal mischievousness. This position of the criminaloid between the born criminal and the honest man is in harmony with all natural phenomena, while the most striking phenomena are in continuity with a series of analogous phenomena less accentuated, just as in the moral sphere we have genius, talent, intelligence, etc., and the pathology of degeneracy, the cretin, the cretinous, the subcretin, the idiot, the metoid, the imbecile, etc. The third group of occasional criminals is that of the habitual criminal. The greatest number of these individuals is furnished by those who, normal from birth and without tendencies for a peculiar constitution of a crime, not having found in the early education of parents, schools, etc., this force which provokes 
or better said, facilitates the passage from the physiological community, which we have seen belongs properly to an early age, to a normal, honest life, for continually lower into the primitive tendency towards evil. So that these individuals without an abnormal hereditary are led not by one circumstance offering the occasion for crime, but by a group of circumstances conditioning their early life into a career of crime. Associations of criminals, such as those of brigands, mafia, and camorra in Italy, and the Black Hand in Spain, etc., contain many members drawn to crime by their associates. In the classes in which, on account of wealth, power, etc., their conditions are against the commission of crime. The criminal tendencies of those born with such tendencies remain latent or manifest themselves in other ways. Finally, there is a class of epileptoids in whom there is a substratum of epilepsy, which sometimes forms a basis for the development of criminal tendencies. In the first edition of this work, Lombroso gave excessive weight to the anatomical and anthropometric data, which was not very surprising, since they were the most obvious and the most easily obtainable. The excessive emphasis laid upon the anatomical characteristics of the criminal led him to distinguish but one type, the criminal as an atavistic phenomenon. This immediately called forth the charge of unilaterality. The idea still exists that Lombroso recognized but one type of criminal who was a result of a single cause, namely atavism. But the brief summary of his work which I have so far given is sufficient to disprove this. We have seen that the addition to studying the anatomical characteristics of the criminal, he makes a lengthy study of his biological and psychological characteristics as well. In the latter editions of his work, he rejected in part the atavistic theory of crime, no longer considering atavism as the only cause of crime, and adopted the theory of degeneracy as one of its causes. In this edition, I have demonstrated that in addition to the characteristics truly atavistic, there are acquired and entirely pathological characteristics. Facial asymmetry, for example, which does not exist in the savage, strabism, inequality of the ears, dyschromatopsy, unilateral paresia, irresistible impulses, the need of doing evil for the sake of evil, etc., and the sinister gaiety which is noticeable in the professional slang of criminals, and which, alternating with a certain religiousness, is found so often in epileptics, the very added meningitis and softening of the brain, which certainly do not result from atavism. In his studies on moral imbecility and epilepsy, he has demonstrated the analogies between these two and congenital criminality. Though his identification of the moral imbecile with the born criminal and of the born criminal with the epileptic may be disproved, his demonstration of the pathological likeness of the three to each other is incontestable. In his study of the insane criminal, he has exposed the characteristics of another very abnormal criminal type. He has demonstrated the abnormality of certain of the criminals by passion. In the criminal lawyer he has shown a criminal partially abnormal, who, however, would not commit a crime until a good opportunity presents itself. The habitual criminal, though born without criminal tendencies, has then developed in him by the circumstances of his early life. Finally, in some of the criminals by passion, and the pseudo criminal, we find entirely normal persons who have committed crimes under very exceptional circumstances. Thus we see how very synthetic in his study of the characteristics of the criminal, since it ranges from the most abnormal to the perfectly normal, and their borders upon the study of the social causes of crime, which he takes up a great length in the work which the present volume is a translation. The theory which is most closely connected with the name of Lombroso is that of the criminal anthropological type. That is to say, his theory that there is an anthropological type which corresponds to habitual criminal conduct. This has been the most contested idea in criminal anthropology and the one that has received the largest amount of discussion in books, congresses, etc. Though this idea of a criminal type has been suggested several times in the past, it was fully dealt for the first time by Lombroso. We have already surmised his conception of the born criminal who constitutes for him a distinct criminal type. A quotation from his speech at the Congress of Criminal Anthropology at Turin in 1906 has shown that his early studies led him to regard the criminal as an atavistic type, as reproducing the characteristics of lower races and species. This theory offered in his early works, as an explanation of the congenital criminal tendencies, was severely attacked on account of its unilaterality. These criticisms and his further research has led him, as we have seen, to modify his theory and to recognize degeneracy as the cause of congenital criminality. 
He even came to regard atavism as a form of degeneracy, as where he respects the criminal type as the presence of five or six characteristics of degeneracy, and especially outstanding ears, orels and hounds, frontal sinuses, jaw, and zygomas voluminous, a ferocious look of strabism, thin upper lip. This recognition of degeneracy as a cause of crime has made Lombroso's doctrine more Catholic, so that it is much easier to connect the criminal with the social and physical conditions out of which he has evolved. But it is questionable, as we shall see, whether degeneracy can be regarded as a form of atavism. In order to make more distinct his conception of the criminal type, he discusses the character of a type in general as follows. In my opinion, one should receive the type with the same reserve that one uses in estimating the value of averages in statistics. When one says that the average life is 32 years and the most fateful month is December, no one understands by that that everybody must die at 32 years and in the month of December. The type is, therefore, an abstract conception including the characteristics which are most common in a certain group of individuals. But this does not mean that every individual in the group must have all these characteristics. As Isidore G. St. Hilaire has said, the type is a sort of fixed point and common centre about which the differences presented are like so many deviations in different directions and oscillations, varied almost indefinitely about which nature seems to play, as the anatomists used to say. Applying this general conception of a type, it is evident that every criminal representing this type need not have all its characteristics. In fact, it is doubtful if any one criminal ever did have all these characteristics. Furthermore, he discusses what percentage of criminals represent the criminal type. This number he places at about 40%. The objection has been made that it is impossible to talk about a criminal type when 60% of the criminals do not represent it, to which he replies as follows. But in addition to the fact that the vigour of 40% is not to be disdained, the insensible passage from one character to another manifests itself in all organic beings. It manifests itself even from one species to another. With more reason, it is so in the anthropological field, where the individual variability, increasing in direct proportion to improvement and to civilization, seems to have faced the complete type. We can give no more space to this summary of Lombroso's theory, but must now make certain comments and criticisms. Strange to say, Lombroso seems to have been somewhat ignorant of biology, and especially the theory of hereditary. This is indicated, for example, by the loose way in which he uses the term atavism. It is true that biologists recognize that atavism, or reversion, as they usually call it, takes place when there reappear individual of the present day characteristics of an earlier type. If this reappearance is a result of hereditary forces, that is to say, if earlier characteristics which have long remained dormant reassert themselves in the germ plasm at the time of conception, there is a true case of reversion. But it is very evident that many of the criminal characteristics which Lombroso calls atavistic are not hereditary in their origin, but are the causes of arrested development, either before or after birth. This is the case when he speaks of degeneracy as a form of atavism, for it is very evident that most, if not all the characteristics he has in mind, are not congenital. The fact that the individual has them at birth does not indicate necessarily that they are congenital, for they may be the result of rested development during the antenatal period of the life of the individual. In other causes, he calls characteristics atavistic, which are simply habits which have been transmitted by social means. For example, he seems to regard the habit of tattooing as an atavistic trait, but tattooing is no more than a habit which could not possibly be transmitted by hereditary means. This indicates that Lombroso may have believed in the hereditary transmission of acquired characteristics, though he nowhere explicitly states his opinion as to this point. But he again and again speaks as if habits or the effects of habits are transmitted by hereditary means. The consensus of opinion of biologists today is that no acquired characteristics can be transmitted by hereditary means. Therefore, Lombroso was very much in error in this respect. Lombroso believed that there is a criminal anthropological type, or rather there are several such types which correspond to habitual modes of criminal conduct. Here again, he seems to be holding the belief that acquired characteristics are inheritable, for otherwise it is conceivable that any anthropological type necessarily possesses certain habits. Such a type may possess congenital tendencies which make it more likely to acquire certain habits, but this is not necessarily the case. 
It is true that the laws of recognized and environmental forces might prevent the individual from expressing these inborn tendencies to certain kinds of action and acts. But he laid too much emphasis upon the extent to which the habits of a person are determined by hereditary forces. But whatever may have been his faults, Lombroso was a great pioneer whose original and versatile genius and aggressive personality led to the great movement towards the application of the positive, inductive methods of modern science to the problem of crime and who stimulated, more than any other man, the development of the new science of criminology. The breadth of his treatment of the subject of crime is nowhere illustrated better than the present volume, in which a large number of the complex causes of crime are discussed. It is therefore to be hoped that through this volume the English-speaking world will acquire an adequate idea of his genius and the great services he rendered to the study and treatment of crime. Maurice Parmel The Author's Preface To Max Nordau To you, as the ablest and most beloved of my brothers in arms, I dedicate this book. In it I attempt by means of facts to answer those who, not having read my criminal man, of which it is the necessary compliment, nor the works of Pellman, Corilla, Van Hamel, Salilis, Ellis, Bleuler, and others, accuse my school of having neglected the economic and social causes of crime, and having confined itself to the study of the born criminal, thus teaching that the criminal is riveted irrevocably to his destiny, that humanity is no escape from his atavistic ferocity. Now, if this charge were true, the unfortunate nature of the facts revealed could not be urged against a school which discovered them. But the truth is that, while the old jurists had nothing to propose for the prevention of crime more efficacious than the cruel and sterile empiricism of the prison and deportation system, and while the most practical peoples have arrived at good results, only sporadically, and as a chance outcome of unsystematic groupings, my school has devised a new strategic method of proceeding against crime, based upon a study of its etiology and nature. In the first place, the distinction which we have made between the criminaloid, the occasional criminal, the criminal by passion, and the born criminal, as well as a study of the more important classes of crime, enables us to determine with precision the individuals to whom we can apply our curative processes and the method appropriate to each case. With a born criminal to be sure, only a palliative treatment is possible. This is what I have called a symbiosis, the attempt to utilise a criminal's evil propensities by diverting the course of the criminal instinct. The measure for the attainment of this object, however, can only be individual. But with criminaloids, whose evil propensities are not so deep-seated, we may often hope for better results. Here again it is necessary to commence the treatment in early youth by what I should call moral nurture, which would withdraw the young criminals from the influence of depraved parents and from that of the streets, and place them on farms in the colonies. In this matter, legislation and social influences are of great importance. Thus, emigration from overpopulated countries towards those less thickly settled wards off one of the worst influences, that of a dense population, divorce, parents, adulteries, poisonings, etc., while the war made upon drunkenness by religious associations and temperance societies and through the enforcement of penalties prevents much brawling of violence. All this has been established by statistics. These directly preventive measures, it is true, do not always suffice. Since it is a need of cerebral stimulation that leads men to drink, and since this need grows with the progress of civilization, it is necessary to get at the root of the evil and satisfy this need by means less dangerous than drink such as shows, coffee rooms, etc. But here another difficulty arises, namely that nearly all the physical and moral causes of crime present a double aspect, often contradictory. Thus there are crimes which are favoured by density of population, like rebellion, and others, like brigandage and homicide, which are occasioned by sparseness of population. So also why there are crimes caused by poverty, there are almost as many which are encouraged by extreme wealth. The same contradiction is observed when we pass from one country to another. Thus, when homicide decreases in Italy with the increase of population and wealth, in France this crime increases with the increase of these two factors, a fact which is to be explained by the great influence of alcoholism and of foreign immigration. Religion, which among Protestants appears to prevent many crimes, in many Catholic countries multiplies them, or at least fails to prevent their increase. 
and if education appears to be useful in preventing homicide, theft, assault, etc., it is very often when to advance, seems to encourage fraud, false testimony, and political crime. Difficulty is increased still more by the fact that, even if we find effective methods of combating the influence of environment, it is not easy to apply them. It is possible, for example, to counteract the effect of heat upon the frequency of crimes of violence and immorality by means of cold baths, but it is not easy to bring a whole section of the people to the bathhouses or to the sea, as was done in ancient Rome, and as the practice still is in Calabria. The statesman, then, who wishes to bring crime ought to be eclectic and not limit himself to a single course of action. He must guard against the dangerous effects of wealth no less than against those of poverty, against the corrupting influence of education not less than against that of ignorance. In this labyrinth of contradictions, the only safe guide is the study of the criminal combined with the study of the etiology of crime. From all this we can understand the uncertainty and embarrassment to which these contradictions ex expose our public officials, and can see why men whose trade is law-making find that the most obvious recourse is the modification of a few pages of a penal code. This is why the prison, the worst of all remedies, if we can call it a remedy or and not a poison, will always be applied to the simplest and most practical means of safety. It has antiquity and custom on its side, and these are points of great importance for the ordinary man. He finds it easier always to apply the same remedy and to find a number of different remedies suited to differences of age, sex, and education. I have traced above only the outlines of the system of criminal therapeutics, which I intend to set forth in this book. But to tell the truth, it is not a system that is entirely new. It has been stated that certain practical nations, less smothered than our own, under a too glorious past, and for that reason less infatuated with the ancient codes, have already here and there arrived empirically without knowing a word of criminal anthropology at several of the forms that I shall suggest. The Asylum for the Criminal Insane, the Truant Schools, the Ragged Schools, the Societies for the Protection of Children, and the asylums for alcoholics are institutions which, without being a part of the criminal code, have been applied more or less completely in North America, England, and Switzerland. For these are happy countries, where religion is less a mass of dogmas and rites than an ardent war against crime, so in these lands, and especially in London itself, where wealth, density, and immigration would naturally favour crime, the conquering march of criminality has been checked. These attempts, however, being partial, scattered, and without contradiction, lack the effectiveness in the eye of the world which proceeds from a complete demonstration, at once theoretical and practical. Yet they have a great value, because practical applications always proceed and repair for a scientific codification, and also because for timid spirits they give to our reforms the most convincing sanction that of experience. What now lies before us is to complete and systematize these reforms in a final way in accordance with the data of biology and sociology. It is this that I intend to do in this book. Cesar Lombroso, Turin, 1906 Translator's Note While the present work is based upon Professor Lombroso's French version, the German translation of Dr. Corilla and Dr. Jench have been found a valuable commentary upon certain passages and has been followed in the omission of some few notes and other details interesting to Italians only. The French work was published in Paris in 1899, and appears to have been embodied by the author in his Le Homo Delinquente, as the third volume in its latest Italian edition. The German translation was published in 1902. Henry P. Horton, Columbia, Missouri, November 1910. End of Preface Section 1 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Cesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Crime, Its Causes and Remedies. Part 1 Etiology of Crime. Chapter 1 Meteorological and Climatic Influences, Months, High Temperatures. Subchapter 1. Meteorological and Climatic Influences Every crime has its origin in a multiplicity of causes, often interwined and confused, 
each of which we must, in obedience to the necessities of thought and speech, investigate singly. This multiplicity is generally the rule with human phenomena, to which one can almost never assign a single cause unrelated to what it is. Everyone knows that cholera, typhus, and tuberculosis have specific causes, but no one would venture to maintain that meteorological, hygienic, and psychic factors have nothing to do with them. Indeed, the best observers often remain undecided as to the true specific cause of any given phenomenon. Subchapter 2. Extreme Temperature Among the determining causes of all biological activity are reckoned meteorological phenomena, and among these is heat. Thus the leaves of Drosera rotundifolia, after having been immersed in water at 110 degrees Fahrenheit, become infected and more sensitive to the action of nitrogenous substances. But at 130 degrees Fahrenheit, they no longer show any infection, and the tentacles are temporarily paralyzed, not regaining their mobility until immersed in cold water. Physiology and statistics show that most human functions are subject to the influence of heat. It is to be expected, then, that excessive heat will have its effect upon the human mind. History records no example of a tropical people that has not fallen into subjection. Great heat leads to overproduction, which in turn becomes a cause, first, of an unequal distribution of wealth, and then as a consequence of great inequality in the distribution of political and social power. In the country subject to great heat, the mass of the people count for nothing, though have neither voice nor influence in the government, and, though revolutions may often occur, these are but palace revolutions, neither uprisings of the people who attach no importance to them. Buckle, among other reasons, finds an explanation in the fact that the dwellers in hot countries need less food, clothing and fuel, and do not possess the power of resistance which dwellers in colder countries acquire in their contest with nature. On this account, tropical peoples are more inclined to inertia, to the use of narcotics, to the passive meditation of the yogi, and to the extravagant ascetism of self-torture of the fakir. The inertia brought on by the heat and the constant feeling of weakness that follows it, renders the constitution more liable to convulsions, and favours a tendency to vague dreaming, to exaggerated imagination, and in consequence to fanaticism at once religious and despotic. From this condition of things flows naturally excessive licentiousness, alternating with excessive ascetism, as the most brutal absolutism alternates with the most unrestrained anarchy. In cold countries, the power of resisting hardship is greater, owing to the expenditure of energy necessary in preparing food, clothing and fuel. But just for the reason, a visionary and unstable character is less frequent, an excessive cold making the imagination active, the mind less irritable and less inconstant. The contest with the cold consumes energy that would otherwise have been available for the social and personal activity of the individual. From this fact, and from the depressing effect which the cold exercises directly upon the nervous system, proceed the placidity and mildness of the inhabitants of the polar regions. Dr. Rink depicts certain Eskimo tribes as so pacific and placid that they have not even a word for quarrel, their strongest reaction to an affront being merely silence. Larry notices that on the retreat from Moscow, the snows of Russia made weaklings living cowards of soldiers whom, up to that time, neither danger, wounds, nor hunger have been able to shake. Bove relates that among the Chukchi at 40 degrees below zero, there are no quarrels, acts of violence, or crimes. Prayer, the bold polar traveller, notes how at the same temperature his will became paralysed, his senses dulled, and his speech embarrassed. This explains why not only despotic Russia, but also the liberal Scandinavian countries have rarely experienced revolutions. Subchapter 3. Influence of Modern Temperature The influence which is most apt to produce a disposition towards rebellion and crime is that of a relatively moderate degree of heat. This is confirmed by a study of the psychology of the peoples of southern Europe, which shows us that they tend to be unstable and to subordinate the interests of the community and state to the individual. This is doubtless because heat excites the nervous centres, as alcohol does, without, however, arriving at the point of producing apathy, and further because the climate, without removing human needs entirely, reduces them by increasing the productivity of the soil, at the same time diminishing the necessity for food, clothing, and alcoholic drinks. In the dialect of Parma, the son is called the father of ragamuffins. Daudet, who has written an entire novel, 
nor my rule has done to depict the great influence of the climate of southern europe upon conduct says the southerner does not love strong drinks he is intoxicated by nature sun and wind distil in him a terrible natural alcohol to whose influence every one born under this sky is subject some have only the mild fever which sets their speech and gesture free redoubles their audacity makes everything seem rosy-hued and drives them on to boasting others live in a blind delirium and what southerner has not felt the sudden giving way the exhaustion of his whole being that follows an outburst of rage or enthusiasm neri to fossio napoli a copoli da occhio remarks that inconstancy is a characteristic of the southern peoples one at first considers them naive until suddenly one perceives that they are finished rascals they are at the same time industrious and lazy sober and intemperate in short their character at least among the lower classes has such different aspects and changes so rapidly that it is impossible to fix it the climate favours the loss of modesty the people are prolific the thought of the future of their children does not terrify them the lazarone steals when he has a chance but never when there is any risk to be incurred a boaster he promises ten things and performs one if he falls into a quarrel he shouts and gesticulates to arouse fear though he is afraid himself he tries to avoid actual fighting but becomes wild if it comes to actual blows jealous he slashes his wife's face if he dubs her independent he can endure neither hospitals nor asylums when he has work he does it well he feels a strong affection for his family contents himself with little and has not become intoxicated crafty mendacious and timid his existence is a series of petty frauds deceits and acts of beggary to get a few cents in arms he is capable of kissing your shoes without feeling himself humiliated thereby his science is superstition meeting a hunchback or a blind man conveys a quite definite already his ideas move in the same circle of god devil witches evil eye holy trinity honour knife theft ornaments and kumora the masses fear this last but respect it for they feel that this despotic power protects them against the other despots it is the only authority from which they can hope for anything that resembles justice subject four crime and seasons the influence of hate upon certain crimes is then quite comprehensible it is brought out in Gurry's statistics that the crime of rape occurs in england and france oftenest in the hot months and curcio observed the same thing in italy tables displayed on the page titled rapes committed in england france and italy additional columns sections that statistics up between the months of the year in england according to Gurry, and in italy according to curcio the maximum number of murders falls in the hottest months these occurred a table is displayed on the page with three columns listing the months between july june august may february march december and january and an additional two columns of england and italy poisoning also according to Gurry, occurs oftenest in may the same phenomenon is reserved in the case of rebellions in studying as i have in my political crime the eight hundred and thirty six uprisings that took place in the whole world in the period between seventeen ninety one and eighteen eighty one finds that in asia and africa the greatest number of falls in july in europe and america the greater prevalence of rebellions in the hot months could not be more clearly marked in europe the maximum proved to be in july and in south america in january which are respectively the two hottest months the minimum falls in europe in december and january and in south america in may and june which again correspond in temperature if now we pass from the whole of europe to the particular countries we still find the greatest number of uprisings in the hot months july leads in italy spain portugal and france august in germany turkey england and with march in greece march leads in ireland sweden norway and denmark january in switzerland september in belgium and the netherlands april in russia and poland and may in bosnia herzegovina servia and bulgaria from this the influence of the hot month would seem to be greatest in the countries of the south subchapter five seasons bringing together by seasons the data of uprisings in europe during a hundred years we get the following a table is displayed on the page with spring summer autumn and winter compared between the nations of spain italy portugal turkey and europe greece france belgium and the netherlands switzerland bosnia herzegovina servia and bulgaria ireland england scotland germany austria-hungary 
Sweden, Norway and Denmark, Poland, Russia and Europe. From this it appeared that summer holds the first place in the case of five nations, among all those of the south. In the case of four, including the most northerly, it is spring that leads. In one case, Austro-Hungary, it is autumn, and in one other, Switzerland, it is winter. We find further that five times, and principally in the hottest countries, the winter has more revolutions than the autumn. Eight times it has fewer, and three times an equal number. If we consider America, especially South America, remembering that January there corresponds to our July, and February to our August, we shall find tables displayed on the page with spring, summer, autumn, and winter, split between America and Europe. We see, then, that in both hemispheres, summer takes the first place, while spring always surpasses both autumn and winter, doubtless, as with crimes, because of the first heat, but also because of the diminution of the food supply. Autumn and winter, on the contrary, differ little in number of revolutions, winter giving in America seven more than autumn, and in Europe two fewer. With regard to crimes, also, spring and summer stand plainly in the first rank. Gary gives the following figures for the occurrence of crimes against persons. A table is displayed on the page, and three columns, listed as in England and in France. He is compared with statistics for winter, spring, summer and autumn. Benoiston de Chateau points out that duels in the army are more frequent in the summer. I have proved that the same influence manifests itself in the case of men of genius. Subchapter 6. Hot Years Ferry and his crime in his relation to temperature has proved from a study of the French criminal statistics from 1825 to 1878 that one can deduce an almost complete parallelism between heat and criminality, not only for the different months, but also for years of different degrees of heat. The influence of the temperature on crime from 1825 to 1848 appears to be very pronounced and constant, and is often even greater than that experienced by agricultural production. Since 1848, notwithstanding the most serious agricultural and political disturbances, the coincidence between temperature and criminality becomes from time to time plainly apparent, especially in the case of homicide and murder. This coincidence is to be noted especially in the years 1826, 1829, 1831, 32, 1833, 1837, 1842 to 43, 1844 to 45, 1846, 1858, 1865, 1867 to 68. The connection comes out much more plainly, however, in the statistics of rape and offences against chastity, which follow an even greater degree of annual variations in temperature. This may be seen from the following table. A table displayed on the page with three columns, with the year between 1830 to 1874, the temperature, and the cases of homicide and rape listed in number. As regards crime against property, there is a marked increase in the winter, theft and forgery being most abundant in January, while the other seasons differ little from one another. Here the influence of the weather is entirely different. Needs increase, and the means of satisfying them diminishes. Subchapter 7. Criminal Calendars Lacazane, Chosinod, and Mori, in confirmation of this contention, have constructed, with the aid of the statistics of each individual crime, real criminal calendars upon the model of the botanist calendars of Flora. Among the crimes against persons, infanticide holds the first place in the months of January, February, March and April. 647, 750, 783, 662, which corresponds to the greater number of births taking place in the spring. This number falls off somewhat in May, and considerably in June July, to increase again November and December, through the influence of the carnival. In the months named, we find illegitimate births occurring with great frequency. 1,100, 1,131, 1,095, 1,134 as well as abortions. Homicides and assaults reach their maximum in July, 1716. Parasites, on the contrary, are more numerous in January and October. June is a month which appears a great influence on the temperature on the number of rapes practiced upon children, May, July and August coming after it. 2,671, 2,175, 2,459, 2,238. The minimum falls in December, 993, followed by the other colder months, while the monthly average is 
1,684. Rapes upon adults do not follow the same course. The maximum is in June, 1,078. The minimum in November, 534. They increase in December and January, 584. Apparently as a result of the carnival, they remain stationary in February, 616, and increase in March and May, 904, while the monthly average is 693. Assaults are distributed regularly because they are least influenced by the climate. They increase in February, 931, decrease during the following months, 840, 467, to rise again in May, 983, June, 958, going down July, 919, rising once more in August, 997, and September, 993, to undergo a new decrease in November and December, 886. In the case of crimes against property, the variations are not so pronounced. Though they are more numerous by 3,000 cases in December and January, 16,879 and 16,396, and the cold season generally than in April, 13,491, and in the hot season, the monthly average is 14,630. Plainly, it is not here a question of the direct effect of the cold, but rather an increase of needs in winter and diminution of the means of satisfying them, so the motives for theft are more abundant. From the investigations of Maury, it is possible to arrive at the following conclusions with regard to the individual months. In March, infanticide holds the first place, accounting for 1,193 crimes out of 10,000. Then comes in order rape, 1,115 cases, substitution of children and concealment of birth, 1,019, kidnapping, 1,054, and threatening letters, 997. In May, vagrancy comes first, 1,257, then rapes and offences against chastity, 1,150, then it comes poisoning, 1,144, and finally rape of minors, 1,106. This last crime, under the influence of the heat, rises abruptly to the fourth place in May, having been only 35th in March and 10th in April and reaches the second place in June, with 1,303 cases. In June, the first place is held by the enagalous crime of rape upon adults, 1,313. The fourth place also belongs to a sexual offence, abortion, 1,080, while parasite occupies the third place, 1,151. In July, rape of minors rises to the first place, 1,330, and the other most numerous crimes are of a similar kind. Kidnapping, 1,118, an offence against chastity, 1,093. The third place comes bodily injuries to blood relatives, with 1,100 cases. In August, sexual crimes recede to the third place, giving the first to crop burning. This, however, is caused not so much by the temperature as by the opportunity. For the harvest time, it is easiest for the workman to revenge himself upon the landlord. However, as Moray brightly observes, that it is not without its responsibility for the appearance of this passionate tendency. The crimes may be responsible for the fact that perjury becomes rarer than subordination of minors. In September, brutal passions become less violent. Sexual assaults upon children move to the 15th place, and those upon adults to the 25th, while theft and breach of trust take the 4th place. Embezzlement and bribery have the first place in September and October, for in those months rents fall due and accounts are settled. The numerous substitutions and concealments of newborn children correspond to the greater number of births. From October to January, murder, parasite and highway robbery are more frequent, since the nights are long and the fields deserted. In November, business resumes its full activity, and as a consequence, falsification of accounts and bribery increase. In January, the passing of counterfeit money and the robbing of churches takes the first place, apparently on account of the dark days. In February, infanticide and the concealment of birth break out again, corresponding to the increased birth rate. Sexual crimes having fallen in October to the 28th place, and rapes upon adults to the 29th, rise in November to the 24th and 26th places respectively. There can be no doubt of the influence of heat upon crimes of passion. I prove this in another way, first by consulting the registers of five great Italian prisons, where the punishments inflicted were for rioting, fighting, and violence against persons, and secondly from the observations made by 
Virgilio in the penal institution at a during a period of five years. The following figures show that acts of violence are much more numerous in the hot months. The table is displayed on the page, citing all months of the year. One obtains similar figures in insane asylums by keeping account of the acute attacks of the insane. The table is displayed on the page. We have three columns, the maximum and the minimum, the list of months, and the years. Subchapter 8. Excessive Heat Excessive heat, on the contrary, especially when coupled with humidity, exercises a slighter influence. Core observed with regard to the crimes of the Creoles in Guadalupe that when the maximum temperature is reached, July 5th, 85 degrees, there is a minimum of crime, especially against persons, while in March, with a temperature of 62 degrees, there is a maximum number of criminals. We have here, then, an aversion like that which too great heat produces in the case of revolutions, and this because moist heat, when excessive, acts as a depressant, while moderate cold, on the contrary, acts as a stimulant. There were crimes against property in the hot season, 51, in the cold season, 53, crimes against persons in the hot season, 23, in the cold season, 48. Corps observes also that the month of June furnishes the largest number of crimes against persons, and January the smallest. Subchapter 9. Other Meteorological Influences Superintendents of prisons have generally observed that the inmates are more excited when storms are approaching and during the first quarter of the moon. I myself is not sufficient data to prove this, but as the insane, who have numerous points of contact with criminals, very sensitive to the influence of temperature, and respond quickly to the variations of the barometer and of the moon. It is therefore very probable that the same is true of criminals. One fact, however, has proved to me that organic influences are at work at the same time as meteorological. For several years I have noted day by day the criminals received into the jails of Turin, and have always found that upon corresponding days in different years, there have entered a remarkable number of individuals, 10 to 15, with the same bodily peculiarity, persons who had a hernia, or were asymmetric, blonde or brunette, though often coming from different provinces. Entirely different groups were to be found within the days of the same week, when therefore there was no significant change in the influence of the temperature. In recent years, economic and political influences have come to the front and have reduced meteorological causes to the second rate. Thus, in France, the effect of the mean annual temperature upon revolts evident in the past has increased in the last few years while Northern Europe, Russia, Denmark, on the other hand, although under the same climatic conditions, has had several uprisings. But nevertheless, the effect of the weather cannot be doubted. Subchapter 10. Crimes and Rebellions in Hot Countries In all this, the preponderant influence of temperature is plainly evident, even if it is not exclusive, and this may be seen still better from the geographical distribution of crimes and political rebellions. In the southern parts of Italy and France, there occur many more crimes against persons than in the central and northern portions. We shall return to this fact again, speaking of brigandage and of the Comora. Guerrier has shown that crimes against persons are twice as numerous in southern France, 4.9, as in central and northern France, 2.7 and 2.9. Vice versa, crimes against property are more frequent in the north, 4.9, than in the central and southern regions, 2.3. In Italy, there occur, my table is displayed on the page, titled, For Each 100,000 Inhabitants. The table displays three columns with indictments for crime, homicides, highway robberies with homicide, and aggravated theft. These are divided up between Northern Italy, Central Italy, Southern Italy, and Insular Italy. Liguria, simply because of its warmer climate, shows a greater number of crimes against persons than the rest of North Italy. In the period from 1875 to 84, the maximum number of crimes was furnished by Latium and the next highest number by the Ions. The minimum occurred in the north, with 512 crimes to the 100,000 inhabitants in Piedmont and 689 in Lombardy, while Latium showed 1,537, Sardinia 1,293, and Calabria 1,287. We find the greatest number of homicides exclusively in the south and upon the islands. In Russia, infanticide and stealing from churches are most numerous in the southeast, while homicide and especially parasite occurs with a frequency that increases as one goes from the northeast to the southwest. Anachin. 
Otzendorf estimates that murder is 15 times as frequent in the southern states of North America as in the northern states. So in the north of England, there is one homicide to 66,000 inhabitants, and in the south, one homicide from 4,000 to 6,000 inhabitants. In Texas, according to Redfield, in 15 years, there were 7,000 homicides to 818,000 inhabitants. Even the school children were frequently provided with dangerous weapons. In studying the distribution of simple and aggravated homicides in Europe, we find the highest figures in Italy and the other southern countries, and the lowest in the more northerly regions, England, Denmark, Germany. The same can be said of political uprisings in all Europe. We can see, in fact, that the number of crimes increases as we go from north to south, and in the same measure as the heat increases. We find the maximum in Greece, which with a population of 10 millions, shows 95 revolutions and the minimum in Russia, for which on the basis of the same population, the number would be only 0.8. We note that the smallest number is to be found in the northern countries, England and Scotland, Germany, Poland, Sweden, Norway and Denmark, and the largest in the southern countries, Portugal, Spain, Turkey and Europe, and southern and central Italy, intermediate numbers in the regions lying between. Grouping the figures in this way we find, in Northern Europe, about 12 revolts to 10 million inhabitants. In Central, 25 revolts to 10 million inhabitants. In Southern Europe, about 56 revolts to 10 million inhabitants. Considering Italy separately, we find. In Northern Italy, 27 revolts to 10 million inhabitants. In Central Italy, 32 revolts to 10 million inhabitants. In Southern Italy, 33 revolts to 10 million inhabitants, including 17 in Corsica, Sardinia and Sicily. Arranging these crimes by degrees of latitude and figuring their ratio to the population, we arrive at the following table. A table is displayed on the page with three main columns, the degrees of latitude, and Spain and Italy to 100,000 inhabitants. These are further divided up between the number of crimes committed and faults against officers of the law and crimes against persons, resistance to officers, and homicides. From this table, the influence of the climate is plainly to be seen. It is modified only by the influence of the capital, 1 and 2, and other great cities, 3 and 4. Aggravated theft occurs in Spain in the north, Santander, Leon, in the south, and in the center with nearly equal frequency, as often in Cadiz, as in Badojas, Caqueras, and Salamanca, because these crimes depend less upon climate than upon opportunity. For the same reason, infanticide and parasite are more numerous in the central provinces, where the capital is, and in the north, the same is true in France and Italy and in Europe generally. In Italy we see from the investigations of Ferry that in all southern Italy and the islands, with the exception of Sardinia, the influence of the heat is dominant in the number of simple homicides, and with the other exception of Forli, in the case of aggravated homicides also. So likewise, murders increase in southern Italy and the islands, with the exception of the regions colonised by the Greeks at the provinces of Apuli, Catania, Messina, etc. Assaults also vary according to the same law, except in the case of Sardinia, where they are less numerous than would be expected, and of Liguria, where they are more so. Parasites follow a similar course. They are very numerous in southern and insular Italy, with the exception of the Greek portion, but very numerous also in the heart of Piedmont. Poisonings abound equally in the islands and in the heart of Calabria, but here the climate is plainly not responsible. Infanticide is likewise very frequent in Calabria and Sardinia, but it rages also in Abruzzo and Piedmont, showing itself to a certain extent independent of the climate. Highway robbery accompanied by homicide is, for the same reasons, very abundant in Upper Piedmont, in Massa and Port Mortis, as upon the extreme boundaries of Italy and in the islands. Aggravated theft, common in Sardinia and Calabria, and at Rome shows another maximum of Venice, Ferrara, Rovigo, Padua and Bologna, and is accordingly almost independent of the climate. The same climatic principle holds in France, where murders and homicides are most prevalent in the south, with some exceptions that may be explained by racial influence. Parasite and infanticide, on the contrary, are most numerous in scattered districts in north, centre and south alike, not from any climatic influence, but essentially because occasional causes are at work in these places. End of section 1
Chapter 2 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 2 Influence of Mountain Formation upon Crime, Geology, Soils Producing Goiter, Malaria, etc. Subchapter 11 Geology my earlier investigation showed me that geological conditions have very little influence upon political crime, and that accordingly, in France, uprisings are equally frequent upon the different formations, aside from a slight divergence in the case of the Jurassic and Cretaceous. The same remark applies to crime against persons in France, where, for a period of 54 years, we find the following distribution of these offences in departments predominantly. Jurassic and Cretaceous, 21%. Granite, 19%. Clay, 22%. Alluvial, 21%. The same proportions with almost no differences hold for crimes against property. Subchapter 12. Orography. Upon investigating the relation of the general conformation of the country to frequency of crimes against persons, we find that during 54 years, the minimum, 20%, occurred in the level country. The mean, 33%, in departments that were hilly, while the maximum 35% occurred in mountainous departments. This is without doubt due to the fact that the mountains offer more opportunity for ambuscades and also breed a more active race. I have no doubt that there is an actual connection between criminality and a greater activity, for I found the same distribution to hold true in France, Virginia, and for revolutionary tendencies, being both more frequent in the mountainous departments and less so in the plains. Rape, while almost equally common in the mountains, 35%, and among the hills, 32%, is much more common in the level country, 70%, certainly because of the greater and denser population resulting from the large cities. The same may be said about crimes against property, and for the same cause, for these crimes reverse the order of frequency given for crimes against persons, and while reaching 50% in the plains, show 47% in the hilly departments, only 43% in the mountains. In Italy, this orographic connection is less clear. We find the maximum of crimes against property, 201 to 100,000 inhabitants, in the valley of the Po, on the one hand, and in the mountain and coast districts of Calabria and Leghorn on the other. In Tonquin, piracy is favoured by the system of irrigation, which facilitates the operations of bandits on the sea coast. Subchapter 13. Malaria. Of the districts of Italy that are most visited by malaria, where between 5 and 8 to the thousand of the population die of it, Grosseto, Ferrara, Venice, Cremo, Vercelli, Novara, Lanciano, Vest, San Severo, Catanzaro, Lis, Foggia, Terrahina, and Sardinia. Five out of the thirteen, Grosseto, Ferrara, Sardinia, Lis, and Terragia, show the maximum number of crimes against property. On the other hand, there seems to be no connection between the occurrence of malaria and of homicide. In southern Sardinia, where malaria is most frequent, there are fewer crimes of this character, and also fewer sexual crimes than in the northern part. The same is true of France, where those departments that are most scoured by malaria, Morbihan, Lens, Loire-et-Cher, Ain, show the smallest number of homicides and rapes. Subject 14. Goitrous Districts The great districts of Italy in which Goiter and Cretanism are indigenous, and in which the soil has great influence on the health and intelligence of the inhabitants, like Sondrio, Osta, Novara, Cuno, and Pavia, show no corresponding degree of criminality. All have less than the average number of homicides, of thefts, and with the exception of Sondrio, of sexual offences also. The same remark can be applied to the goitrous districts of France, of which the majority have only from 1.0 to 5.7 homicides to a million inhabitants. Only in the departments of Bessès and Hautes Alpes, and Pyrenees, Orientales is a number of homicides greater, 9.76 to the million. For theft also, the Goitrous districts show very low figures, with the exception of the departments of Dobbs, Vosges, and Ardennes. It is worthy of note, however, that in almost all Goitrous districts, there is to be reserved in the performance of crime a great degree of cruelty mingled with lasciviousness. Subchapter 15. Influence of the Mortality Rate of the 23 French departments that show a minimum mortality rate, 
7, 30%, have more than the average number of murders. These are Lot et Garon, Ains, Main, Coche Dior, Ewer, Hort Sion, and Orb, giving an average of 13.9%. For 18 departments with an intermediate mortality rate, 6, 33%, show a high number of assassination than the average. They are Indred Loir, Orb, Bases, Pyrenees, Heralds, Dubs, Sainetois, and Vosg. The 18 departments have 15.4% of murders, that is to say, about as many as the first group. Of 25 departments having a maximum mortality rate, 7, 20% exceed the average number of murders. They are Basses Alps, Hoyt Loir, Sien, Saint in fear, Bouches du Rhone, Corsica, and Var, which give an average of 28%. If, however, the last two departments be omitted as showing an abnormally high degree of criminality, the figure is only 20%, much nearer the other two. With regards to thefts of 24 departments with a maximum mortality, 14 exceed 90%, and the same is true of 17 of the 18 departments with an intermediate mortality rate. Of 25 departments having a minimum mortality, 8 pass, 90%. To sum up, then, it may be said that there exists no relation between the mortality rate and the frequency of theft, while the frequency of murder increases as the mortality rises. In Italy, this may be especially well seen in Sardinia, Sicily, and Basilicata. Revolts, likewise, are more common in districts where the mortality is greatest. Of 27 departments in France with a minimum mortality, 15 manifested republican tendencies under the empire, but of 27 departments with the highest mortality, 20 were republican. End of chapter 2 Section 4 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recorded by Leon Harvey Chapter 4. Civilization, Barbarism, Aggregations of Population, The Press, New Kinds of Crime. Subchapter 26. Civilization and Barbarism. Among the numerous social problems, there is one especially whose certain and complete solution concerns us greatly. It is that the influence of civilization upon crime and insanity. If we judge by statistics alone, we shall conclude that the problem is already solved. For in every country of Europe, except England, we find that crime and insanity are each year increasing out of proportion to the growth of the population. A footnote is displayed on the page. In France from 1826 to 1837, there was one person indicted to each 100 of the population. In 1868, the indictments had reached 1 to 55. Du Fau, Traité de Statistique, 1840, Bloc, L. Europe Politique, 1870. From 1825 to 1838, the indictments, excluding political crimes and fiscal misdemeanors, rose from 57,000 to 470 to 80,920. In 1838, the indictments increased from 237 to the 100,000 to 375. In 1847, to 480. And from 1854 to 55 to 1866, they sank to 389. To increase again, to 517 in 1874 and to 552 in 1889. There was then an increase of about 133% in 50 years. Surely, France Criminelle, page 10. Other tables displayed on the page, displaying data for years, the conviction rate, the number of inhabitants and indictments in Austria and England and Wales. From 1805 to 1841, the population increased 49% the crime six times more than the population. In some countries, Monmouthshire, for example, the population increased about 128%, crime 720%. Aberdeen Discordal, 1876. In Italy, there were, from 1850 to 1859, 16,173 indictments for serious crimes and 7,535 convictions. From 1860 to 1869, 23,854 indictments and 10,701 convictions. From 1863 to 1869, crimes increased one-tenth, the population about one-twentieth. Curcio, Opsio. But 
Mesodaglia rightly observes in this connection how easy it is to make a mistake in attempting to solve, on the basis of statistics alone, complex problems into which many factors enter at the same time. The continual increase of crime and insanity can, in fact, be explained by changes in the civil and penal laws, by a great tendency to bring accusations, by the easy access to asylums for the insane, and by the greater activity of the police. One thing appears certain. Civilization and barbarism alike possess crimes peculiar to them. Barbarism, by deadening the moral sensibilities, diminishes the horror of homicide, which is frequently admired as an heroic act. By making revenge a duty a confusing might with right, it increases crimes of blood and encourages associations of malefactors, just as among the insane develops religious mania, demonomania, and imitative insanity. On the other hand, family ties are stronger, while sexual excitement and insane ambition are less frequent, and consequently, parasite, infanticide, and theft are less frequent. The types of civilization which man is hitherto produced, according to Guglielmo Ferraro, are two: the type characterized by violence and that characterized by fraud. They are distinguished by the form which the struggle for existence takes. In the primitive civilization, the struggle is carried on purely by force and wealth and power achieved by arms, at the expense either of foreigners or of weaker fellow citizens. Commercial competition between two peoples is carried on through armies and fleets, that is to say, by the violent expulsion of competitors from covert and markets. Judicial contests are decided by the duel. In the civilization characterized by fraud, on the other hand, the struggle for existence is carried on by cunning and deceit, and the wager of battle is replaced by legal chisanery. Political power is obtained no longer at the point of the sword, but by money. Money is extracted from the pockets of others by tricks and mysterious maneuvers, such as the operations of the stock exchange. The commercial warfare is carried on through the perfection of the means of production, but still more through the perfection of the art of deceit. The skill acquired in giving the purchaser the impression that he is getting a good bargain. To the first type there belong Corsica, part of Sardinia, Montenegro, the Italian cities of the Middle Ages, and in general nearly all primitive civilizations. To the second type, on the other hand, belong all the modern civilized nations, that is to say, those among whom the capitalistic regime has reached its complete development. The distinction between the two types is not, however, so absolute in reality as it is in theory, for characteristics belonging to the two different types are often found mixed together in the same society. Now, since pathology, in the social field as in the physical, follows in a pathway of physiology, we discover these same two means of contest in the criminal world. As a matter of fact, there are two forms of criminality manifesting themselves in our day, side by side. Atavistic criminality, which is a return on the part of certain individuals of morbid constitution to the violent means of the struggle for existence now suppressed by civilization, such as homicide, robbery and rape, and evolutive criminality, which is no less perverted in intent but more civilized in the means employed. For in place of violence, he uses trickery and deceit. In the first class of criminals fall only a few individuals, fatally predisposed to crime. In the second, any one may come who has not a character strong enough to resist the evil influences of his environment. Segel rightly observes that the same division occurs in the two forms of collective criminality, which are to be found, the one in the upper and the other, in the lower ranks of society. On the one side are the rich, well-to-do, who in politics and business sell their votes and influence, and by the aid of intrigue, deceit, and speculation steal money from the public. On the other hand, there are poor and ignorant, who, in anarchist plots and demonstrations and insurrections, attempt to revolt against the situation to which they are forced and the wickedness of those in high places. The first of these two forms is especially modern and evolved. The second is atavistic, brutal, violent. The former is a thing of the brain and proceeds by a cunning device, like imposture, misappropriation or forgery. The latter is a thing of the muscles, and works by violent means, like insurrection, bomb-throwing, or assassination. Italy, in the last few years, offered only too frequently the sad spectacle of the simultaneous breaking out of both forms of criminality. On the one hand, we have had in Sicily brigandage and famine and riots, to which a pious or interested lie has given another name and ascribed other causes. At the same time, we have seen at Rome, in connection with the bank scandals, the gross immorality of the wealthy classes. I have given in my Homme Criminel 
examples of crimes of blood committed in the Middle Ages by special associations. But it may be asked, why, even ancient times, these criminal associations existed everywhere? Have they persisted in certain countries only disappearing from the others? The answer is easy if we consider the partially civilized condition of the peoples, and especially the condition of the governments which maintain and foster this barbarism, the first and continuous source of these perverted associations. The more governments are organized as parties, says D'Ezekiel, very truly, the more will parties organize themselves into governments. When the royal post office violated the privacy of letters, and bargaining with thieves allowed them full liberty for all their excesses in brothels and prisons, the very necessities of the situation contributed to protect the communist, for he was the one person who could carry a letter safely, protect one from assassination, ransom a stolen object at a fair price, or even pronounce, in minor matters, judgments doubtless as just as, and certainly quicker and less costly than those offered by the regular tribunals. The Camorra was a kind of natural adaptation to the unhappy circumstances of a people rendered barbarous by bad government. Brigandage, in its turn, has often been a kind of wild justice against the prisoners. In the period of serfdom in Russia, the Mojiks, indifferent to life and embittered by constant suffering for which no one cared, were all ready to avenge themselves by homicide, as is proved to us by a song made public by Dixon. There is no great Russian family, says well-known author of the work on European prisons, which does not include in its history the violent death of one of its members. The immobilization of capital and avarice drove the rich men of southern Italy to a serene and unbelievable plundering of the poor peasants. In Fondi, writes Jodis, many became brigands on account of the extortions of the mayor, Amante, Coppa, Messini, and Tortora are driven to brigandage by the way their inhabitants were abused with impunity. The peasants of southern Italy, says Gavon, in the investigating committee, see in the brigand the avenger of the injustice with which society overwhelms them. The dissensions between rich and poor over the division of certain lands which formerly belonged to ancient barons, but of which the title was now in doubt, which had been promised to all, especially to the poor farmers, the hatred which divided the few representatives of the lesser nobility in their communes of southern Italy, and the acts of vengeance, practiced against the clients of one or another. These were the principal cases of brigandage. Of 124 communes in Basilicata, there were only 44 without a brigand, and these were the only ones where the administration was in the hands of honest mayors. Of the two communes, Bomba and Montezoli, near Chieti, the first where the poor were well treated, had no brigands, while the second where they were abused had a great number of brigands. In the smaller states of southern Italy, observes Villari, very truly, the Middle Ages still exist in the midst of modern civilization, only in place of the ancient baron, where today the plebeian creditor. We have in Sicily, writes Branchetti, a class of peasants who are almost slaves of the soil, a second class consisting of persons who consider themselves superior to the law, and a third, and this the most numerous, who regard the law as useless and exalted to the dignity of a principle the customer securing justice for themselves by their own efforts. And where the majesty of the law is misunderstood and despised, its representatives cannot be respected. The public official in Sicily is flattered and fawned upon, so long as the originators of the abusers and tyrannies there hope to have him for an accomplice, or at least as a silent spectator of their misdeeds. But as soon as a man is discovered who is faithful to his duty, he is detested, hunted, assailed, and posed by every possible means. After the abolition of feudalism, continues Fanchetti in another place, the external form and the social relationships had to change. Even the real nature of those relationships did not. The absolute power of the great had ceased to be a legal institution, together with the jurisdiction and police power of the nobility. The instrument which must now be employed to cover up abuses was the officer of the state or city. But bribery did not always suffice to secure his connivance. It was necessary to employ special artifice. Some device must be used to acquire or retain control over those whose economic condition did not directly reduce them to practical slavery. Brute force had to give place, in part, to trickery and cunning. But for all that, violence was not done away with, at least in a large part of the island. Now the only come to break up the ancient traditions, and the instruments for carrying them into effect had not ceased to exist. The former officers of the feudal barons, though trust to one side, 
who was still there to say nothing of the men who had already committed some crime or were ready to do so and who could not fail to be numerous in a country where the opportunity for crime and the powerlessness of the law were traditional but now the officers like the criminals by their trade on their own account and whoever wanted their aid had to treat with them both the word malandrino in sicily loses its significance as a term of infamy and comes to be used among the people as a laudatory designation proudly borne by many honourable persons i am a brigand malandrino means for them that the speaker claims to be a brave man afraid of nothing especially not afraid of justice which they confuse with the government or rather with the police this false conception of morals this lack of perception of the distance between honesty and double dealing explains how it is that the brigand finds accomplices among the peasants and even among the proprietors with whom he lives and who regard crime as a new means of speculation this state of things according to the reports of the prefects is the worst plague in sicily for while the real brigands who roam the country are few in number at certain times they become legion reinforced by their peasant auxiliaries Further, great proprietors themselves make use of the brigands for the purpose of exacting ransoms and nulling wills and establishing their tyranny over their fellow citizens. From this comes their repugnance to laying information, which seemed to them more immoral than murder itself, so that a dying man may conceal the name of his murderer to the last. It is not homicide that arouses their aversion by the law. Accordingly, in a few cases in which accusation is brought, the crime still goes generally without punishment. Thus, in the province of Naples, of 150 brigands taken with arms in their hands, 107 were acquitted by the jury, and only 7 convicted. The situation is the same in the Romagna, as Alfred Comandini has shown us, and according to Board and Bornet in Corsica also. The cause of all our ills, writes Comandini, is the abuse of wine, the widespread custom of carrying arms, and the political associations that have come down as a tradition from the despotic times when all classes took part in them, even at the peril of their lives. Their aspirations were honourable, but very often they favoured the escape of a prisoner. Because if arrested, he might betray them. These associations have no longer any political or educative aim, not even that of mutual assistance. They afford oftenest only an occasion for drinking together, generally at the expense of the richer members, and this usually degenerates into fighting and brawling, in which from their traditional duty of aiding one another large numbers are frequently involved. But even more significant than the situation in the Royal Magna is the example which Korsgaard gives of an unconscious criminality, derived from social historical conditions, as well as from the purely historical influences already pointed out. The frequency of murders committed out of revenge, writes Bournet, is known to all the world, but is not so well known how trivial the causes often are that a dog belonging to a Tafani was killed by a Rossino, caused the death of 11 members of the two families. In 1886, there were 135 attacks upon persons, or 1 to 200 inhabitants, that is to say, four times more than the department of the scene. Of these 135 attacks, 52 were made a result of quarrels and brawls. No witness can be made to testify. In Palermo, there were 60 persons present at a crime, all of whom swore that they had seen nothing. Board of following reports of the constability estimates the number of banners at from 500 to 600. It all comes back to this, he says, that the peasants in remote villages who are enemies to the chief of the clan are persuaded that there is no justice. The Corsicans are very proud, scorn of physical labour, and till the soil only unwillingly. They are better endowed intellectually than morally, and have a way of their own of regarding good fortune and conscience. Their organization is very similar to the Roman patrician system. Fifteen or twenty families rule all the rest, some having control of only a hundred votes, others having thousands of electors to express their will. For two hundred years, fifty families have been devoted to a single one. Independent life is impossible, for he who stands alone comes to nothing. The members of a family risk their lives with sublime self abnegation for the sake of one of their number. Two consciences struggle for supremacy on the island. The modern conscience, inspired by the principles of right and equity, and the ancient Corsican conscience, which cannot rise itself above the interests of the family association. The latter generally prevails, 
and the effects of it were seen in the proceedings of the jury which valued the land condemned for the railways the jury presided over by casabianca the chief of the most powerful party in the island menace of notorious by its partiality benedetti an enemy of the party received two thousand francs for a vineyard of seventeen heirs while a certain vigidi a follower of casabianca's received thirteen thousand francs for a vineyard of nineteen heirs and so on in corsica even the victims thought these injustices natural and would have practised them themselves if they had had the power the judges of the peace are all-powerful but very partial and devoted to the interest of the party that has elected them in making up the voting list they do so as they like striking off the names of those who might injure them and adding the names of those who may be useful and this in spite of the courts of appeals and cassation serious crimes not infrequently result the artificers employed at elections are numerous and right and often have a tragic ending at palneca the mayor bartoli three times postponed the voting waiting for a favourable moment the fourth time september twenty eighth eighteen eighty four he and his partisans fortified themselves early in the morning in the town hall and when their adversaries arrived they could not enter these exasperated attempted to storm the place but were repulsed with firearms all day shots were exchanged from one house to the other with deaths and wounds resulting bartoli's opponents told the prefect that they would rather die than endure such slavery in eighteen eighty five in all france there were forty two thousand five hundred twenty three misdemeanors in rural districts also alone had thirteen thousand four hundred five of them nearly a third the progress of civilization by endlessly multiplying needs and desires and by encouraging sensuality through the accumulation of wealth brings a flood of alcoholics and general paralytics into the insane asylums the crowds of prisons which offenders against property and against decency statistics show us in fact the most crimes of this character committed in the great cities among the cultivated classes are on the increase Zigel shows us for his part that modern collective criminality has the same characteristics a table is displayed on the page displaying statistical data relating to crimes in prussia and compared to france there is a summary at the bottom with the ratio of burglaries and highway robberies in corsica to those in france was zero point three eight to one of rapes zero point five to one of parasites and bankruptcies zero to one of extortions three point zero to one rapes of young girls twenty three to one homicides thirty two to one confronted by those two forms of collective criminality it is natural to ask ourselves why does the criminality of the rich take the form of cunning or that of the poor is based upon violence the answer is easy the upper classes represent what is really modern while the lower still belong in thought and feeling to a relatively distant past it is then logical and natural that the former should show the result of modern development in their collective criminality and that the latter should remain on the contrary still violent not to say absolutely atavistic bacot has said in order to be persuaded that fineness of feeling diminishes in proportion as one descends the social scale it is not necessary to visit savage peoples it is enough to talk with the english poor or even one's own servants in the second place if the criminality of the rich is a pathological phenomenon indicative of the defectiveness of the ancient social organization that has come down to us that the lower class on the contrary may appear to be the premature announcement of a new era about to arise it is for this reason that the former bears all the marks of senile cunning while the latter has the reckless audacity of youthful strength finally the rich constitute the majority if not in number at least in power and in the strength of their position the poor on the other hand represent the minority now it is characteristic of all minorities to be bolder and more violent than the majority they have to conquer while well, the majority only have to keep what they have gained more energy is called out by the chance to attain something or reach a little goal than by the need of guarding a present possession victory softens and innervates while the desire to conquer increases the courage a hundredfold it is in fact with a minority as it is with a single individual who is attacked by a number of persons such a one shows a degree of strength which he would not at all manifest if odds were not at hand to aid him necessity increases the defensive power of those who stand alone and feel their weakness the instinct of self-preservation aroused by danger gives to the organism the courage of despair in the field of crime this natural law cannot fail to show itself among the lower classes who have to contend against great odds 
and make up for their natural weakness by the boldness and violence of the means they employ. However painful it may be to admit that civilization has succeeded only in changing the kind of crimes and perhaps increasing their number, the fact itself is easy to understand when one sees how much more advantageous the progress of education has been for attack than for defense. Subchapter 27. Congestion of Population To the reasons which we have just enumerated must be added others of a different order. On account of railways and government and commercial concentration, civilization tends continually to mark the great centers of population still larger and to overpopulate the principal cities, and, as is well known, it is in these that are found crowded together the greatest number of habitual criminals. This unfortunate concentration of crime is to be explained by the greater profits or the greater security which the larger cities offer to criminals. By this, perhaps, is not the only reason, for even the city's vigilance is more relaxed, prosecutions more active and systematic, and temptations and inducements to crime are more numerous. So are the opportunities for us labour. I believe that there is another influence of work which is more powerful still. The very congestion of population by itself gives an irresistible impulse toward crime and immorality. The rears writes Bertillon, a kind of violent and morbid tendency that moves us to reproduce the feelings and movements which we see around us. Many causes contribute to this. Youth, femininity, and above all, as Sarti says, the mutual contact of sensitive persons, which gives added strength to the natural impressions that each one has by himself. The air is filled with a dominant opinion, and transmits it like a contagion. It has been observed that even the crowd together of horses develops a tendency to sodomy. All these causes, together with the parallelism that always exists between the development of the sexual organs and other brain, and also with better nutrition, partly explains for us the great increase of crimes of sensuality, a characteristic of modern criminality harmonizing with a constant increase of prostitution so marked in the large cities. It is for this reason that women are more criminal in the more civilized countries. They are almost always drawn to crime by a false pride about their poverty, by desire for luxury, and by masculine occupations and education, which give them the means and opportunity to commit crimes of the same character as the men, such as forgeries, crimes against the laws of the press, and swindling. Civilization increases the number of certain crimes, just as it increases certain forms of insanity. Paralysis alcoholism, because it increases the use of stimulants, which, while almost unknown to savages, have become a veritable necessity to the civilized world. Thus we see today, in England and America, that in addition to the abuse of alcohol and tobacco, there is creeping in that of opium, and even of ether, and that in France, the consumption of brandy grew from eight litres in 1840 to 30 in 1870. Subchapter 28 the press. Civilization, by favoring the creation and dissemination of newspapers, which are always a chronicle of vices and crimes, and often are nothing else, has furnished a new cause of crime by inducing criminals to emulation and imitation. It is sad to think that the crimes of Trotman brought the circulation of the Petit Journal up to 500,000, and that the Figaro to 210,000. It was doubtless for this reason that the crime was imitated almost immediately in Belgium and Italy. Note the following strange crime. During the absence of the proprietor, R, his strong box was forced. His assistant was immediately arrested, and the exact sum taken was found upon him. Indeed, the assistant admitted of his own accord that he had taken the money, but without evil intent. He had, in fact, without necessity of breaking to the safe, much larger sums under his control, and this, with the consent of his employer, who had great confidence in him. He had committed the crime, he said, only in order to try a trick that he had read a day before, before in the newspaper. His employer, knowing him to be a constant reader of the papers, declared that he accepted his explanation, and as soon as the assistant had been acquitted, reinstated him in his position. In Paris in 1873, one Grumel decided to commit a crime in order to get himself talked of like certain great criminals, of whose exploits he read in the newspapers. With this aim he committed arson, but notwithstanding his confession, his good was not believed. He maltreated his wife with the result that she died, without even himself the cause of her death. But he came out of this affair also with the verdict of not guilty. 
than it was that the case of the widow grass fell under his eye in order to imitate it he threw nitric acid into a friend's face thereby killing him and then went about telling everyone of his crime next day he first hastened to read the account of the murder in the petit journal and immediately afterwards went to give himself up as a prisoner it was perfectly obvious that reading criminal tales and various other reports in the papers suggested to him the idea of his crimes the same may be said of those novels which deal almost exclusively with the acts of criminals like those at present fashionable in france thus in eighteen sixty six two young men brulier and serreau strangled a tradeswoman when arrested they declared that the crime had been suggested to them by reading a novel by delmonds some says the place very truly have received from nature an organism inclined to evil but their inclination is turned into action only by hearing or seeing the misdeeds of others some years ago a package of ten stolen bonds was found done up in a paper upon which the thief had written those gloomy lines taken from a novel by barasque conscious of word invented to frighten fools and to make them submissive in their misery thrones and millions are only to be gained by violence and fraud in the great cities many are incited to crime in the places where cheap lodgings may be obtained for the night many says mayhew are brought to the lodging house through being thrown out of work and from the lodging house are drawn to theft the political laws and the new forms of the popular government imposed by modern civilization and in part also by our pretended liberty favor in every way the formation of societies and the pretext of social amusements administrative enterprises or mutual aid the example of Pamelo, Leghorn, Ravenna, Bologna, Istriof, Luciani, and Peg, and that of Crispi and Nicotera, show us how short the distance is from such generous enterprises to the most immoral violence and even a crime. In North America, some societies have gone so far as to commit crime with impunity, and in two of the most flourishing cities, New York and San Francisco, even officially they have almost succeeded in legitimizing their frauds. The political revolutions which are more frequent with these forms of government cause an increase of certain crimes, either because they bring together crowds of people or because they excite violent passions. Spain is a prison, says an illustrious Spaniard, where it is possible to commit any crime, whether with impunity, provided one cries in favour of this or that, or gives to his crime a political appearance. The number of criminals acquitted there rose in five years to 4,065, four times what they were in France. It is not astonishing, then, that in Spain crimes are proportionally more numerous than elsewhere. Wars, like revolutions, increase the number of crimes because of the increased mass and contact of men, as was proved in Italy in 1866, Curcio, and in North America during and after the Civil War. Sexual crimes which before the revolution of 1848 in France were from 100 to 200, increased first to 280 and then to 505 and with them illegitimate births increased also after all this it is easy to comprehend without the necessity of citing figures how much crimes increased when the criminals are heard together in prisons where according to the avowal of the criminals themselves the greatest wickedness is a title to glory and virtue is a badge of shame civilization by multiplying great penitentiaries gives by that same means a great extension to crime this is more true since unblameable solicitude has introduced charitable and philanthropic institutions reform schools etc which suffice to undermine the character of respectable individuals but not to soften the heart of a hardened culprit we shall see how after the introduction of the ticket of leave there was noted in eighteen sixty one to sixty two in england a great increase of delinquents who had already occurred in eighteen forty three after the inauguration of the transportation system the houses of correction which seem inspired by a truly humanitarian feeling of charity through the single fact of their bringing together the mass of depraved individuals exercise an influence quite other than salutary and always always directly opposite to that which they were instituted it is worth noting here that the illustrious oliver Crona attributed the greatest number of swedish recidivists to the vices of the penitentiary system and to the custom of submitting young offenders to the same discipline as the adults. Subchapter 29. New Crimes Civilization introduces every day new crimes, less atrocious perhaps than the old ones, but nonetheless injurious. 
Thus in London, the thief substitutes cunning for violence. In place of burglary, he practices purloining by means of special apparatus. In place of porch climbing, he uses swindling and blackmail by the aid of the press. Homicide with the aim of getting the benefit of life insurance is an example of a new form of crime committed by some physicians, and favoured too often by new advances in scientific knowledge. Thus the knowledge that the symptoms of arsenic poisoning are similar to those of cholera suggest to two doctors during the cholera epidemic in Magdeburg and Monaco, the idea of first insuring and then poisoning many of their patients. In Vienna a new crime has been invented which consists of appropriating goods that have been ordered for an imaginary society. The anarchists have brought into fashion the use of dynamite against persons and buildings. Recently there have been introduced in Chicago the electric bludgeon and also a small torpedo which being slipped into the intended victim's pocket explodes and blows into pieces. Civilization, by relaxing the bonds of the family, not only increases the number of foundling asylums, which are the nurseries of criminals, but also multiplies the desertions of adults, rapes, and infanticides. Notwithstanding these unhappy consequences, we must not allow ourselves to be led into an indiscriminate condemnation on the fruitful progress of civilization, since even in the matter of crime, the change has not been altogether prejudicial. For if for the time civilization has been the cause of the increase of crime, it has certainly mitigated its character. On the other hand, where progress has reached its height, it has already found means to train the diseases it has produced, with its asylums for the criminal insane, its system of separate confinement in the penitentiaries, its industrial institutions, its saving banks, and especially its societies for the protection of children, which prevent crime almost from the cradle. See Part 3 End of Section 4section six of crime its causes and remedies by cesar lombroso this is a librivox recording all the librivox recordings from the public domain for more information or volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by leon harvey chapter six subsistence famine price of bread subchapter twenty four subsistence one of the factors which complicate the effects of climate and density often the point of their becoming inextricable is that of the difficulty or ease of obtaining subsistence following odingen's comparisons of the numbers of crimes in prussia with the price of the necessary foods we see that the food problem plays a part equal to or even greater than that of civilization for with cheap food crimes against property except arson decrease while those against persons especially rape increase a table is displayed on the page with the year compared with rapes, cases of arson, crimes against property, crimes against persons, price of grain, potatoes, etc. In Prussia in 1862, when the price of potatoes, etc. was very high, crimes against property were in the proportion of 44.38 to 15.8 for those against persons. When the price of provisions fell, the former went down to 41, while the latter rose to 18. The famine of 1847 increased the crimes against persons 24%. We have still plainer proof in the statistics for Prussia from 1854 to 1878 as given by Stark. A table is displayed on the page, displaying the years in which the price of wheat per 50 kilograms was. The data is arranged in several columns. We have crimes in general, thefts, forest thefts, forgeries, bankruptcies, crimes against public order, arson, assaults, homicides and fantasies compared to inhabitants, divided between more than 12 marks, less than 10 marks, between 10 and 12 marks. We see here that, while the price of wheat partially influences crimes in general, it has a direct effect only upon forest thefts, of which the maximum corresponds to the maximum price of provisions. On the other hand, it is clear that the maximum price of wheat, corresponding to a maximum of well-being, coincides with breaking out of assaults, homicizing cases of arson. This may be explained by the fact that when the price of bread is low, the abuse of alcohol is made possible. The median price of grain corresponds with the greatest frequency of forgeries, bankruptcies and crimes against public order. In France, in Coy's graphic tables, figure 1, we see that from 1843 to 1883, the line for the frequency of misdemeanors, nearly all against property, as well as that for suicides, rises continually and keeps nearly parallel with the line for the price of bread as far as 1865. 
At this point, however, while the line for misdemeanors continues to rise, that for the price of bread goes down, proving that other factors enter in here, reducing the costs of subsistence to the place of second importance. The line for crime proper shows no parallelism with the price of bread. Rossi comes to the same conclusions in a study of the criminality of Rome, Cagliari, etc., with respect to heat and the price of grain for the period from 1875 to 1883. The number of crimes against property, excluding aggravated theft and high robbery, is affected at the same time by the winter temperature and the price of food. A graph is displayed on the page with misdemeanors, crimes, suicides, and the price of bread compared to the years of 1843 to 1883. In Rome, in fact, during these nine years, the highest number of crimes, 70,738, was reached in 1830 when a very high price of wheat and a rigorous winter coincided, while in 1877, when the price of wheat was high, but the winter partially mild, the number of crimes reached only 61,498. In 1881, when the price of wheat decreased noticeably and the mean winter temperature increased, there was also a noticeable decrease in the crimes against property. From 70,730, the number went down to 59,815, a diminution which continued through the years 1882 to 1883, while at the same time the price of grain and the rigour of the cold decreased also. The action of the temperature upon assaults and other crimes against persons from 1875 to 1883 amounted to nothing, while for each increase in the price of food, there was a corresponding decrease in the number of these crimes and vice versa. But of all studies of the influence of work in the different kinds of crimes in Italy, the most conclusive is that of the hours of labour necessary to obtain the equivalent of a kilogram of wheat or bread. In this way, the price of food is corrected for variations in wages. We see here in figures 2 and 3, first, that all crimes against property, except where contradictory factors come too powerfully into play, run with great fidelity parallel to the curve of the hours of work necessary to procure the equivalent of a kilogram of bread or grain. This increased from 137 to 153 during the period 1875 to 77, while the increase of the hours of work and decreased from 184 to 111 in the period 1879 to 88, with a decrease in the number of hours. Commercial crimes, forgeries, etc., were not affected. Second, crimes against morality increased as the necessary hours of labour diminish. Thus, from 1881 to 1888, a period in which the hours of work fell from 122 to 92. These crimes increased from 3.11 to 5.25. In England, Scotland and Ireland, the statistics for 50 years, which Fornasari Diverse has examined for me, shows an analogous relation between crime and the variations in the price of grain. This is to say, crimes against property without violence increased generally with the price of grain, as in 1846-47, while crimes of violence are almost wholly unaffected by food prices. A graph diagram is displayed on the page, displaying hours of work necessary to earn one cent of wheat, aggravated thefts, simple thefts, and forgery and swindling compared to the years of 1875 to 1889 in Italy. In 1842 to 45 and 1862 to 63, they fell with a fall of the price of grain, but rose in 1881 to 1886, notwithstanding the cheapness of bread. Further note crimes against property, forgery, counterfeiting, etc., are likewise crimes against persons, were not influenced by prices. For New South Wales, similar conclusions may be drawn from the investigations of Coughlin, Figure 4. The effect of the price of provisions upon murder is uncertain or negligible, the latter being also true of assaults. The influence upon theft is very great, as is also the inverse effect upon crimes against good morals which increase with the falling off in the price of food. Famine lessens sexual vigour, and abundance excites it, and while the need of food drives men to theft, the abundance of it leads to sexual crimes. The same observations hold good for the scarcity of work and reduction of wages. It has been remarked that women and domestic servants are more apt than others to be drawn to crime by the scarcity of food, doubtless because they feel it more. Especially is this the case with domestic servants, who, because of intermittent periods of good living, lose the power of resistance to privation. 
but admitting the action of scarcity of food upon the increase of thefts and of abundance upon the increase of homicides assaults and debauchery it is easy to understand its slight influence upon the variation of criminality in general if one group of crimes increases with a given state of the market another group decreases upon the same conditions and vice versa even when the price of food moves in a constant direction it does not modify essentially the proportion of certain crimes for example in italy the effect of the rise in price of food upon aggravated thefts is very marked yet the greatest difference is between 184 and 105 that is to say a variation of 79 to the 100,000. likewise when the sexual crimes increase on account of the low price of food the greatest difference is 2.14 to the 100,000. a fact easy to understand one thinks of the greater influence of hereditary climate and race at times there arises a strange contradiction in the effect of high prices on homicide ordinarily when bread is dear money is lacking to buy alcoholic drinks and homicide and highway robberies diminish but it happens sometimes in order to produce drink men will commit these crimes in greater number as in new south wales morbihan and vendee according to jolly are the most moral departments and wages there have increased little why the necessities of life have doubled in price but there is less abuse of alcoholic drinks there figure three is displayed on the page titled italy through the years between 1875 to 1889 bread between number of hours of work necessary to earn one quarter of grain one quarter of bread and cases before theft aggravated and simple and imposture to imprisonment it is also continued on this next page with the courts to 100,000 inhabitants, homicide, aggravated and simple, assault, sexual offences, and resistance to the government. One thing is certain, however, and that is that while famines are rare and steadily decrease in number, thefts are constant and always increasing. From all this, it is easy to understand why the power which lack of food and real poverty play in crime is smaller than generally believed. In the statistics of Gurdy, the thefts of provisions form hardly one per cent of the total number of thefts and even with those hunger has less to do than gluttony of forty three cases of objects stolen in london sausages fowls and game stood thirteenth sugar meat and wine thirtieth and bread the last of all jolly remarks that in the french statistics from eighteen sixty to eighteen ninety while thefts of money and banknotes were most numerous three hundred ninety six to one hundred thousand their meal, oats, domestic animals, etc., were only fifty-five to one hundred thousand. Mayer writes, It is seldom that hunger leads to theft. Young men steal knives and cigars, and when provisions are stolen, the grown men take liquors, and women bonbons and chocolate. The same may be said of prostitution. If hunger and destitution, says Locatelli, are sufficient to drive a young girl to prostitution, it will be necessary to confer Montin prizes upon the merits of virtuous daughters of the people who, notwithstanding the greatest privations and seductions of every kind, never sell themselves but remain pure and chaste. Figure four is displayed on the page, a graph displaying New South Wales statistics comparing the price of wheat per bushel, thefts, and swindling to the years of eighteen eighty one to eighteen ninety one. It is not impossible that with time we may arrive at such a point as to be able to show how certain kinds of food favour certain crimes. We know that a vegetarian diet renders those who make use of it mild and traceable, or animal food makes men cruel and violent. This is doubtless why the Lombard peasant patiently bears the evil treatment of his masters, while the Romagnol, addicted to a pork diet, revenges himself with violence. Subchapter 35. Insurrections the influence of hunger in insurrections also has been much exaggerated as i have shown in my crime politique in faraglia's value book storia di presi in napoli which gives us the price of food year by year for nearly nine centuries we find forty-six great famines in the year eleven eighty two eleven ninety two twelve fifty seven twelve sixty nine thirteen forty two fourteen ninety six to ninety seven 1505, 1508, 1534, 1551, 1558, 1562 to 63, 1565, 1570, 1580, 1586 to 87, 1591 to 92, 1595, 1597, 1603, 1621 and 22, 1623 to 25, 
1646, 1672, 1694 and 97, 1759, 60, 1763, 1790 to 91, 1802, 1810, 1815 to 16, 1820 to 21. Now, these 46 years of famine coincide with insurrections only six times, namely in 1508, 1580, 1587, 1595, 16 to 21, 22, 1820 to 21. In the celebrated insurrection of Massanello, 1647, many other causes were associated with the economic situation, such as the madness of Massanello, the hot season, and the cruelty of the Spaniards. For even 1646, there was a famine. In 1647, there was an abundance, if not of grain, at least of fruits, meat, lard and cheese. Moreover, there was no insurrection during the terrible famine of 1182, which lasted five years, and which men could scarcely find weeds for food. Neither was there any revolt during the famine of 49697, when so terrible an epidemic resulted that the people of the cities had to flee to the country, nor during that of 1565, when its stress was so great that rotten cabbage leaves sold for the price that would normally have been purchased fresh and good ones. Nor was there any insurrection in 1570, when the poor left the provinces and strained towards the navels and crowds, famished, emaciated, sick, hoping to save their lives by flight and filling the streets with their misery. Finally, there was no insurrection during the famine of 1586. It is well to recall here that if there were revolts in France in 1827, 1832, 1847, running parallel with economic crises and dearths, there was also a very high summer temperature, and that during those of 1834, 1864, and 1865, we find nothing clearly indicating either an economic or a meteorological cause. In Strasbourg between the periods 1451 to 1500 and 1601 to 25, the average price of beef rose 134% and of pork 92%. For many years, the wages of the workmen sank 10%, and yet there was no insurrection. In 1670, during the extreme famine in Madrid, the workmen organized themselves into bands and plundered the houses of the rich, killing the propertyers, and on a day passed as someone was not killed for the sake of bread, and yet there was no real insurrection. In India, it has been possible to follow the consequence of terrible famine step by step, that of 1865 to 66 caused the loss of 25% of the population of Orissa and a 35% of the population of Puri, and there was no insurrection there in those years. The most noted famines of the last hundred years, at least in Nanhor, one of the provinces which had suffered most through lack of rain and density of population, took place in the following years, 1796 to 70, 1780, 1784, 1790 to 92, 1802, 1806 to 07, 1812, 1824, 1829, 1830, 1836 to 38, 1866 to 1876 to 78. In the famine of 1769-70, a third of the population died. In 1877-78, it is estimated that, in addition to the normal number of deaths, the Great Indian Mutiny of 1857-58 was due in great part to aversion to the innovations, railroads, telegraphs, etc., introduced by civilization, to the conspiracies of the dethroned princes, and according to Hunter, to the belief among the sepoys that their cutters were to be greased with pork fat. Here, then, prolonged hunger was less powerful than superstition. The other Indian rebellions which are known to us had no relation to the scarcity of provisions, neither the insurrection of Bohila in 1751 and that of the Six in the Punjab of 1710, nor that of Sepoys in 1764, neither little semi-dynastic insurrections among the Sins in 1843, nor the Six in 1848. It is worthy to note that the provinces of Orissa, which is that most tried by famines, has the smallest number of insurrections. All this is to be explained by the fact, already shown by our studies of the effect of tropical and polar climates, that when men's vitality is lowered, they have not enough energy to resist. Thus the excesses of human misfortunes is rather less likely to produce revolutions and great prosperity. This is entirely in accord with what has been observed in criminal statistics, namely, that famine and great cold diminish in general all crimes against persons, especially rapes and homicides. End of section 6
Section 8 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Cesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 8. Influence of Education upon Crime. Subchapter 49. Illiteracy and Crime. The absolute parallelism between education and crime, which many maintained several years ago, is today rightly regarded as an error. Barrow found that of 500 criminals and 500 honest men in Turin, there were illiterate, 12% criminal, 6% honest. Knowing how to read and write, 75% criminal, 67% honest. Educated, 12% criminal, 27% honest. With, it is true, a larger proportion of criminals among the illiterates, but also among those who could read and write. Morano proved in 1878, in Palermo, that of 53 crimes committed in the school, 34 came from the pupils and 19 from the teachers, who certainly did not lack for education. Curcio found one confident Italy to 284 of the illiterate population, and one to 292 of the educated, figures which, with a slight increase in illiterates among the criminals, would balance one another. These very slight differences become, in certain categories of crime, still less marked. Three-sevenths of the convicts had received elementary instruction, and one-half of those guilty of sexual offences, one-half of the minor offences, and ten-twenty-fifths of the criminals against persons and property had received some instruction. Crucio, obsit, and while criminals in general give an average of from 50% to 75% of illiterates, criminals who are still minors average only 42%, and sub provinces still lower. In Lombardy, for example, only 5% of the juvenile offenders are illiterate, and in Piedmont, 17%. As early as 1872, it had been estimated that to 453 illiterates, there were 51 who could read, 368 who could read and write, 401 who could read, write and count, and 5 who had received a higher education. According to Jolly, the Department of Heralds, which in 1866 gave the minimum of illiterates, 1% among the conscripts, at that time, had the lowest place in the scale of criminality, whereas now that it has a great number of schools is mounted to the highest, and a similar statement may be made of Dubes and Ron, of Sid. On the other hand, Dubes Severes, Fridney and Lot, with 12, Vienna with 14, Indra with 17, Gust Nord with 24, and Morbihan with 35 illiterates, furnish the minimum degree of criminality, id. Levasseur calculates that of 100 persons inducted in France, there were a table displayed on the page with columns displaying the years between 1830 and 1878 and knowing how to read or write and having high education. Thus, in less than 30 years, criminals with more or less education doubled in number. Tocqueville shows that in Connecticut, criminality has increased with the increase in instruction. In the United States, the maximum of figures for criminality is 0.35 0 0.3 and 0 0.37 to the 1,000 were noted in Wyoming, California, and Nevada, which gave the minimum number of illiterates 3.4, 7.7, and 8%. And the minimum figures of criminality were found in New Mexico, 0 0.03, South Carolina, 0 0.06, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and Louisiana, which had the highest number of illiterates. Nebraska, Iowa, Maine, and Dakota were exceptional, having a small number of criminals and illiterates both as a result of other causes which we shall see presently. In England, the countries of Surrey, Kent, Gloucester, and Middlesex, where there is a higher degree of education, gave the maximum degree of criminality, while the minimum was shown by the more illiterate districts, North Wales, Essex, and Cornwall. In Russia, where education is much less common, Otsinjen, 3rd ed., page 587, calculates that 25% of the convicts know how to read and write, and even 29% of the men while the population at large of the percent can read and write, examine, says Loverage, the records of the courts, and will see that the most unreformable criminals are all educated. Let's forecates, page 207. But Cochrane gives us a still better proof in his Wealth of New South Wales, Sydney, 1895. There, the percentage of illiteracy among the general population in 1880 was 12. The illiterate prisoners were 5.5% of the illiterate population and the more or less educated prisoners, 6.2% of the educated population. A table is displayed on the page, 
listing crimes against persons, against property with violence, against property without violence, rioting, drunkenness, and counterfeiting, compared with persons arrested, illiterate, and knowing how to read, and read and write. In 1891, the general percentage of illiteracy was 7%. The illiterates imprisoned 4.1% and the educated persons imprisoned 4.7%. That is to say, absolutely as well as relatively, that persons who had received instruction had committed more crimes than the illiterate. A table is displayed on the page, listing Gloucester, Middlesex, North Wales and Cornwall, compared to convicts to 10,000 inhabitants, and percentage of illiterates. From 1891 to 1891, pupils in schools increased from 197,412 to 252,940, and the persons arrested from 39,758 to 44,851. For each 10 new schools opened, there were 5 more arrests, and this was true in all the different branches of crime. Subchapter 50. Diffusion of Education, Its Advantages. However, an impartial examination of the figures for these last years brings a comforting assurance that education is not so fatal as it appears at first to be. It favours crime only up to a certain point, after which its influence is the other way. Where education is widely diffused, the list of educated criminals increases, but the list of illiterate criminals increases still more, which shows that the criminality of the class with a moderate amount of education is decreasing. Thus in New York, while the whole population showed 6.08% of illiteracy, and the immigrants who furnished the greatest proportion of criminals lay 1.83%, the criminal class showed an illiteracy of 31%. Of the homicides recently convicted in the United States, 33% were completely illiterate, 64% could read and write, and 3% had a higher education, while the illiteracy of the population at large was only 10%. In Austria, while the young and moral population of Salzburg and the Tyrol have no illiterates, the criminal population show an illiteracy from 16% to 20%. Mesodaglia. In the recent statistics of joy, opposite, we find that in France, to the 100,000 inhabitants, six departments had 7 to 10 illiterates to 9 indictments. 13 departments had 10 to 20 illiterates to 9 indictments. Three departments had 20 to 50 illiterates to 9 indictments. 11 departments had 50 to 61 illiterates to 9 indictments. Here crime increased with a moderate education and decreased with a higher education. In France also the following percentages of illiteracy were found. A table is displayed on the page with a column listing the years of 1827 to 1877 and compared among soldiers and among criminals. The illiterates in each of the two categories diminish each year. Then, but much more slowly among the criminals, and we may add that the criminal under 21 years of age decreased from 1828 to 1863 by 4,152 individuals. The facts appear still more clearly if we study the number of pupils in Europe following Levasseur and the proportion of pupils in the public and private schools to the population following Bodio, together with the statistics of homicides and thefts given by Ferry and those of revolutions given in my crime politique. We shall find the following data. A table is displayed on the page listing Prussia, Switzerland, England, Netherlands, Sweden, Austria, France, Belgium, Spain, Italy and Russia, comparing data to pupils to 100 inhabitants, homicides 1880-82 to 100,000, thefts to 100,000, revolutions to 10 million. From this we see that the number of homicides decreases with the increase in the number of pupils, except in the case of Russia with only 14 homicides, notwithstanding the minimum number in the schools, 2.4, and of Switzerland, which has high figures for both pupils and homicides. Thefts follow the opposite course. They rise in England, Belgium, and Prussia, with a greater number of pupils in the schools, and fall in Spain with a smaller number. Revolutionary tendencies give contradictory results. This relation is maintained to a certain point everywhere if we study the nations severally. In Italy, the parallelism between homicide, rape, and ignorance is complete. The minimum, mean, and maximum of ignorance corresponding to those of the two crimes mentioned, as seen in the following table. A table is displayed on the page. Number of crimes to the 100,000 inhabitants with illiteracy. The data compares homicides, rapes, frauds, and thefts to percentage illiterate. We have seen in France and England that crimes of blood are becoming more and more rare in the large cities, 
where they are nearly always committed by peasants and mountaineers, while crimes against property, on the other hand, are on the increase. A similar situation prevails in Italy with regard to recidivists, just because they are more educated. In Belgium, great crimes had decreased each year since 1832, falling from 1 to 83,573 of the population, which was a figure for the year mentioned, down to 1 for each 90,220 in 1855. In Switzerland, great crimes had decreased 40% since 1852. In France, the more serious crimes, those passed upon by the Azizis, had fallen from 40 to 100,000, which was a figure in 1825 to 11 to the 100,000 in 1881. While the offences which came before the magistrates rose from 48,000 to 205,000. There is, it is true, an augmentation of crime amounting to 133%, but crimes of blood have diminished, while social crimes have been on the increase. From 1826 to 1880, thefts increased 238%, frauds 323%, breach of trust 630%, and social crimes 700%. Vagrancy is four times greater, and offences against officials five times. Bankruptcies have risen from 2,000 to 8,000, and while the number of merchants has increased, of course, this increase has not been in the same proportion. These differences express the influence of education, but this influence has been more remarkable as well as more fatal in England, where from 1868 to 1892, the number of prisoners fell from 87,000 to 50,000, and the number of adult criminals from 31,295 to 29,825. Yet the population increased in the same time 12%, and now it is calculated that there are about 21 illiterates out of every 100 indicted. This diminution occurs especially in London, where schools are more numerous and widely diffused. Subchapter 51. Special Criminality of the Illiterate and of the Educated. All this explains a phenomenon which appears at first completely self-contradictory, namely, that education now increases crime and now decreases it. When education is not yet diffused in a country and has not yet reached its full development, it at first increases all crime except homicide. But when it is widely disseminated, it diminishes all the violent crimes except, as we shall see, the less serious crimes, the political crimes, or the commercial or sexual crimes because these increase naturally with the increase of human intercourse, business, and cerebral activity. But education has an indisputable influence upon crime in changing its character and making it less savage. Fayette and Lacazagne show that in France, 1. Among illiterates, the crimes which lead are infanticide, abortion, theft, formation of criminal bands, robbery, and arson. 2. Among those who can read and write imperfectly, extortion, threatening letters, blackmail, robbery, injury to property, and assaults predominate. 3. Among those who have received a moderate education, bribery, forgery, and threatening letters prevail. 4. Among the well-educated, the predominant crimes are forgeries of commercial papers, official crimes, forgery, abstraction of public documents, and political crimes, opposite. The minimum of forgeries and the maximum of fanicides are found among the illiterate. With the convicts of a higher education, the prevailing crime is forgery of public documents, breach of trust and swindling. Infanticides and violent crimes are lacking. Accordingly, there is a type of crime for the illiterate, namely the savage type, and one for the educated, the milder but more cunning type. In the same way, according to the most recent studies of Soquet, we see that in France, the illiterate criminals gradually diminished in the period 1876-80, in comparison with the period 1831-35. Homicides and murders have decreased among them by half, infanticides and abortions by a third, and sexual crimes nearly a half. The violent crimes of educated criminals are, on the whole, diminishing, while their other crimes are nearly at a standstill. As to political crimes, these increase constantly among the educated. History teaches us that it has been the highly civilized states, Athens, Genoa, Florence, which furnish the maximum number of revolutions, and it is certainly not among the illiterate that the Nihilists and Anarchists get their recruits, but among the more highly educated. Of this I have given abundant proof in my Crime Politique, 
In Austria, the crimes which prevail among the illiterate are robberies, abductions, infanticides, abortions, murders, bigamy, homicides, malicious injury to property, and assaults. In Italy, following the remarkable study of Amati, we find a table displayed on the page with four columns. List as crimes, 1881-83, with political crimes, frauds, homicides, thefts, rapes, rebellions. Compared to illiterate percentages, able to remain white in percentages, and more highly educated percentages. Among 500 individuals who had a higher education, there were in 1881-83 the following number of the crimes specified, the second figure giving the number to the 1,000. Forgeries, 76 to 152. Homicides, 44, 88. Thefts, 40, 80. Forwards, 57, 114. Extortions, 38, 76. Highway robberies, 22, 44. Sexual crimes, 34 to 68. Bankruptcies, 33, 66. Perjuries, 2, 4. Assaults, 13, 26. Parasites, 2, 4. Political crimes, 14, 28. Crimes against religion, 1, 2. Destruction of property, 4, 8. Arson, 9, 18. Instigation of crime, 612. Abortions, 1, 2. That is to say, the figures are higher for forgery, fraud, sexual crime, bankruptcy, theft, extortion, and homicide, and lower for assault, highway robbery, parasite, and arson. Accordingly, while the illiterate lead in homicide and theft, the fully and partially educated together show a higher figure for political crimes and the absolute majority of the rapes and frauds. But it should be observed here that the above statistics belong to a period when thought was completely free in Italy, and when, therefore, though comparatively few political uprisings did not draw into their ranks the better part of the population, hence the relatively large number of illiterates. Now, however, those condemned for political crimes belong to the more highly educated strata of the nation. The same thing is true of Russia, where the greatest number of political offenders is furnished by the educated class. Thus, from 1827 to 1846, the nobles exiled to Siberia for political causes were 120 times as numerous as the peasants. Of 100 women condemned for political crimes in Russia, 75 were well-educated, 12 could read and write, and 7 were illiterate. It cannot be said, then, that education always acts as a preventive of crime, nor, on the other hand, that it always impels toward crime. When it is really diffused among all classes, it has a beneficial effect, diminishing the number of crimes among the moderately educated and making the character of them milder. Subchapter 52. Education in the Prisons However, if education is valuable for the population in general, it nevertheless ought not to be extended to the inmates of prisons, unless it is accompanied by a special training designed to correct the passions and instincts rather than to develop the intellect. Elementary education is positively harmful as applied to the ordinary criminal. It places in his hands an additional weapon for carrying on his crimes and makes a recidivist of him. The introduction of schools into the prison, so once bringing bad men into contact with each other and developing their intelligence and power, explains, to my mind, the great number of educated recidivists. For statistics show us that of crimes against property made easier by education, recidivists committed over twice as many, 67.4%, as non-recidivists, 28.47%, or their crimes against persons were relatively much fewer. It is doubtless the elementary instruction given in the prisons of France, Saxony and Sweden that accounts for the large number of forgeries committed by recidivists. The pickpocket and cutthroat learn in prison at the expense of the state and make false keys to make counterfeit money to engrave banknotes and to commit burglaries. Subchapter 53. Dangers of Education Knowledge, says Seymour, is power, not virtue. It may be the servant of good, but it may also be the servant of evil. To put the same truth in other words, the simple sensory knowledge, or the form of letters, or the sound which indicates an object, or the knowledge even of the great technical scientific advances which have been made, does not raise a moral plane in the least degree. Indeed, it may become, on the contrary, a powerful instrument for evil, by creating new crimes, the more easily escape the clutches of the law. Thus, the advancement of science may enable criminals to use a railroad, as was the case with Tabert in 1845, or dynamite, as with Thomas, or the telegraph and cipher messages, 
as in the case of the Venetian Fangin, who used this means to indicate to his accomplices the courier who was to be robbed. Caruso, the bandit, who were accustomed to say that if he had known the alphabet, he would have conquered the world, and the murderer Del Perro declared, at the foot of the gallows and the cause of his ruin, was the education which his parents had procured for him, since it had made him prefer idleness and poorly paid labour. Finally, all criminals learn, by reading the accounts of trials, of which they are very fond, to put into practice the arts of their predecessors. Thus, among 150 vagrants, may you found 50 who had read Jack Shepherd and other stories of criminals, who declared that this reading had inspired their first steps in a life of crime. From the lowest education to the highest among the Latins, with whom crime is continually increasing, there is no teaching given that does not open the wound rather than heal it. And especially is this the case with political crimes. We live in a stirring time when the days are years and the years centuries, and would have our young people live in an atmosphere thousands of years old. The best intelligence has not time enough to take in that part of knowledge that is necessary to all. Like natural history, hygiene, modern languages and economics, and would have the youth spend his precious hours in learning to babble dead languages and dead sciences, and all to make him a man of good taste. It seems ridiculous to waste ten or twelve years on flowers and musical scales. The mighty torrent of modern life, laden with facts, passes before us and we do not see it. How it will make our descendants smile to think that thousands and thousands of men have seriously believed that some reluctantly learned and quickly forgotten fragment of the classics, or worse still, the dry rules of ancient grammar, were the best means of developing the mind and forming the character of a young man. Better means are the exposition of the most important facts. Better means than study of the causes of those facts. In the meanwhile, we are creating generation after generation whose brains are crammed with study of the form only and not of the substance. And worse than this, since the form may be transmitted in some masterpiece, with an adoration of the form which amounts to fetishism, and is the more false, fly and sterile the longer it has been profitlessly employed. It is from this sort of education that has come the adoration of violence, and has been the starting point of all our rebels, from Cola di Renzi to Robespierre. What is the whole classical education but a continual glorification of violence in all its forms? In this matter, all political parties are alike, so deep said it is evil. The clericals cry hurrah at the danger thrust of Ravalniac, and the conservatives do likewise at the wholesale execution of the communists in 1871. What wonder then that in a society saturated with violence, violence breaks out from time to time on all sides in storm and lightning. It is not possible to declare with impunity that violence is holy, with a proviso that is to be used only in a certain way, for sooner or later someone will come to transfer the gospel of force from one political creed to another. I am glad that my illustrious master Taine has preceded me in this line of thought. In his last pages he has given an almost posthumous admonition to us poor Latins, so vainglorious and so obstinately attached to that which is our ruin. The true learning, the true education, writes Taine, is acquired by contact with things, by innumerable sense impressions which a man receives all day in the laboratory, the workshop, the courtroom, or the hospital impressions which enter by the ears, the eyes, the nose, to be consciously or unconsciously assimilated by him, and which sooner or later suggest to him a new combination, a simplification, an economy, an improvement, an invention. Of these invaluable contacts, of all these assimilable and indispensable elements of mental life, the French youth is deprived just at the most fruitful age. For seven or eight years he has sharp in school, cut off from the personal experience that would give him a correct and vivid idea of things, of men, and of the way to equip himself for life. It is too much to demand of young people that upon a set day they shall present themselves in the examination room in the possession of all knowledge. As a matter of fact, after two months, after the examination, they have forgotten everything. For the meantime, their mental vigour declines, freshness and fertility disappear. The accomplished man, or rather the man who is no longer capable of any change, becomes ticketed, resigned to a life of routine, perpetually turning the same wheel. On the other hand, the Anglo-Saxons, the only race in Europe, as we shall see, among whom criminality is declining, have not our innumerable special schools. Among them, instruction is given not by the book, but through the object itself. The engineer, for example, is educated not in the school, but in the workshop, a thing which permits each man to reach the grades suited to his intelligence. Workman or builder, if he can raise no higher, 
engineer if his talents permits. With us, on the other hand, with the three grades of instruction, for childhood, youth, and young manhood, with the theoretic and scholastic instruction imparted by means of benches and books, the mental tension is simply increased and prolonged by the prospect of examinations, diplomas, degrees, and commissions, while our schools do not give the indispensable equipment, namely, a sound and firm understanding, will, and nerves. So the entrance of the student to the world, and his first steps in the field of practical action, are oftenest by a succession of unfortunate falls, from which he emerges bruised, even if not crippled. It is a rough and dangerous experiment. His mental poise is disturbed, and he is in danger of not being re-established. The disillusioning is too rude and too violent. Finally, education often incites to evil by creating new needs and aspirations without giving the power to gratify them. Especially this brought about by the mingling of good and bad elements in the school and influence the more dangerous when the teacher himself inclines to evil, particularly as sexual relations, as has been observed in Italy and Germany. In this matter, I am much of Dante's opinion. Cher dove l'argumento di la mente, se aguinge al voler et a la posa, ne san reparo a vi pua fa la gente. He reckons as jolly upon the school supplying the place of the parents, who are kept occupied at their work, or who lack the knowledge or ability to do their duty by their children. And you count, on the other hand, on the family to supply the deficiency of the moral training of the school. But while each waits for the other, they unite in accomplishing nothing. There's a footnote of the page, translated from the Italian pose, where intelligence is united with power and wickedness, the efforts of men are vain. Inferno, chapter 31. End of section 8. Section 10 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Cecil Ambroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 10. Religion. Subchapter 65. The influence of religion also is complex, even more so than that of civilization or wealth. We have seen that there are criminals who are very religious, especially in the country and in relatively uncivilized localities, and also criminals who are irreligious or even atheistic. We have seen that among churchgoers, criminals and honest men are almost equally numerous, and often the criminals are in the majority. Of 700 criminals examined by Ferry, one alone was an atheist. One was indifferent, and said him would be devout, and even found religion an excuse for their crime. One of these said, It is God who gives us the instinct to steal. Another, Crimes are not sins, for the priests alone commit them. And still another, I have seen that is true, but the priests pardoned me at confession. The greater number were as careless of punishment in the hereafter as they were of human punishment. Thus the murderer, when Ferry asked him whether he did not fear the wrath of God, answered, But God has never punished me yet. But you will go to hell, oh, I may go, and I may not. And a third, we shall see whether we shall be punished when we are dead. If we rely upon the somewhat limited statistics available in this matter, we shall find that there are fewer criminals where atheists abound, than where, under equal conditions, either Catholics or Protestants dominate. This fact may proceed from the greater degree of education, the more so as in Europe, atheists are especially numerous among the more highly educated. A certain amount of energy is necessary to separate oneself in religious feeling from the general and conventional modes of thought. The same power of inhibition which enables one to resist the imitative instinct makes it possible also to resist the impulse toward crime. Jolly, who nevertheless insists upon the ennobling influence of the external practices of religion, cites Normandy as an example of a district where the respect for ritual religion is very great, and yet at the same time, there is a high degree of criminality. This is expressed in a proverb which she quotes as being in use among the inhabitants of Lazier. Lazarian rosary in one hand and knife in the other. He further illustrates his point by the following occurrence, which happened in Adik. Two groups of men had fallen to a quarrel at the market, and they had already raised their great iron short sticks when Sally the Angelus sounded. The two hostile parties immediately lowered their clubs, uncovered, made the sign of the cross, and aside the Angelus. But the prayer finished, 
They seized their weapons again, and the fight began anew. Jolly observes that although in France the girls are more carefully instructed in religion than the boys, nevertheless, the number of female juvenile offenders has not diminished, and if on the whole there is a decrease in juvenile crime, this is among the boys. Reckless writes that there is a chapel at Trenier, where they go to invoke the Madonna of Hatred, to procure the death of some detested person. In speaking of Sicily, the advocate Locatelli says, It is impossible to conceive the corrupting influence which must have been exercised upon the poorer classes by these thousands of priests, possessed of wealth and influence, idle but endowed with the spirit and sensuality of all southern people. For them, seduction, adultery, and incest itself were pardonable sins. The murderer who revealed his crime and excused himself on the ground that he had been provoked or injured, or even merely that he was in great poverty, was not only absolved, but also released from the necessity of satisfying the secular court. Even where an innocent man had been arrested in his place, the witness who hid the truth from the judge in order to escape danger or to avoid compromising a neighbour was equally certain of reconciliation with God through the mediation of the confessor. The rich man who secluded his own wisdom with a truly Turkish jealousy was treated with consideration if he attempted the honour of a daughter of the people. From small transgressions, such as forgery, a man could purge his conscience by paying the church 32 francs and 18 centimes. It is only a few centuries since the great vicar's general of the richest cities granted permission to commit adultery for a whole year. In other cities, the right to commit fornication with impunity for a lifetime could be attained by the payment of a quarter cask of wine to the bishop's officer, who drew this privilege from the canon de delictissimis by the decretals of the Pope. One man even had the audacity to present to Pope Sixtus IV a petition for permission to commit this sin during the dog days. In our own time, there was a papal bull in force in Palermo until annulled in 1868, by which there was granted dispensation from the necessity of repaying unlawfully acquired money by whatever crime attained upon payment of certain sums to the church. Dupin de saint andre republished in 1879, Les Taxes de la Penitentiary Apostolique, in which crimes are taxed according to tariffs established by Pope John the Twelfth and Pope Leo the Tenth. Thus a layman who had killed a priest was absolved upon payment of seven gros, only five if he had killed another layman. If an ecclesiastic committed fornication with a nun, whether in or out of the monastery, or with one of his cousins or goddaughters, he was absolved only upon payment of sixty-seven francs, eleven sous. If the act was against nature, two hundred nineteen francs and fourteen sous, a nun who had committed fornication with a number of men, whether in or out of the convent, one hundred and thirty-one francs, fourteen sous. Adultery was absolved for eighty-seven francs and three sous. A layman might be absolved for adultery, however, for only four francs, but for adultery and incest, for ten francs, and a John twelfth incest with sisters or mother cost forty sous. Who does not know the maxims of the Jesuits of the last century? La Croix, for example, says, although the natural law forbids lying and murder, under certain circumstances they are permitted. So Bosenbrom declares, an extremely poor man may take what he needs, may even kill any one who tries to prevent him from taking what is necessary. In the same way, Majorca authorised regicide, and Pierre Lugut says, a man does not sin against justice, and is not obliged to return the money that he has given him for killing or wounding. Opposite. However, one thing seems clear to me, namely, that the younger religions are, the greater is their moral power, because the letter has not yet encroached upon their spirit, because the enthusiasm for new ideas occupies the mind and draws it away from crime, and finally because, whatever be its origin, the organism is then more free from symbols and formulas that clog its activity. This fact has been observed with us with regard to Savonarola and the Vaudois, and may still be noticed among the Negroes in the United States, who, when they are converted to Methodism, renounce their idleness and practice of infanticide, so that in the districts where conversions abound, the population increases noticeably. And it is a curious phenomenon that even the new religious sects created by pure paranoiacs, like the Lazaretists in Italy and the Quakers in England, brought about an immediate diminution in crime. Even the Scopsi, who castrate one another as part of their religion, 
are renowned for their honesty. In northern Russia, the Bielorussians do not drink alcohol nor smoke. They wear white clothing women by their own hands and lead a virtuous life. The same is true of the Suzozetsi, who reject priests, images, and military service, and as a consequence often suffer martyrdom. The sons of God believe that each one is his own God, and it is sufficient to address prayers to any neighbor. They unite in wild dances in honor of God, continuing until they fall exhausted to the floor, and with all this they are very honest. The Vedaginsky or Tostosins drink only tea, and allow themselves to be maltreated without resistance, saying nothing more than God help me, until their persecutor falls down in admiration at their feet. These new sects are veritable epidemics of virtue and saintliness. It is a strange fact that the South Russian sects, which are known for their sanguinary character, doubtless the effect of the hot climate, which, as we know, produces an inclination to homicide, nevertheless inspire high morality. Thus the Dukoboros kill all the children of normal in body or mind, out of respect for the divine spirit that ought to dwell in them. One of their chiefs, Kopstein, had his traitors to the dogmas of the sect buried alive. In an action that was brought against him, it was found that he had committed 21 religious homicides. All this appears to us more than criminal. Yet this sect is opposed to war and preaches that the Tsar reigns only over rogues and criminals, while honest men, the true Dokuboros, have nothing to do with his laws or his authority. It is from this sect that the Molokani arose, drinkers of milk, enemies of priests, ornaments, and useful ceremonies. All educated and very honest, these people help one another, have no poor, and to whatever place they are deported, turn the most inhospitable locality into a garden. The Mormons of America also were famous for their industry and probity. On the whole, the contradiction of the influence of religion, now great and totally lacking, disappears when one grasps the significance of the facts. Religion is useful when it is based absolutely upon morals and abandons all rights and formularies. This is a condition that can be realized only in the new religions, because while all in the beginning are moral, afterwards little by little they become crystallized, and ritual practices submerge the moral principle, which is thus easily conceived and retained by the crowd. All members of new sects are men of one idea, which protects them, like a vaccine, against ignoble passions. It is for similar reasons that certain Protestant cities which have a more or less ardent religious fervour, like Geneva and London, are the only ones where crime is decreasing. Notwithstanding the progress of civilization and the dense population, London alone having more people than an entire Italian province. Here it is not an ambition that comes into play, but a great religious passion which neutralizes ignoble instincts and combats vices and immoral tendencies with such vigor that it ends by conquering them. In England, religion recruits thousands of fanatics, who, under the most diverse names and theories, work themselves into a fever of saving men's souls. They extend their activity over an immense field, organizing services, preachings, processions, pious works, etc. In the Latin countries, on the other hand, where the Catholic Church extends its domination, religion can only rarely be a preservation from vice. And this not so much because of the irreligion or skepticism of the people, a smaller factor than is generally believed, even in the country of Voltaire, but because of the very organization of the Church itself. The Catholic Church is a great disciplinary institution. It is almost an army, founded on obedience and subordination, in which each man has his place and prescribed cause of action, laid down by immutable laws. Add to fanatical natures like Dr. Marinado, who are naturally independent and inclined to revolt, find themselves ill at ease in the church, except in missions, which is the only department that grants individual autonomy. On the other hand, they find themselves much at home in the Protestant sects, which are as free and autonomous as little clans or barbarous tribes, as is the case with the Baptists, for example, or the Salvation Army. Further, fanaticism finds in the Germanic nations, and especially in England, a great field for its development in philanthropy, something which is almost always lacking in Latin countries. London is a principal city of these fanatics of philanthropy. Here are men and women of all classes and social positions, rich and poor, educated or ignorant, sane or mad, who have taken it into their hands to cure the disease of society or to extirpate some special form of misfortune or sorrow. 
One has taken to heart the cruelties practised upon children by their parents. Another is concerned for blind old men. A third is concerned for the insane maltreated in the asylums. A fourth is interested in the liberated convicts. And all work without ceasing. Publish journals, organise societies, make speeches, and sometimes succeed in bringing about great social epidemics and movements of popular opinion intense enough to result in some important humanitarian reform. This kind of activity may be an excellent substitute for political fanaticism, which results in dynamite outrages. But in the Latin countries, such agitations would come to nothing. The tradition of the administration of charity by the public authorities or by the church is so deeply rooted that no one wants to concern himself principally with social miseries. If children are often maltreated in the great cities and the papers protest vigorously and stir up public opinion a little, Public opinion will simply demand the enactment of a law by the state and then risk content, though the law will never be enforced. No one would think of founding private societies, such as they have in England, which watch cruel parents and at all times come and snatch their little victims out of their hands. This is natural. In the religions which have survived for many centuries, the moral element disappears, because it conforms less to the sentiment of the masses. While only the ceremonial remains and superabounds. Of seventy-three principal articles in the order of St. Benedict, only nine pertain to mortals. In the order of St. Columbus, one year of penance is decreed for anyone who loses a piece of the host, sacred bread, and six months for one who has two pieces be eaten at once. The only religions, then, which can prevent crime are those that are fanatical, passionately moral, or just arising. The others are no more effective than atheism, and perhaps less so. End of section 10. Section 11 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 11. Education, Illegitimate Children, Orphans. Subchapter 66. Illegitimate Children. The influence of education upon crime is shown indirectly by the continually increasing proportion of criminals of illegitimate birth in the most civilized countries. In Prussia, the illegitimate delinquents, who constitute 3% of the whole in 1859, rose by 1873 to 6%, and the women from 5% to 8%. In France, of the 800 minors arrested in 1864, 60% were orphaned or illegitimate, and 38% were their sons of prostitutes or delinquents. In Austria in 1873, 10% of all the male criminals were illegitimate, and 21% of all the female. In Hamburg, 30% of the prostitutes were illegitimate, Hugel, and in Paris, a fifth of the Parisian-born prostitutes and an eighth of the country women. In the prisons of Württemberg in 1884-85, 14.3% of the inmates were illegitimate. In 1885-86, 16.7%. In 1886-87, While the illegitimate individuals in the non-criminal population rose to 8.76%, Sickert found among 3,181 whom he examined in these same prisons, 27% of illegitimate criminals, or nearly double the other figures. These were divided as follows. The table displayed on the page, listing percentage of illegitimacy. Thieves, 32.4%. Pickpockets, 32.1%. Sexual criminals, 21%. Perjurers, 13%. Incendiaries, 12.9%. Of the habitual criminals, he found 30.6% illegitimate and 70.5% a little more than half as many. Of the accidental criminals, he found also the following. Of 1,248 legitimate thieves, there were 52% aversion of work, 32% beggars, 42% vagrants. Of 600 illegitimate thieves, there were 52.3% averse to work, 39% beggars, 49% vagrants. In Italy, the statistics of the prisons show 3% to 5% among the male minors, and 7% to 9% among the females. We may add that 36% of the recidivists in Italy are either natural children or foundlings. To comprehend the greater importance of these figures, it is necessary to recall 
that a greater proportion of all illegitimate children, at least 60%, and often 80%, die in the first 18 months or two years. Marbell can then say without exaggeration that of four foundlings, three die before they are 12 years old, and the fourth is doomed to a life of crime. To get at the significance of these figures, more exactly, I have made researches with regard to 3,787 entries, nearly all adults, in the asylums of Imola, Dr. Lully, of Padua, Professor Tibaldi, and of Pavia, and also with regard to 1,059 entries in the City Hospital of Pavia in 1871, and I found that there were 1.5% of foundlings in the asylums and 2.7% in the City Hospital. And nevertheless, the mortality is less among the illegitimate in Pavia than in many other places. Age and conditions being equal, families furnish 20 times more delinquents than insane persons. We may affirm then, with the greatest certainty, that the greater part of the foundlings that escape death abandon themselves to crime. Doubtless hereditary enters largely into this result. Most of these children are the fruit of sin. They have no name to uphold. No rain to stop them when spurred by passion. No mother who, by her insidious care, affection, and sacrifices, aids in developing noble instincts and suppressing tendencies to evil. They find an honest, living heart to get, and are inevitably drawn toward evil. If they have no perverse tendencies, they acquire them by imitation. On the other hand, philanthropic institutions like orphan and foundling asylums have also an evil influence. For, as we have seen, a multiplicity of contacts always fosters criminality. Subchapter 67. Orphans. That abandonment and the lack of education play a great part in producing criminality is demonstrated by the great number of orphans and stepchildren found in the prisons. In Italy, among the juvenile delinquents, in 1871 and 72, there were from 8% to 13% of stepchildren. Brace tells that in New York, 1,542 orphans and 504 stepchildren were arrested for various offences. He has that 55% of the criminals in the penitentiaries were without father and mother, and 60% of the children arrested had lost one parent, or the parents were separated. According to Marmel, of 100 juvenile prisoners, 15 have been abandoned by their mothers. In Italy, during 10 years, we have an average of 33% to 35% of orphans among the delinquents. Out of 580 insane asylums in my clinic, orphans furnish 47%, and the number of orphans reached 78% among the 1,059 entering the hospital of Pavia. But it is certainly a still more important fact that we find an average of 18% to 20% of orphans among the juvenile criminals, for the proportion of orphans in the general population is lower than this. The same is true of half-orphans, who furnish 18% of the general juvenile population, but 23% to 30% of the juvenile delinquents. The Italian statistics show 26% of the delinquents to be fatherless and 23% to be motherless. Well, among the insane, 51% have lost their fathers and 10% their mothers. It is certain, on the other hand, that the female sex predominates among orphans who are criminals, even more so in the case of families. This is true even leaning out of account prostitution, which is a sort of minor criminality. So what's in general rise at the strange result? While for each five male delinquents, there is one female. In the case of families, there are three females to one male. This is, however, quite natural. For a woman, being weaker and more passionate than a man, has more need of the support and restraint of the family to keep her in the right way, for which she is more easily turned. Than a man on account of the slippery path of prostitution that is always open to her. Here the hereditary influences are very powerful, and women who have sprung from a sexual transgression are easily led into the same error, and from this to graver offences. The great number of families among delinquents explains also the predominance of judo delinquents in the urban population, Cardon, and gives us the measure of the harm done by defective education and by abandonment. Subchapter 68. Vicious Parentage, Education. It is entirely natural that evil education should have a still more deplorably criminal element than even abandonment. We may recall here the large proportion of criminals who were sprung from unsound parents. Sigurd finds the proportion of pathological inheritance to be 36%, while Marrow makes it 90%. 
6.7% had epileptic parents, 4.3% are descended from suicides, 6.7% from insane persons, one in the case of those guilty of grave crimes, pendifines and alcoholic hereditary of 37%, and marrow of 41%. How can an unfortunate child protect himself from evil when it is presented to him in the most attractive colours, or worse still, when it is imposed upon him by the authority and example of his parents, or those who were charged with his education. We shall comprehend the situation best from actual examples. Fee, a sister of thieves, was brought up by her parents as a boy. Clothed as a boy, she took on a masculine air and wielded her knife vigorously. One day, while on a journey, she stole a cloak and been arrested, accused her parents of the theft. The Cornu family was composed of thieves and murderers, habituated to crimes from their tenderest infancy. Of five brothers and sisters, only one, the youngest, had shown a strong aversion to crime. Her parents found a means of overcoming her repugnance, making her carry the head of one of their victims in her apron for two leagues. In a little while, she was so stripped of all remorse that she became the fiercest of the band and wanted to practice the most horrible cruelties upon their victims. The murderer, Croco, who, at the age of three, used to hit his comrades with stones and pluck birds alive, had often been left by his father entirely alone in the forest as late as the nineteenth year. Fregio tells of the son of a thief, who was his father's pride because he was able, at the age of three, to take an impression of a key in wax. The wives of assassins, according to Vidoc, are more dangerous than their husbands, for they accustom their children to crime, and give them a present for every murder they commit. We have seen, and shall see more clearly in the next chapter, how numerous the criminals are who have immoral parents or families, in which case vicious education and vicious hereditary work together. Here also is a case of abandonment, and for the same reasons, namely prostitution and greater persistency of the women in crime. The number of women subject to these influences is greater than the number of men. To many readers, the influence of education, as shown by these figures, will appear of little importance. But aside from the fact that we must add the figures for families already cited, we must also recall the fact that many crimes have an autoctuous origin, and that many individuals are born perverse and remain perverse, notwithstanding the desperate efforts of their parents to correct them. Among the juvenile delinquents of the year 1871-72, to 84% of the boys and 60% of the girls belong to moral families. This is to be explained by a weakness shown by the parents early in the child's training which later renders unavailing the most strenuous efforts to obtain obedience. Noel Vidoc, Donon, de Marcelli, Le Canier, Abado, Hessel, Frati Valo, Cartouche, Trossarillo, Troppen, Azalone, and Dem all belonged to honest families. Rosati told me that after his first thefts, he had many times been beaten by his father and sent his mother weeping bitter tears over him and he had promised them each time to restore the things stolen. Naturally, they are keeping this promise. On the other hand, it has often been observed, and the investigations of parents du Chatelet and Mayhu confirm the observation that thieves and prostitutes who have become rich do their best to bring up their children to lead virtuous lives. End of section 11《セクション13 of Crime as Causes and Remedies by Cesar Lombroso。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey。Chapter 13 Age Precocity Subchapter 78 Age Precocity one of the few striking differences between crime and insanity is found in the part played by age. A glance at the following tabular comparison between nearly equal numbers of insane, delinquent and normal persons shows that criminals are most numerous at the ages between 20 and 30, at which age is the number of normal persons and of insane is much lower, while the latter are most numerous between 30 and 40. A table is displayed on the page comparing the age to percentages of Italians, normal, insane, and criminals, and English and Austrians. It will be noted that from the age of 40 on, the percentage of the insane is twice that of normal individuals and criminals, while these 
Later, after the age of fifty, are less than half as numerous relatively as normal persons of that age. A more detailed analysis shows that the maximum of criminality is found at ages ranging from 15 to 25 years. In England, the proportion of juvenile crimes declining, and the percentage of criminals under 21 will be seen to be less than the percentage of the normal population falling within this age group. While from 22 to 30, the criminal percentage is double the normal. In Austria, one-sixth of the convicts are between 14 and 20 years of age, and four-sixths between 21 and 40. Of 1,477 criminals condemned to death in France, 107 were between 16 and 30, 534 between 30 and 40, 180 were between 40 and 60, 69 were 60 and over. Of 46 criminals studied by me, 35 had commenced their criminal career in the following ages, 1 at 4 years, 2 at 7 years, 6 at 8 years, 1 at 9 years, 5 at 10 years, 4 at 11 years, 3 at 12 years, 3 at 13 years, 3 at 14 years, and 7 at 15 years. Twelve others confessed that they had run away from home to escape either punishment or work. 10% of the inmates of the reform school at Turin admitted freely that they had learned to steal before 12, not from necessity, but led by the encouragement and instruction of their companions. In the hundred criminals investigated by Rossi and myself, we found 35 who had begun to drink between the ages of 2 and 10 and of these, 25 drank only brandy. Six had become addicted to the practice of masturbation before the age of six, and 13 had had sexual intercourse before the age of 14, all of which shows great precocity and vice. The table is displayed on the previous page, comparing the list of ages to percentages in England of criminals and general population. Marrow found that of his 462 criminals, 18% had become delinquents before the age of 13. Manzoni has very well hit off the principal source of this early leaning toward crime, namely, the mania to pass as full-grown. In his famous novel, he says, Gervais, on account of having had a hand in something that savoured of crime, thought he had become a man like the others. Marrow, in his studies of the conduct of pupils in the schools, found that there were two periods especially marked by bad conduct, the first between 11 and 13 years of age, and the second between 16 and 17. Precocity in crime points to the fact that criminality, much more than insanity, is an inherited characteristic. This reminds us that precocity is one of the distinguishing features of savage peoples. A new proof of the atavistic origin of crime. In this connection, certain customs of the nature of peoples are interesting. Thus young men in certain African tribes, upon attaining their majority, strip themselves and withdraw to the woods where they remain until they have killed someone. We may also certainly ascribe to activistic influence an institution like that of the Scruano in Naples, which for the 15-year-old boys means to play the tyrant, to carry clubs or revolvers, to have love affairs, and to put parents and policemen in their proper places. It is thus a sort of juvenile camorra, in which the highest honour belongs to him who has wounded or killed someone, another proof of the influence is found in the Sicilian word omota, which means either manliness or brigandage. Subchapter 79. Supposed Scale of Crime. In one case I have found a true graduation in the character of the thefts of a young criminal, who began as a boy by stealing four sous to buy a top. He then stole eight sous, then one franc, and finally three francs. But in general the ascending scale of crime is imaginary. For many enter the criminal course by the great door of homicide and rape, while the most atrocious crimes are often the most precocious. There was found one day in Milan an old man riddled with eighty-two wounds, who was believed at first to have been the victim of an atrocious act of revenge. It was discovered that his murderers were five youths of from fifteen to nineteen years, who had committed this horrible crime for the purpose of getting money for a visit to a brothel, that all he wanted was to have a part in stabbing the victim. All great criminals have given proof of perversity in their youth, especially the age of puby, and sometimes even before. This is true of Bonsegini, at 18 years of age, of Boulot at 17, and of the Marquis de Brinvilliers at 18. At seven and a half, Dombey was already a thief and added sacrilege to his theft at 12. At three, Crotto tore out the feathers of living birds. Lassane cut out the tongues of cattle at 11. At the same age, Cartouche stole from his schoolmates, while Mme Lafrange, as a child of 10, 
strangled fowls. Fioraback tells of a parasite who has taken great delight as a child in making hens jump about after he had put out their eyes. The tendency to theft, says Locatelli, shows itself in extreme youth, beginning with little pilferings at home and increasing gradually. Murderers, on the contrary, become such all at once, frequently at a tender age. It's for this reason that children below the age of puberty who have already committed homicide are less rare than second-story thieves at the same age. In the prisons of Paris, there are no less than 2,000 youths from 16 to 21 years of age, 993 of whom are incarcerated for murder or theft, and the assassinations committed by these young criminals are marked by the most horrible ferocity. Maillot and Gil killed their benefactress with the aid of their comrades, and bit off her fingers to get her rings. The youngest of this band was 15 and the oldest 18. Each of the Parisian bands of young assassins included a girl who had scarcely reached nobility. Pepino, Bequins, Quaternary, Verzini, Moro, and Prevost began with assassination. Prevost later was an irreproachable agent of police for 21 years. Martin killed his own wife, having previously been perfectly reputable. Charles IX was cruel from childhood. Subchapter 80. Criminality at different periods of life. Each period of life has its own form of criminality, as Quillet, Guri, and Messer Daglia have very well shown. Youth and old age are found in Austria to furnish the greatest number of sexual crimes, 33%. Guri also finds the two highest points for these crimes to be between 16 and 25, and between 65 and 70 years. In England, the greatest number of crimes contrary to nature are committed by persons between 50 and 60, but doubtless what is taken for a crime at this age may often be the result of creeping paralysis and senile dementia. Another tendency which is observed in youth is that towards arson, 30.8%, in Austria, and in this case, also, it is to be noted that mania before the age of puberty is apt to take the form of pyromania. A similar observation may be made with regard to theft, but Quetel observes that if the tendency towards theft is one of the first to show itself, it also makes itself felt throughout the whole life, and is common to every age period. In the period of manhood, the predominant crimes are murders, homicides, infanticides, abortions and rape, accounting Austria to about 80%. At a ripe age, there is an increasing number of libels, frauds, breaches of trust, crimes contrary to nature, instances of blackmail, and of aid given to criminals. In old age, there are to be observed crimes contrary to nature, aid to criminals, breach of trust, swindling, and what furnishes a new analogy with the crimes of youth, arson. We may get a more exact notion of the distribution of crime according to age with the following table, in which is given the number of persons out of 1,000, of the same age who were indicted in France between 1826 and 1840. A table is displayed on the page comparing age, theft, rape, assault, murder, homicide, poisoning, fraud, label, and total. End of section 13. Section 17 of Crime as Causes and Remedies by Cecil Ambrosio. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 17. Association of Criminals and Their Causes. Subchapter 94. The etiology of associated crime, which is the most important and the most harmful, deserves to be studied by itself. The first cause that may be assigned to this phenomenon is tradition. The long persistence and obstinacy of such associations as the Mafia, the Camorra, and the Brigand Edge seem to proceed in the first place from the antiquity of their existence, for the long repetition of the same acts transforms them into a habit, and consequently into a law. History teaches us that ethnic phenomena of long duration are not to be eradicated easily at a stroke. The Camorra was already existent in Naples in 1568. We know from the edicts of the Spanish viceroys, Count Miranda, the Duke of Alcala, et al., that gamblers, gambling housekeepers, and those who levied tribute on these houses on their own account were threatened with the galleys, and also those prisoners who, under pretext of an offering for certain holy images, levied a tax upon the other prisoners. 
Moni remarks very truly that the etymology of Camor shows its Spanish origin. The word in Spanish means a quarrel, brawl, or dispute, and Camarista signifies a bad character. The Arabic word Kumar means a gambling game. We learn from a novel of Cervantes that at about the time we have been speaking of there was an association in Seville exactly corresponding to the Camorra. This society likewise levied tribute upon every thief for an image which was held in special reverence, gave the police a part of its gains, and I took to execute private acts of revenge, including the Sergio, or face slashing. To this association were attached novices, called minor brothers, who had to hand over the entire proceeds of their thefts for the first half year, carrying messages to the major brothers in prison, and perform subordinate offices generally. The major brothers had a common surname, and shared equitably the sums which the associates turned into the common treasury. The thieves in Morocco also levy a tax upon the prostitutes. Societies entirely similar to the Camorra have existed in all imperfectly civilised periods. Thus Scalia was found mentioned in the Middle Ages in the rules of the Stinch prison and the prisons of Parma, abuses like those of the Camorra, especially in connection with gambling. We read that each room full of prisoners had its chief called Capitano or Podesta. Precisely in the modern Camorrists have their priori. In this medieval Camorra used to tax the newcomers, just as is the custom today. In Don Quixote we are told how certain idle folk exacted a share of the gains of lucky gamblers in return for a prediction of the lucky or unlucky plays. This is the ordinary mission of the modern Camorrist. Brigandage, which persists with obstinacy in southern Italy and in Sardinia, probably had its origin in historic tradition. For it already existed in the most ancient times in central and southern Italy, and Strabo mentions it in connection with Sardinia. In the Kingdom of Naples, writes Gianon, volume 4, 10, there were always bandits in the train of the invaders, Greek, Lombard, Saracen, and Gavin, or Albanian, all alike thievish, cruel, and greedy. Subchapter 95. Religion. Morals. Politics. In countries where civilization is not yet firmly established, there exists no clear notion of morals and justice, and religion is often but the accomplice or instigator of crime. In Bari, there was said daily the mass of the brigands, at the expense of the brigand Pasquale. We are blessed by God, he said to a friend, the gospel say so. The state of morality naturally falls in with these notions of religion. In Naples, 1877, and Esposito, after having assassinated an ex-commodist by order of his chief, went to give himself up to justice in order to protect his superior from arrest. An applauding crowd accompanied him to the prison and covered him with flowers like a hero. Onofrio. Where justice is quite powerless, the injured person must necessarily have recourse to his own strength or that of his friends. If honor is at stake, he will seek a private revenge or if it is a question of stolen property, he will come into a friendly understanding with the thieves. In Sicily, as was seen in the Lombard trial, one pays a certain sum to recover a stolen house or sheep, or the thief may pay a certain sum to the person robbed, in order to avoid persecution or the recovery of the stolen property. This proceeding recalls at every point the customs of primitive justice. There is another and very potent cause that favours the formation of associations of criminals in civilised countries. This is the admiration inspired in the weak by brute strength. Any one who is seen in the midst of an effeminate population with their soft flesh, soft speech, a weak character, a real comoris, with martial brows, iron muscles, and rolling eyes, comprehends at once that if the comora had not been brought in, it would have risen of its own accord, as the inevitable result of the contrast between the energetic individuals and the sheep-like multitude. Even the Camorrist bows to this law. A strong and violent man himself, he bows to one stronger and more violent. Monier cites a very curious proof of this influence. A Calabrian priest in prison as the result of an affair of gallantry, upon entering the prison, was asked to pay the usual tax to the Camorra. He refused, and being threatened, replied that if he had been armed, no one would have dared to use threats with him. If that is all, said the Camorrist, and the twinkling of an eye offered him two knives, and he dropped dead the next moment. 
Same evening, the homicidal priest who feared the vengeance of the Camorra more than he did the justice of the Bourbon government, to his great astonishment, found himself offered the office of Baratuelo in that society. He had been admitted as a Camorrist with his own wish. The same adventure happened to another Calabrian who refused to pay the tax and threatened with his knife the man who tried to collect it. Onofrio writes, in Sicily they call anyone who has courage mafioso. The Camorra is thus the expression of the natural self-reliance of the strong when they see themselves surrounded only by weaklings. But it is not only the strength of the few that maintains this state of things, but also the fear that the many. The brigand Lombroso declared that the warmest partisans of his enterprise were the respectable landowners, who, from fear of making him their enemy, told him of the house of their neighbours that he might rob. They did not realise, he added, that they in their turn would be pointed out by others, so that in the end they lost much more than if they had combined against me. A single unarmed Camorrist, writes Morimer, shows himself in the midst of a crowd of thousands of people and demands his tribute. He is submissively obeyed, much more so than if he were the regular tax collector. The spirit of the Camorra, writes Maudry, persists in navels, that is to say, intimidation persists at the result of arrogance and presumption. One who explains the long persistence of the Camorra and brigandage in southern Italy by the dominance of fear. The religion taught by the priest was nothing but the fear of the devil. The prevailing politics consisted of nothing but fear of the king, who held the middle class in subjection through fear of the proletariat. While both classes were kept in order through the fear of a brutal military and police force, fear took the place of conscience and devotion to duty, or is kept not by elevating man, but by degrading him. And what happened? Fear became a ready weapon in the hands of the most violent. Subchapter 96. Barbarism. Aside from what has been stated above, Many other circumstances belonging to a state of semi-civilization may have an influence upon the prevalence of brigandage. Such a state of society offers more opportunity for successful ambuscades and safe passages of refuge. Thus the forests of Sora, Vizutu, Eselia, Friola, and Silla were always a resort of brigands. And the same is true in France of the forests of Osgier, Rouvray, etc., for similar reasons, localities largely uninhabited and not connected with others by frequent roads are favourable for brigands, and it is never known to persist in countries crossed by numerous good highways with main towns. The province of Syracuse, which is better provided with roads than any other in Sicily, has no brigands, while Basilicata, in which in 1870, 91 out of 124 communes had no roads, was a province most infested with brigands. Subchapter 97. Bad Government In Mexico, not so very many years ago, the sons of noble families thought it entirely proper to commit hire and robbery, just as were the case in Paris in 1400 and in Venice in 1600. In the last years of the pontificate of Clement XIV, there were recorded 12,000 homicides, of which 4,000 were in Rome itself. In Venice, up to the time of Napoleon, there still existed the so-called bully, who domineered over the people at pleasure, entirely by means of the terror they had managed to inspire. To comprehend the unhappy condition in which society was reduced at this period it is enough to recall that the most famous men of the Republic were publicly banished for ignoring his crimes. It is enough to cite Morosini, Camaro, Freleri, and Mocanego, says Molmenti. In the memorial addressed to the emperor by the communes of Castiglione, Adol, and Solferino against Ferdinand II, Gonzaga, it was proved that the assassins of the prince had murdered poor peasants, cut off their heads, and exposed them in an iron cage under the walls of the Castiglione. These men-at-arms burned farmhouses and barns, plundered the dwellings, stole money, cattle and furniture, and cut down or rooted up the vineyards. Even in the Republic of San Marco, which, although fallen into decay, still preserved a reputation for strictness. The depredations of bandits were frequent, especially in the last two centuries. All precautions, laws, threats, and punishments often remained ineffectual. If a Venetian nobleman committed a crime, the government immediately sent a band of men into the city whose peace he had disturbed. 
by the population in whom the criminal inspired the greatest respect protected him and the noble delinquent found a safe retreat in his own castle the magistrates themselves almost all nobles after publishing decrees and sentences against the offender and making loud threats suffered the matter to fall into oblivion the ambassador of the venetian republic in milan sword in hand claimed that he possessed the right of asylum so when one morning the chief of the milan city guard and his men passed before his residence the ambassador to punish such audacity had a volley fired at them and killed or wounded several finally in the times of cartouche there existed in paris something which resembled if not the camorra at least the sicilian mafia the thieves of that time were organized into bands and accomplices even in the ranks of the police they had swayed over bailiffs and spies and enrolled a whole population in their number innkeepers porters watchmakers tailors armourers even physicians in france in fifteen hundred the burgundians and bohemians were veritable bands of brigands composed of vagrants and soldiers of fortune who as society became more and more civilized withdrew into the forests of rovray and estrelle where fugitives from the civil wars went to increase their number sub chapter ninety eight weapons another matter which has great influence in promoting brigandage is the carrying of weapons and familiarity with their use the gladiators in old roman times were the most terrible leaders of bands of brigands and transformed their companies into veritable armies tomasi crudeli says quite rightly in the whole of southern italy beginning with the campagna the knife is not to be regarded as an implement of treachery but rather as the sword of the people almost always in fact its use is preceded by a formal challenge the custom of holding these duels is so deeply rooted that during the disarming of the sicilian populace they were established in all the districts of palermo hiding places in the walls known to all the inhabitants in the districts where they hid their knives at which they got them in case of a dispute sub chapter ninety nine idleness the prevalence of the mafia in palermo is due to the absence of any manufacturing industry and to the influence of the monasteries which is favourable to idleness certainly priests and monks have always been among the causes of brigandage the province of naples in the eighteenth century out of four million inhabitants had one hundred and fifteen thousand ecclesiastics of whom half were monks each village of three thousand inhabitants had at least fifty priests the priests made begging not only a trade they made it a work of merit one of the principal causes of brigandage and the camorra says monier was a custom widespread among the napoleons of letting their children from the age of three on grow up in the street there they learned to beg and to swear by all the saints that they were orphans and dying of hunger the beggars soon became a rogue having cast in prison became a member of the camorra if he was brave or his victim if he was a coward the mild and fertile climate of naples as well as that of palermo is a help to idleness and tempts the inhabitants to lounge in the streets and it furnishes the means of life at little expense as not let the need and duty of working be felt this is why associations of malefactors are more frequent in the principal cities especially in the south where the violent passions are more likely to provoke certain classes of crime the formation of societies of criminals plainly depends upon the character and conditions of the country thus we see the mafia and camorra spring up again after they have been broken up and all their members deported in eighteen sixty to sixty one a great number of camorras were deported from naples yet after a short period of depression the camorra was more active than ever and now dares to threaten the electoral councils the palladium of italy the mafia destroyed in palermo in eighteen sixty rose again in eighteen sixty six armed and powerful the camorra annihilated in eighteen seventy four by mordini was resuscitated in eighteen seventy seven under the regime of nicotera and if it not installed its members in the highest places in the city government it certainly has a tremendous influence in the elections in messina in 1866 the camorra was destroyed literally by the execution of its 29 leaders but the men who accomplished this feat having the reputation of being brave men made use of it to carry on the camorra themselves as actively as their predecessors or even more so sub chapter 100 poverty much has been said with regard to the effect of poverty the pictures which Filari has drawn of the condition of our people in the south are so horrible as to make us shudder. 
In Sicily, he writes, there is no other relation between peasant and landlord than that of oppressor and oppressed. If there comes a bad year, the peasant returns home from his labours empty-handed. If the year is a good one, then osuras take the place of hail, grasshoppers, storms and hurricanes. The peasants are a troop of barbarians in the heart of the island, and it is not so much against the government that they rise up, as against usury and oppression of which they are the victims. If they execrate every form of government, it is because they believe that all governments sustain their oppressors. That poverty, however, has not all the importance that Larry would like to attribute to it, though it certainly has a great deal, it is evident when one considers the facts more critically. Thus the district of Montreal, which is certainly one of the least poor in Sicily, is just that in which the Mafia recruits its worst members from among the well-to-do classes. Naples, too, where the Camorra rules, is certainly not in a worse condition than Calabria. Artina, whose criminality has been described above, is one of the richest districts in the province of Rome. Moreover, the Camorra draws more victims than true accomplices from among the poor of Naples. Subject 101. Hybrid Civilization Still worse than the lack of civilization as regards the encouragement of criminal societies is a mixture of civilization and barbarism, such as is found in certain parts of Italy and in a large portion of America, where we see peoples still half barbarous, subjected to a system borrowed from more civilized nations. While the advantages of both stages of society are lacking, the harmful features of both are present. Thus great cities, the increase of wealth, and food too delicate, increase vagrancy, rape and theft, and make the discovery of crime less easy. While the jury system, the respect for personal liberty, and the ease of getting pardons are frequently causes of impunity and crime. The system of elective officers, especially when, as in some states in America, is extended even to the judiciary, offers the criminal class a new instrument of power and lizard gain. We see associated crime extend its power to the press, to the election of legislators, and in America to the election of judges, thus gaining a double advantage, immediate gain and future immunity. Subject 102 Wars and insurrections. Political disturbances again, wars and uprisings, are factors to be taken into account in this connection. The gathering of crowds, great excitement, the ease of obtaining arms, and the relaxed vigilance of the government are all natural causes of the association of criminals. Bands so formed may become bold enough to make themselves real political factors. This is the explanation of the atrocities of Alcolia and of the Paris Commune out of the more recent events of similar nature in Mexico and New Orleans. These occurrences, which have become unusual in our day, in former times were very frequent. In the Middle Ages, the tyranny of the barons gave to brigandage the appearance of a kind of social institution, defending the vassals or avenging them upon their lords, who in their turn regarded robbery as a noble trade. So also in ancient times, the ten years which followed the restoration of Sulla were a golden age for the robbers and pirates of Italy. In 1793, in Paris, at the time of the free distribution of bread, so many vagabonds and criminals crowded in that strangers were warned not to go out at night, if they did not wish to be robbed. The thieves carried their boldness so far that they closed the highway with ropes. Charles de Rouge was chief of a band which plundered the large farms, presenting himself as a commissary of the Republic. During the Napoleonic Wars, there appeared in the invaded countries a band of robbers called the Army of the Moon. This sham army had its sham shoulders and sham officers, and plundered conquerors and conquered alike. In earlier times, there were similar bands who followed the Goths and Vandals into Italy. In modern Italy, when the Bourbons withdrew from Naples to Rome, brigandage raged in a Brazil, and when, under Murat, the trade of brigand became dangerous, the Bourbons landed the convicts of Sicily and Calabria. He who stole the most was best received by the king. Criminal acts, writes Colletta, lost in consequence their criminal character, and crime became a kind of trade carried on all over the kingdom. To the eyes of one who recognises the essentially immoral character of war, this breaking out of criminality is not surprising. Spencer, in his splendid study of ethics, has showed that the warlike peoples are always the most vicious. Subchapter 103. Leaders. At any given moment, in a country where criminal elements are plentiful, there rises a criminal who is a genius, or has great audacity, or an influential social position. 
we see criminal associations rise and multiply, so as it was to the great intelligence of their leaders at the bands of Lacanaire, Lombardo, Stratmatter, Hessel, Maynor, Motil, La Gala, and Tweed owe their origin along impunity. Cavalcanti was a robber chief of such genius that almost all his followers were fortunate than those of Alexander became themselves leaders of terrible bands, like Canossa, Egidion, etc. The band of assassins and incendiaries of Lompierre escaped all inquiry, because they were organized and protected by command, the mayor of the place, who by incendiary fires revenged himself upon his political opponents, or depreciated goods that he wanted to purchase. Subchapter 104. Prisons. But the principal cause of associated crime has been, and still is, the gathering together of criminals in prisons, not constructed on the cellular system. Almost all the criminal chiefs, Maino, Lombardo, La Gala, Lassenaire, Sulfard, Horduin, and others, have been men who have escaped from the galleys and have chosen their accomplices from among their companions, who had their given proofs of boldness and ferocity. It is in prison that the Camorra rose, and is there also that it first held sway. But when, under King Ferdinand in 1830, many convicts were set at liberty by the royal clemency, they carried over into free life the illicit gains and dissolute manners to which they had become accustomed. Only a few years ago, the Camorra chose its chief from among the prisoners in the Vicaria, and the free Camorrists made no important decision without first consulting these chiefs. In Palmo, the criminal got his professional education in prison, and novices without prison experience were admitted only into such enterprises as required a large number of persons. This will appear natural enough if we recall the words of the criminal of Palamo, quoted in the preceding chapter. Prison is a piece of good fortune that heaven sends us, because it teaches us fit places and companions for stealing. Subject 105. Influence of Race We have already spoken of the influence of race upon crime, the same thing is naturally true of association of criminals. The gypsies, like the Bedouins, may be called a race of associated malefactors. According to Mori, the Negro in the United States and in southern Italy, the Albanians, Greeks, and at times even in the native population, show the same tendency to associate a crime. St. Jordi said, in speaking of Sora, this beautiful country swarms with thieves. There are as many of them as there are inhabitants. This fact explains how brigands succeed in getting themselves elected as communal councillors. The inhabitants of Castlefort and of Spigno protect the thieves on condition that they practice their calling outside the district. The people in the neighbourhood of Palermo, among whom the mafiosi swarm, are descended from the bravios of the ancient barons, or, to trace their lineage still further back, from rapacious Arab conquerors, blood brothers of the Bedouins. I have noticed, writes D. Azeglio, speaking of the Romans, that in the ancient fiefs of the Middle Ages, Colonna, Orsini, Savello, there has remained in the population the imprint of that life of hatred, war, and division which was a normal yearly round in those unhappy countries. Nearly all the young men exemplify the true type of the Bravo. Subchapter 106. Heredity. These questions of race resolve themselves finally, as a matter of course, in the question of heredity. Among the modern brigands of southern Italy, there have been some who descended from the terrible Fra Tiavolo. Many among the famous Camorrasa brothers, and we know of the seven Mazzari brothers, the Manzi brothers, the Vaderelli, and the Legalis. In the United States, the younger brothers, who robbed banks in Minnesota in broad daylight, are weakly notorious. The band of Cusito and that of Nathan were composed of parents, brothers, and brothers-in-law. Here, too, the influence of hereditary tradition and education is out of the power of numbers. A family of criminals is a band already formed, which, from the fact of parentage, has a means of increasing and perpetuating itself in the children. In 1821, the communes of Raleigh and Rosiers were afflicted with deaths and homicides, showing on the part of the authors a great knowledge of the locality and uncommon boldness. Terror prevented the laying of information, but the criminals were finally discovered and were found to belong to one family. In 1832, the thefts were renewed, and the guilty persons were no other than the nephews of the first lot of criminals. 
In 1852 and the years immediately following assassinations occurred again in the same communes. The murderers proved to be the great nephews of the earlier offenders who had been active thirty years before. These facts explain to us why we see a constant recrudescence of crime in a given village. It is enough that a single one of these perverted families should survive in order to corrupt the whole district through the elective affinity there is between criminals. This justifies to a certain extent the barbarity of the ancients and of savages in punishing with the guilty their innocent relatives. Subchapter 107. Other Causes Criminals combine very often, from necessity also, in order to be able to resist an armed force, or to escape the search of the police by removing themselves from the scene of their crimes, though there is a tendency on the part of nearly all criminal bands to commit their misdeeds just around the circle of their own district. Again, the necessity of supplying a lack of certain qualities may lead to association. Thus, Le Canaire, who was a coward, joined himself to Avril, who was fierce and bloody, while Amaino and La Gala, who were courageous but ignorant, associated with them Ferraris and Davanzel, who were educated. Most criminals seek in others a courage they lack themselves. It may be added that for many of these people, a crime is a sort of pleasure expedition, which is not so enjoyable unless carried on in company. At times an association has an entirely accidental origin. Thus Tepes, just out of prison, started to rob a drunken man, when he heard himself called by Fortier, who wanted to share the booty. From this chance meeting spun the Tepes band, the most accidental circumstances, says Mayhew, such as the fact of living in the same neighbourhood street, or bearing the same name, or meeting when coming out of prison, etc., gives rise to the bands of petty thieves of London. Spegliardi tells us of the meeting places of the Gamins, and where bands of thieves have their origin in Lombardy. End of section 17section 23 of crime as causes and remedies by caesar lombroso this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information on a volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by leon harvey chapter 5 religion sub chapter 159 it is time to free ourselves from the atavistic tendency which has survived unnoticed even in the most scientific observer to regard religion as a universal panacea for crime. Let us recall how slowly we have been freed from the religious shell from which have come the first attempts not only at morals, but also at art and science, so that once no one could be painter, sculptor, poet, architect or physician without first being priest, Spencer. But at length art and science, those noble plants that grew up modestly in the shadows of the temple, are completely free from its influence, and there remains to the priest one who dominated every department of knowledge, a monopoly, not even of morals and charity, for many profess a charity and an ethics apart from religion, and from all sides there are rising ethical societies free from all rights. We cannot then find a religion, at least as it is understood in Latin countries, a remedy against crime. The true morality, we may say with certainty, is instinctive. The moral sense is like the feeling of pity. It does not already exist neither religious nor educative influence, nor any precept will be able to create it. Religion is a system of instruction by precepts, which have, like all our moral rules, an exterior sanction remote from reality and the daily life. And not only is it not able to fortify the character, but on the contrary, it can only enfeeble it, by minimising the personality by asceticism even to the point of annihilation. It is from religion that springs the monstrous phenomenon of men externally religious and respected for ecclesiastical and divine authority, and at the same time immoral in their social relations. But how is it, someone will ask, that religion shows itself at times as a useful moral force against crime? We reply that religion can have a beneficial influence only when, being in an essence state, it can transform itself into a violent passion. Delia furnishes us with a magnificent example of such a transformation. Delia lost her mother at an early age, and was carefully brought up in a convent. Seduced in the first place by a young lawyer, and then ravished by a priest, while under the influence of a narcotic, she abandoned herself to a life of prostitution and drunkenness. 
She was three times sent to correctional institutions, and finally released because she refused all food while imprisoned. She joined a band of thieves, of which she soon became the head because of her energy and muscular agility. She fought with the police and her own companions, so that she was arrested several times. She aided thieves in their exploits, but she would not permit the weak to be stuck in her presence, and would defend them at the risk of her own life. She was devoted to the sick, took care of them, and defended them against those who wanted to rob them. The police called her the Wanderer, but her companions called her the Bluebird, doubtless from the colour she preferred. A missionary, Mrs. Woodmore, on the 25th of May, 1891, went into the dives of Mulberry Bend, where she gathered these thieves together and tried to hold a religious service. But being excited by the arrest of two men by their band, they would not even let her sing. They would certainly have revenged themselves upon the missionaries, if these had not been protected by Delia, who afterward accompanied them into the Pim Dems on Mott Street, where the worst criminals in New York assemble. Upon leaving her, Mrs. Whatmore gave her a rose, which she made a half-mystical omen, begging her to be converted and to come to her with the flower. But the bluebird answered that, as for money, she found it quite natural to take it from any one who had it. As for the rest, she added, I have committed already all the sins that it is possible for me to commit, and I should not be able to live in any other way. She was then twenty-three years old. She promised, however, to come to one of the mission halls and kept a word. In the evening she went to return her enchanted rose, and confessed that she had passed a very troubled day, trying to drown her doubts in drink. But the more she drank, the more she became the mistress of herself. If the evening perceiving that the flower was withering, she became thoughtful, and recalled the days when she too was pure, like the rose. She saw the years falling away one by one, like the petals of the flower, and immediately her resolution was taken, and she told her companions that she was quitting them. The same evening, with tears in her eyes, she presented herself at the mission, where Mrs. Whitmore embraced her tenderly and asked her to pray with her. From that day she gave up drink, opium and tobacco, and asked to be allowed to see one of her old boon companions in prison in order to convert him. She was sent to the hospital very ill with consumption and syphilis. When, on coming out, she was invited to drink, she resisted the inclination. When she was cured, she set herself to work to convert her old companions of Marlborough Bend. She also addressed 1,500 convicts at Auburn. What have we gained, she said, by serving the devil, prison, misery, contempt, and disease. When I was at my worst and delighted in making others afraid of me, I was myself often afraid to not go to bed without a bright light burning beside me. In the morning I used to ask myself whether I would not lie in prison that night. I remember that when a lady once said to me, Have you found Jesus? I replied, No, is he lost? For I hated the Protestants. My religion was purely one of form. If you ask me how much time it took for me to give up my life of sin forever, I will answer you. About three minutes. The time it took to ask God to do it. In eleven months, she converted more than one hundred. She died of consumption within the year, but the stir that she made was so great that after her death, eighty of her companions became, or agreed to become, honest. I do not guarantee the conversion of the last, but that of Delia is certain. This is proved by the change in her face as shown by her photographs. It must be remembered that she was led to a life of prostitution and crime, not by precocious criminality, but by a rape committed while she was drugged. Further, even her criminal career, she was always a protectress of the weak. It is plain, then, that she was rather a criminaloid than a born criminal. Whoever that may be, the promptitude of her conversion, it was, she said, an affair of three minutes, under the influence of a suggestive impression, and further, the idol that she brought to it, both go to prove that, in this case, the religious passion in the nascent state stifles all the other passions. Similar cases may be adduced, like that related to me by the Baptists, of a drunken thief who was converted at a stroke by the sermons and example of the missionaries, and persevered in the right way. But these are absolutely individual and cannot be cited in favour of religion. They furnish no proof that religion as organised with us, among whom these fruitful fanaticisms do not flourish, as the efficiency in the cure of criminality. It is to be noted, moreover, 
that these miracles occur especially among the Anglo-Saxons and Swiss, we are forced to conclude that what is commonly attributed to the influence of religion is really due to race and to advanced civilization, which carries these people towards great ideas and noble fanaticisms, while with the development of cultures, the religious sentiment each day grows weaker. It is thus that we find proof of a noble zeal in the societies for ethical culture, and among the good Templars, which are ethical and anti-alcoholic rather than religious. In the Calvinistic countries, writes Ferrero, religion enrolls thousands of fanatics, who one of the most diverse names and theories are feverishly active, not in honour of a right, but nor to save the souls of men. In Italy, as in France, no one succeeds in bringing about a great flood of moral protest against the most serious social evils, and enthusiastic and active spirits must seek elsewhere for a field in which to employ their energy. Take the Salvation Army, for example. This institution was founded by Booth, out of the most eccentric exterior films, with a military hierarchy and bizarre uniforms, but with the holiest and soberest intentions. It is a sort of sect that has for its aim the prevention and combating of vice and crime, even with the strangest weapons. It contends against alcoholism with meetings, cheap temperance hotels, elevators, and people's kitchens, which last in 1895 distributed 3,396,078 meals. It fights vagrancy with dormitories, which give lodgings every night to more than 4,100 persons, where many persons are converted by evangelistic meetings. The Salvation Army puts within reach of the unfortunate everything they may be able to draw from evil ways. It enrolls them in employment agencies, which in the year 1895 alone found work for 19,372 persons, or receives them into its elevators, special establishments, where they are employed at paid work or taught a trade if they have none, and no situations can be found for them. Or they may be placed in the farm villages of the army, in which they may remain in relation for four years. For convicts, the Salvation Army has addresses in prison. It enrolls the more promising subjects as soldiers in the ranks, and emits another part of them into a special establishment, where it attempts to repair the defects of their moral and practical education, especially by teaching them a trade. From here they pass to the elevators, and then to the employer of private institutions, or to the farm villages, etc., the army owns, besides, 84 bureaus for the unfortunate, the office of which is to direct and personal effort to conquer vice. In a year they visit about 58,723 poor families in private houses, 15,702 persons in public houses, and 7,500 in lodging houses, giving assistance to at least 3,887 sick persons. The army also maintains special institutions for children who are sent as speedily as possible to the country. For women, the army maintains nine special dormitories and 13 rescue homes, which almost literally snatch women from public houses as one of the doubtful resorts. They give employment to 1,556 women, and after a certain time find places for them in private houses, or send them to their farms. It is remarkable to see how quiet a reception these new soldiers of charity meet with. Their houses, elevators, and farms are open, and anyone who wishes can go in or come out, and one who has left and comes back again is always received as a prodigal son and enjoys complete liberty. The principle of the work of the Wesleyans is not radically different. When Marcus, one of their leaders, had revealed the horrors of the condition of the poor of London, they threw themselves headlong into the work of converting the vicious and alcoholic. Hughes, one of their greatest apostles, said in a sermon, we must not be so wrapped up in saving the soul that we forget to save the body, and with the essence of the profoundest conviction he carried hundreds of persons with him, who professed themselves converted and confided themselves to his pastoral guidance. They chose the hours when men are most in danger, the social hours as they call them, between nine and eleven, invite them to evening gatherings, treat them well, and get them to sign the pledge. They visit the most infected places where their sisters discover and save the women who are in danger. One of them, one day, saw a young girl being led into a public house by a libertine. Accursing her, she said, Remember that you are a woman, and kissed her on the forehead. The girl, much moved, replied, 
I will never go into a public house again, but take us in every evening if you do not want us to fall into evil again. In the Protestant Association for the Practical Study of the Social Question, we find partisans of the idea or the participation of labour in the benefits of capital. Lord Shaftesbury, who transformed the condition of the miners in England, advocated also insurance against industrial accidents. The Order of Good Templars, founded in New York, 1862, and that of the Blue Cross, founded in Geneva in 1877, number respectively 500,000 and 10,000 members, who are required to abstain for a certain time from all alcoholic drinks, and succeed in doing it, or explains why it is that in Protestant countries, especially in Switzerland and England, alcoholism is decreasing while it is increasing in Catholic countries. Can we say that our Salesians and sisters have accomplished more? Far from it. To attain similar results, or even to strive after them, there is necessary a degree of ideality not to be found in the old races, who shut themselves up within their ritual observances and reach their highest development in a dictator, whether he be pope, general of an order, or saint. This is a fact which I have directly demonstrated by putting side by side the work of Don Bosco and that of Dr. Barnardo. In Italy we see crime effectively combated by rare individualities, but they are either dissenters or lazaretti, or at least have had for some time their centre of action outside the orbit of the official church, like Don Bosco and St. Francis of Assisi. In either case they constitute for the moment, at least, a new religion, palpitating with life, and in a little time would form a schism. If the prudent statesmanship of Rome did not take precautions to draw them once more within the circle of her influence. Hence it comes that saints like Don Bosco and Bartolo Longo do not rise without having obstacles elsewhere placed in their way by those very ecclesiastical authorities who ought to build altars to them. It's for the same reason that when they wish to raise themselves up to the level of the advanced ideas of our own time, they only half succeed. Instead of starting the children under their care in the more useful trades, on a large scale, by organising immigration parties, or clearing the land, as Dr. Bernardo did, they succeeded only in creating great monasteries, and in turning up priests and classical scholars for whom society has no place. They are saints, in short, of a time remote from our own, though his work, however vast it may be, is still necessarily short to the needs of the present, and rarely reaches the roots of crime. However admirable they may be for genius or sanctity, they must conform to the will of the higher authority, and show that they have more at heart the triumph of the rights of Rome than that of virtue. If not, they are suppressed. Thus it is that Don Bosco had for his final aim the creation of Salesian priests, just as the object sought by Bartolo Longo was the worship of Our Lady of Pompeii. Now even if, by giving to deserted children a trade, an education which was certainly moral, they prevented the occurrence of some accidental crimes, they could never, in this way, say their true criminaloid and criminal born. We may conclude, then, by saying that ritual and liturgical formula are much more in evidence in institutions of this kind than the rules necessary for practical life. On the other hand, in the Latin charities, the support of the public is almost never associated with that of the founder. It never manifests itself personally, and is consequently less interested and less efficacious. Since the power of these great apostles lies completely in their own personality, they have all the merit and all the responsibility, and when they leave the scene, they leave an empty place that cannot be filled. In the French awesome asylums, Jolly tells us, for a long time, only the religious interest of the children was thought of. They were put into a brotherhood without being given any trade. Rousseau also remarks that the church charities in France are all for young girls, so that neglected boys have no other refuge than the prisons and houses of correction. Moreover, the Catholic orphanages almost never receive illegitimate children, and unlike the Protestants, who try to throw as much light of publicity on their own organisations as possible, the Catholic institutions do all they can to escape it, and are never willing to report except to the bishop and to Rome. The pupils of the orphanages grow up without any knowledge of the world, and are consequently incapable of making a future for themselves. In conclusion, we may say that Anglo-Saxon charity differentiates itself from the Latin still more fundamentally through taking particular care to preserve the self-respect 
of its beneficiaries, by making use of their services, by making itself, in fact, cooperative and mutual, and it concerns itself especially with the very young, to whom Latin charity pays little attention, feeding them at most. Among the Anglo-Saxons we see religious groups like the Salvation Army and the Baptists proposing, as their great aim in life, redemption from crime, the prevention of alcoholism, and the care of infancy, and the influence of individual men like Booth and Barnardo, through their inspiration and genius, counts for much in the search for better methods, though not indispensable, for there is always a legion of fellow workers, who by their numbers and enthusiasm ensure the support of the public. Here, then, is no religion in general that deserves a credit, but certain religions only, or better still, the ideal tendency of certain progressive races. However, we must say of the operation of religion, as we have said of the charity, that it is always individual, limited, and less effective than the economic influence, which alone is universally felt by the masses. End of section 23「Chapter 24 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 8. Penal Institutions. Subchapter 185. Measures for the prevention of crime are unhappily, without race at least, a dream of the idealist. The legal world that rules us, and for which the defence and the punishment of the criminal are a source of honours and rewards, has something to do besides preventing crime and devising a substitute for the almost always useless and often positively harmful penalties. It is just for this reason that we must consider these penalties carefully, particularly the institution of the prison, which according to the common notion of our legal lights, is the only social defence against crime. Subchapter 186 Cellular Prisons Once we have decided to inflict a prison penalty, the individual cell seems clearly indicated. For if it does not reform the guilty, it prevents his seeking further into crime and removes, at least in part, the possibility of the formation of associations of evildoers by interfering with the formation of that kind of public opinion in the prison that compels the prisoner to add the vices of his companions to his own. The cell seems also to reach the highest degree of perfection for the purpose of judicial investigation, isolating the criminal whose guilt is still to be proved. In the same way, he is indispensable for the punishment of the delinquents still capable of correction, who have fallen for the first time, and from whom criminal contact and association would soon take away all sense of shame. It offers, then, real advantages without the risk of grave danger or to health, or at worst gives a somewhat greater opportunity for suicide. But the advantages of the cellular prisons are in a great measure neutralized by the great expense which makes their application on a large scale impossible. And even more objectionable is the fact that they favor inertia on the part of the prisoner and transforms him into an automaton, incapable of taking part in the struggle of life. In the actual organization of the prisons, says Gauthier, everything is combined to blot out the individual, to annihilate its thought and destroy its will. The uniformity of the system that pretends to fashion all its subjects upon the same model the calculated severity of a mosaic life where no room is left for the unforeseen, the prohibition of all intercourse with the outside world except through the banal monthly letter. Everything, in short, even to the miserable animal-like march in Indian file, is fit to turn the prisoner into an unconscious sort of maiden. We want to make useful citizens out of these prisoners, and we force them to wellness. We accustom them to find food and lodging assured without thought for the morrow or any other concern than that of obeying the order given. We force them to be like the dog at the spit, who had only to raise his foot and turn the drum like an unconscious machine. Is not this idea of the witless and the cowardly? It is Nirvana, the paradise of the Hindu. For many an honest man, the struggle for existence is not only sharper, but much less safe. When the first repugnance is overcome, Many, doubtless the majority, come imperceptibly to the point of preparing a prison future for themselves. Gauthier knew a prisoner, a former army officer, who held the post of paymaster in the prison of Clairvaux, and was serving his fourth or fifth term. Toward the end of 1883, being to his great displeasure, near the end of his sentence, he begged that his place should be saved for him until he was sentenced again. 
and we may remark that, save for a few honourable exceptions, for nearly all the directors of prisons, the ideal of a good prisoner is the recidivist, the veteran, the habitual criminal, whose prison experience and the docility he has acquired are guarantees of his orderly conduct. The unfortunate thing is that this good prisoner, according to the formula, under the regime, is not slow in becoming incapable of resisting his companions, criminals by birth or by profession. He has so little power of resisting unhealthy stimuli, the desire for unlawful gain, and the attraction of evil examples, that he is worse than the bad prisoner. The only ambition that remains to him is for crime and wickedness, the result of the special education which he and other convicts have given each other. It is not without reason that in criminal slain the prison is spoken of as the college. To these things must be added the tale-bearing, quarrelsome, lying, and all other special vices acquired or developed in prison. In the presence of the solitude and miserable formalism of the prison, writes Prins, the Belgian prison director, we must ask ourselves whether the man of the lower classes can be regenerated only through solitude and formalism. Voluntary isolation may elevate the mind of the poet. What effect can the solitude imposed upon the criminal have, but other to lower his moral level more and more? Do we teach a child to walk by putting difficulties in his way, or by filling him with fear, or by fall, and making him hang unto others? Shall we teach a man to take his place in society, by shutting him up in a solitary cell, in a situation as unlike the social life as possible, and by taking from him even the appearance of any moral exercise, by regulating from morning till night the smallest details of his daily movements and even thoughts. If it were a question of making good scholars, good workmen, or good soldiers, should we be willing to accept the method of prolonging cellular confinement? If this method is condemned, then, by the experience of ordinary life, it will not become useful the moment the court pronounces sentence. Other proofs of the evil effects of the prison may be found by consulting my palimpsestes de la prison. See, for example, these lines written by a prisoner. I am eighteen years old. Misfortune has made me guilty so old times, and each time I have been shut up in prison. But how have I been reformed in prison? And what have I learned? I have prevented myself in wickedness there. And this. To try to correct an idler and a thief by subjecting them to idleness is surely absurd. Poor prisoners. They are regarded as so many animals. They are kept sharp like so many white bears, under pretense of reforming them. In penal institutions, a man learns to society, but not to make an honest man out of a thief. They are the universities of thieves, where the old teach the young their trade. To enter this hotel, there is no need of money even to tip the servants. As for myself, I thank God I am happier than St. Peter, who in my soul I am served by lackeys. What a utopia! This is better than being in the country. And another. Friends do not try to escape from prison. Here we eat, drink, sleep, without the need of working. I have even found a cryptogram in which a friend was urged to commit a crime in order to get into prison again. For the two of us, the time will pass more quickly, and when we are in the galley, we can tell each other the story of our lives. The blank notorious thief said to Guzquet, the prefect of police, if we are arrested, we finish by living at the expense of others. We are clothed, fed and warmed, and all this at the cost of those we have despoiled. What is still more serious, there are a great number who find prison life a real source of pleasure. We may say that in place of the complete isolation from the external world, that theoretically belongs to cellular prisons. There exists manifold means of information and communication, all the more harmful, especially for judicial investigations, from the fact that they are unforeseen and unknown. The walls of a prison, writes Gauthier again, under the very eyes of the guards, offers a world of information and are marvellous instruments of correspondence. That's when I found myself at Cholon on the Seon, in the most secret cell, I learned of arrests that had been made in Lyons, Paris, and Vienne on my account, news which was of great importance to me. There is first a little cord stretched by the weight of a ball made of bread crumb, and so thrown from one window to another, while one holds onto the bars of the window. There are books in the library which circulate covered with cryptograms. Then the pipes for water and hot air make excellent speaking tubes. Another dodge which needs persons with some instruction, is that by knocking on the wall, 
it is not necessary that the persons communicating by this method should be in continuous cells. I once got valuable news in this way from a comrade forty or fifty metres off. Opposite. Nothing is secret in prison. A judge having asked a certain prisoner, the Aziz, how he communicated with his accomplices, the prisoner replied, To keep us from communicating, you would have to keep one of us in France and send the other to hell. But the aristocracy of crime, the rich or influential criminals, have no need of these expedients. The guards have nothing to lose by favouring their communication with the outside world, and the cellular system makes it easy to do this with impunity. For who can know what passes in a solitary cell? I have myself had direct evidence that facts are known in prison before they are published in the outside world. The removal of a procurator general was announced to me in prison several days before it took place, and when no one, not even the official himself, knew of it. By studying the wall inscriptions and documents of the prisons in the great cellular prison on Turin, I have become convinced that, while it is supposed that association and above all comradeship are prevented by the cell system, in reality the espirit de corpse is strengthened where before it hardly existed. I found in the writings of the prisoners how one of them affectionately salutes his successors, another leaves a crayon for his comrades that they may be able to write. A third advises comrades equally unknown to feign insanity in order to escape sentence. I have seen how the walls of the exercise yard, continually re-whitewashed, formed a kind of daily newspaper, carried on also in summer on the sand and the dirty windows, and in winter on the snow and in the books that the convicts are permitted to read. In studying the wall inscriptions, I have found that out of 1,182 had reference to comrades. 900 were simple salutations, 45 contained news of trials, and 27 were encouragements to commit further crime. There is in the prisons a bureau connected with the administration department, called the matriculation office, in which there are always some prisoners kept, since here all examined and observed when they enter and when they leave. This office is a centre for imparting news, from which it is disseminated throughout the cells by the prisoners. Would it be believed that, even upon audience days, there are to be found collected in this antechamber a dozen or more convicts? Thus, at the very moment of judicial investigation, almost under the eyes of the judge, and for the very prisoner who is being examined, this system that has cost society so much is made futile. I have not spoken of workshops. In the cellular prisons, the efforts to burn a communication allow very little work to be done. From this, there results, beside the injury to the state and to the prisoner who is kept in idleness, a still graver danger for the future. The active prisoners become accustomed to idleness. If they do not die of it, while well, the lazy ones are just in their element. Consequently, when they go out, they commit new crimes in order to return. But if work is allowed, it is impossible even if those are excluded, who have fellow prisoners, to prevent new relationships from being formed with the foremen of the free workshops, the contractors, etc. The consequence of this is that the investigations which are kept secret from the public are no secret at all from the accused person himself. The object of the cellular isolation rights, prisons, is to regenerate the guilty by checking the evil influence of fellow prisoners, in order that only the beneficent influence of respectable men may be operative. But see the real facts. Everywhere the guards who are supposed to represent the good elements of society to the convict are men devout of duty, but they are recruited from the very sphere of society to which the convicts themselves belong. Sometimes they are de classes, without employment, who for a ridiculously small salary, insufficient for the maintenance of a family, have to live very much as the prisoners do. Too few in numbers, scarcely one to twenty-five or thirty prisoners, are naturally able to do little more than cast a glance into the cell or at the work and see that the rules are observed. It is to these empty formalities and to the top hasty visit of an official or a chaplain that those charged with transforming or many the guilty come to limit their efforts. We see from this how necessary it is to change our ideas about prisons. Subchapter 187 the graded system. Everyone will understand why penologists, having only this mournful expedient of a prison, have tried to improve it as much as possible. It is a result of such efforts that the Irish system has won so much applause. The system is as follows. 
The criminal passes the first period in solitary confinement, not exceeding nine months, which may be reduced to eight. During this period, he has only a vegetable diet, poor clothing, and a monotonous task of oakum picking. In the second grade, there is a collective work, rigidly watched, which is divided into four classes, each more privileged and advantageous than the one below, into which the convict passes successfully after having obtained by his work and good conduct a certain number of merit marks. In the first class, the door of the cell remains open during the day. The work is not regularly paid for, but may perhaps be rewarded with a penny. After having received 54 merit marks, the prisoner passes successfully into the other classes, where he receives greater and greater compensation, and also instruction, and finds himself more in contact with the public, and so on. This grade having been passed through, there commences for the convicts the grade of almost complete independence, intermediate prison, with work in the field. They wear their own clothing, receive wages, may be allowed to absent themselves, and are in continual contact with the outside world. From the conclusion of this grant to the end of their sentence, they have provisional liberty under the surveillance of the police, who, in case they go wrong, send them back to prison. Before they go out, they are registered, photographed, and warned of the first slip will bring them back to prison. When they first reach their destination, they must report to the police, and monthly thereafter. The police look after them and help them get work. This is a magnificent means of getting these rude and lazy beings into the notion of being virtuous, or at least of working. The criminal can, in this way, cut down his sentence and the state his expense by a sixth or even a third, and as every misdemeanor remains being reduced to a lower grade, the most dreaded of penalties, all other punishments become unnecessary in the intermediate grades. The results obtained in Ireland by this reform were satisfactory, at least in appearance. Since 1854, when the system was introduced, there has been a remarkable reduction in crimes. The following are the figures. A table is displayed on the page, with three columns for year, entered during the year, and total convicts. We may add that this reform unites economy, which upon depends the possibility of applying any system with the demands of criminal psychology by permitting a gradual passage to complete liberty. It thus makes of the criminal's perpetual dream of freedom a means of discipline and reformation. It offers besides a means of overcoming the prejudice of the public against the liberated convicts and inspires the convicts themselves of confidence. In Denmark, the convicts remain in their cells night and day, and work there for their own advantage. The incorrigible prisoners and the recidivists, after six years, live in common in a special prison. They have no other reward for their good conduct than the freedom of working in the fields near the prison. Those who are young and can still be reformed, or those who are convicted for the first time from minor offence, with a sentence of from three to six months at the most, remain in a special cellular prison. They are divided according to their conduct in different grades. In the first, from three to six months, there is absolute seclusion, instruction in the cell, work without pay, and only writing on the slate aloud. In the second grade, six months, they receive two shillings a day for their work, are taught in school but separated from others, can have paper on holidays and books every fortnight, may purchase with half their pay a mirror and an almanac, may write letters and receive visits every two months. In the third grade, which is twelve months at least, they receive three shillings a day, have books on paper every week, are allowed to buy many useful things and send money to their families, receive visits every six weeks, and may have the portraits of their families. In the fourth grade, they get four shillings a day, and besides other advantages, which are more and more considered to them. They can go out of their cells, work in the open air, and have flowers and birds. Their sentence may be reduced for good conduct, a sentence of eight months to six, of three years to one, and of six years to three and one half. Thus they pass from absolute solitude to solitude at night only, from absolute silence to work in the field, in almost complete liberty. Hardly 10% remain in their cells more than two years. Let us hail these institutions as a great step in advance, but let us not be under any illusion about them. There are other things to be remembered. In Ireland, statistics are affected by emigration, for liberated convicts not finding work went to America where they peopled the penitentiaries. Moreover, even with this system, there are many recidivists in Denmark and still more in England, where, as it appears, the paroled convicts easily change their residence and notwithstanding the law, go to places where they are unknown. There they do not act directly, but make use of the services of other criminals. According to Davies, 
chaplain of Newgate, one sheriff of cases of prisoners released with ticket of leave, convicted a second time, again released on ticket of leave, and convicted a third time, all before the original sentence had expired. One of these, who was 36 years old, had been sentenced to a term of more than 40 years and was free. This is why the number of paroled prisoners in England, which rose to 2,892 in 1854, fell to 922 in 1857, to 912 in 1858, and 252 in 1859, and did not rise above 1,400 in 1861, 62, 63. In Germany also, the number of those conditionally liberated fell from 3,141. The figure for 1871 to 733 in 1872 and 421 in 1874. This lack of success is to be attributed to the imprudence with which released convicts are allowed to change their residence and to the practice of turning over to them their entire savings. Also the fact that many employers, more selfish than the philanthropists, seek only their own immediate profit from the convicts and do not further concern themselves with their conduct and find to a lack of active, continual surveillance where a large number of individuals are concerned. Together with gradations of punishments, it is well to apply what I have called individualization of punishment, which consists of applying special methods of repression and occupation adapted to each individual, as a physician does in prescribing dietary rules and special remedies according to the temperament of each patient. Here is the secret of the success attained in Saxony, Sikau, where there are special prisons for the old and for the young, for heavy penalties and for light ones, and where according to the merits of each prisoner, his food, his clothes, and the severity of his penalty are changed. But these measures can be carried out only for criminaloids, in small prisons with very able directors. Otherwise, a prize of liberty will fall to the worst criminals, who make the best prisoners, being the most hypercritical. For these reasons, such reforms cannot be left to be administered by a short-sighted bureaucracy. Besides these institutions, it is necessary to seek to develop right feeling in the convicts. We must remember that virtue is not to be created artificially, and the best results are to be obtained by basing it upon the interests and passions of men. A man may lose his life, but he cannot be stripped of his passions, and all men, even the most depraved, need an interest and an aim to guide them in life. They may be insensible to threats, to fear, and even to physical suffering, but they never are insensible to vanity to the need of distinguishing themselves, and above all, to the hope of liberty. This is why sermons and lessons of abstract morality are useless. We have to use the convict's vanity as a lever to interest them in the good by granting them material advantages, such as a gradual diminution of their penalty. Good results may be obtained by instituting a kind of declaration and merit and demerit marks. The prisoners must be permitted to pass according to merit into the privileged classes, where they can, for example, wear ordinary clothing and a beard, ornament their cells with flowers and pictures, receive visits, work for themselves and their family, and finally, catch a glimpse of the much-desired perspective of temporary liberty. To gain liberty is a dream and constant thought of prisoners, and when they see a way open before them, more safe and certain than that of a surreptitious escape, they will take it at once. They will do right, it is true, only to obtain their liberty, and for its own sake. But as movements repeated at home are second nature, so we may hope that they will form the habit of right conduct. This is why the right of pardon should be abolished, since it makes prisoners hope for liberty by the favour of someone else. It is necessary, says Despin rightly, to elevate the criminal in his own eyes, by making him understand that he can reconquer the respect of the world, who must fill his soul with the need of becoming honest by utilising the same passions which would make him still more depraved if left to himself. Despine, Clam, de Metz, Montesinos and Brockway have counted so much upon the influence of honour among the criminals that they have left them almost free upon their parole doing their work, and fierce men whom twenty guards could scarcely restrain never even thought of escaping. Ferris tells of a thief who was converted by his sister in prison who, with this end in view, trusted him with the care of the wardrobe. A convicted carpenter was unbearable because of his extreme violence. The oversight of the convicts was given to him, and he became the most docile of all. A prisoner of Sattel, wearied by his labour, threw his mattock at the feet of the director. Albert Ree, the latter, without saying a word, 
took up the tool and to work in the other's place. The unfortunate man, struck by this noble lesson of practical morality, took up his work and did not offend again. These examples show us clearly how we must set about to reform these men. We must act upon them by example more than by word, by morality in action, more than by theoretical teaching. Strict discipline is incontestably necessary then, the more so since light punishments, having but a slight effect, have to be repeated more often and for this reason are less efficacious than severe punishments that are rare, but to great severity is certainly more harmful than useful. Severity bends, but does not reform them, and it makes them hypocrites. Adult criminals ought to be considered as children, as moral invalids, who must be cared for at once with mildness and with severity, but more of the first than of the second, because the spirit of vengeance, the excitability which is the basis of their character, makes them consider even the lightest punishment as a persecution. It is for this reason that too strict to silence is detrimental to morals. An old prisoner said to Despain, when you shut your eyes to our breaches of discipline, we talk more, but we did not offend against morality. Now we speak less, but we blaspheme and conspire. In Denmark, when the greatest severity prevailed in the prisons, there were 30% of misdemeanors. Now, with the Mulder regime, there are only 6%. Despite used an excellent method by not inflicting punishment until some time after the offense, in order not to appear to yield to a fit passion. The guilty prisoner was led to a mediation cell. The director went in only after an hour to tell him the penalty which the rule required. Often the whole group to which the guilty person belongs was blamed and punished. This is a method used by Ottermayer with great success. Work ought to be the first care and the highest aim of every penal institution. In order to waken the energy of the prisoner and give him the habit of productive labour necessary after his liberation, it is, further, an instrument of penitentiary discipline, and also a means of identifying the state for the expense incurred. But this last consideration is only secondary, and should not be made the principal end, for many lucrative occupations cannot be used to advantage. We ought, for reasons being mentioned, to avoid the trades of locksmith, photographer, penman, etc., which prepare the way for other crimes. We should prefer, on the contrary, farm work, which shows a minimum of criminality in our statistics and gives an easy means of placing the discharged convicts. We may also use straw and wicker work, rope making, typography, pottery making, stone cutting, etc., and we should admit only, as a last resort, occupations like bookbinding and cabinet making, which require the use of tools and might become dangerous. In every way, the work ought to be proportioned to the forces and instincts of the convict, who, if he has accomplished as much as he is capable of, although that may be little, or to receive a portion of reward, if not in money, at least in the shortening of his sentence. For this reason I believe that it is necessary to eliminate the contractor from the prison system, since he seeks naturally to favour the most skilful, and nevertheless in certain countries, even has control of the pardoning of the prisoners. We must try to give criminals a love for work by making it a reward for good conduct, and a relief from the boredom of prison. It is not best, then, to impose it upon them, they must be brought by means of a silly detention, none or less prolonged, to want it and ask for it. Crofton. If we want to make the work profitable and to establish the spirit of comradeship and emulation, which is one of the principal foundations of the reform of the prisoner, it is well, over the first period has been gone through, to mitigate the severity of the cellular system by allowing the prisoners to work together in small groups, according to the necessities of their occupation. The work must not, however, be made a pretext for too many privileges, granting either generally or individually. Maresco attributes much recidivism to the privileges given to certain clerks in prison. He would one day of these say to a newcomer, You fool, with little scribbling you are better off in here than outside. Words would recall those of the Sicilian prisoner to the judge, part one, chapter seventeen, and explain the fact known by many prison directors that the worst rogues are the most docile in the prisons and appearance the most repentant. Subchapter 188. Wages and Savings. A further means of moral reform has been suggested by de Metz and Oliver Krona to prevent the recidivism of free criminals. They advise that the money earned in prison, which is generally turned over to the prisoners when discharged, and often becomes their capital for criminal enterprises, should be deposited as a guarantee of their good behaviour 
and as a forced means of saving. It could be lodged with the government of the municipality to which they go, or with the employer, and the interest alone paid to them. In Belgium and Holland, seven-tenths of the wages of those condemned to compulsory labour is retained, six-tenths in the case of those sentenced to solitary confinement, and five-tenths in the case of those in the simple prisons. The rest are divided into two parts, of which one may be used in prison, and the other on going out. In England, the money is handed over to the released prisoner with his ticket, if it does not exceed five pounds. When it exceeds his amount, it is paid in installments upon certificate of good conduct. Subchapter 189. Homes, etc. for released convicts. Many advise also homes for the reception and employment of released prisoners, but aside from the fact that they cannot be applied upon a scale corresponding with the need, experience has shown to those who study these institutions in the world and not in books that they have no value in the case of adults, but on the contrary, very often increase the tendency to wildness and a rendezvous for criminal associations. Out of a hundred liberated convicts, twenty to forty years of age, received in the patronage of Milan, writes Spagliardi, only the youngest, and even few of those, responded all to the immense efforts made for their restoration. The tendency to idleness and libertinage increased by the privations they had undergone, and the fact that they could come and go at pleasure decided them, after two or three months, to leave the asylum, the more so they did not see in the director the man who was sacrificing himself for their good. He was to them only an enemy, and almost a tyrant. Hence there was a silent war against him carried on by insults, insubordination, violence, and threats. This is why the statistics of these institutions are so limited and so deceptive. In France, out of 16,000 convicts released from prison, 363 were assisted. In England, 40 exercise extended aid to 12,000. In general, it is considered unwise to establish institutions for more than temporary help or to give help in money. Instead, food and lodging should be given for future work, and society should dismiss those who are lazy and also keep informed of the conduct of the persons whom they recommend to positions. For this purpose, a special agent is necessary. Maxime Ducamp also recognises the uselessness of assistance rendered to born or habitual criminals while well, it may be very useful with accidental criminals. Among the criminals, he rightly says, there are those who become drunk on a glass of water, cashiers who make errors in figures, clerks who become confused about prices and end by committing irregularities which appear dishonest and bring them before the courts, where they become still more confused and are convicted. These once liberated will not fall again to guilt if they find an employment suited to their limited intelligence. For these, I admit, assistance is necessary. Further, there are occasional criminals who, having been tempted by some opportunity for pleasure, have stumbled the first time and robbed their employer. Such persons, if they not assist when they come out of prison, will look upon society only as an enemy, and one who was filled with remorse at having stolen twenty francs comes not to be dismayed at burglary and murder. Subchapter 190. Deportation. There is in Europe a party which see in deportation the only remedy against crime it has been asserted that a great part of the flourishing american colonies and ancient rome itself owed their origin to a kind of penal immigration this is an historical error for rome it is enough to recall the immortal pages of virgil and as for america we must remember that if the third expedition of columbus was made up of malefactors among whom however we reckoned many heretics and adventurers in the first and second only men of honour took part. Under James II, deportation was forbidden. And on the other hand, many of the colonies of North America owe their origin to very respectable men, like the Quakers of Penn and Fox. From the influence of transported convicts in Australia and Victoria, South Australia and New Zealand must be altogether excluded. And if New South Wales and Tasmania owe their origin to transportation, it is a great error to suppose that they owe their prosperity to it. This is so true that the great philanthropists, Howard and Bentham, protested against transportation almost immediately, and shortly afterward, the colonists themselves did the same, so that in 1828 its abolition was voted by Parliament. The prosperity of Australia is due to its fertile meadows and the trade in wool, which has brought in crowds of free men. The wealth of Melbourne and Sydney began just when the transportation of convicts ceased. In New South Wales, the population increased 
only at the rate of 2,000 persons a year from 1810 to 1830, when transportation was at its height. While from 1839 to 1848, the exportation of wool increased from 7 to 23 million pounds, and the population from 114,000 to 220,000, although transportation had ceased in 1840. While it lasted, brigandage raged on a large scale. The convicts did not work, and those who were employed in the construction of roads had been watched by guards and soldiers who treated them worse than beasts, chased them with dogs, chained and flogged them. Those who had been set free sold the land the government had given them for the purpose of starting them at honest work, and joined their accomplices in new crimes. We need not be astonished that the mortality of this part of the population reached 40%, or that of the free population was hardly 5%. If the criminality in England was 1 to 150 inhabitants in New South Wales, it was 1 to 104, and in Van Diemen's Land, 1 to 48. Finally, while the crimes of violence in England were to other crimes as 1 to 8, in New South Wales they reached 50%. In 1805 to 06, with the average deportation of 360 prisoners a year, there were 2,649 convicts in England, and in 1853 to 56, with an average of 4,108 deportations, there were 15,048 convictions. These facts show what sort of advantages are to be looked for from deportation, without counting the enormous expense and the crimes which criminals sometimes commit in order to be deported. In 1852, in fact, there were 3,000 criminals in France who asked to be deported, and, what is worse, some of them committed new crimes to attain their end. While in England the expense of supporting a delinquent is £10, this expense rises in the colonies to £26, £35 and £40. In Guyana there is supposed to be a profit of £1,511 with deportation, but dividing this by the number of days of work it has reduced to 54 centimes a head in 1865 and to 48 centimes in 1866, and there are 5% of escapes and 40% of deaths recorded. Each criminal costs 1,100 francs a year, three times as much as a convict in prison, and the transportation cost reaches 400 francs. By the French law of May 30, 1874, the deported convicts were to be employed at the hardest labour of the colony, while efforts were to be made to reform them. They were given the means of living honestly, sometimes an honest man does not always get. A savings bank subsidised by the government started for them, Lands of the best quality, often cleared, were given them, which became their own after five years. While working the land, they have a right to food, clothing, agriculture implements and hospital care. In the case of married persons, the wife has the same rights, besides 150 francs at the time of marriage, and complete furnishing. It is not only the environment that is changed, for everything that would occasion a relapse in a crime is carefully removed. But we know that while a change of surroundings may reform the occasional criminal, it has no effect upon real-born criminals, who make up the greater part of the deported convicts. In fact, according to official reports, and the officials have an interest in concealing the truth, we see crime breaking out again in plain daylight, so that honest men, and the very officials themselves, who send to the government their garbled reports, are often the victims of these pretended sheep returned to the fold. Thomas, an impartial foreigner, thus describes the situation from his own experience. It is impossible to imagine the degree of infamy to which they have come. In 1884, one of the criminals tried to cut his wife's throat after having been married to her for 48 hours. Surprised at the time, he afterwards fled to the natives, who shot him. But the savages themselves are often the victims of these miserable men. Impunity and indulgence have given rise to real anarchy, to a veritable hell upon earth. According to Melcolon, criminals who had been condemned to death at least three times were finally set at liberty. A deported convict thus described to Laurent one of the marriages which the governor, M. Pardon, his official capacity, 1891, has mentioned with so much admiration. I was present on the Isle of Now at a curious ceremony, the marriage of two of my fellow prisoners. The bridegroom was a man sentenced to five years at hard labour for a murder. To choose his wife, he had gone to the convent of Boreo and selected an old prostitute, sentenced to eight years at hard labour, for giving aid in robbing and murdering a man in his own house. 
The marriage took place. After the mass, the priest spoke to the newly married couple of pardon, redemption, and the forgetting of injuries. But the wife kept repeating in her argot, Ah, how he wearies me. After mass, a very wet banquet took place. The witness drank so much that while he slept, he was robbed of his pocketbook. The husband also became so intoxicated that the next morning he awoke without his pocketbook, with a black eye, and without news of his wife, who was absent until the next morning with another convict. He took it in good part, however, and even found it natural. Although married, this woman became the concubine of freed convicts and of the prisoners themselves. One day she lured an Arab, whom she knew to be rich, into a secluded spot, while her husband robbed him and then killed him with a hatchet. But the wife, horrified, denounced the murderer, and he was condemned to death, thus ending this happy match. In the monograph, Travaux for says Fin de Ciesle, we are told of a certain de Villepoix, condemned to hard labour for life for two rapes upon minors followed by two homicides, who married, as his second wife, an infanticide. Some time afterward, he set fire to the house of his neighbours without reason, and also burned a plantation. He prostituted his wife to the first comer in order to live more comfortably. He was condemned to death. In 1881, the Minister of Marine complained that of 7,000 persons, without counting freed convicts, only 360 could be employed upon the construction of the roads. All the others were wandering about at random, entirely unrestrained, normally taking up land or working for private individuals. Thus, there was no more discipline or prison. In 1880, there were only 640 to 700 escapes. In 1889, Easter reached the constant figure of 800. The notorious bandit, Brodel, who had escaped several times, killed an old woman and devoured a portion of her flesh. Under the knife of the guillotine, he mocked at the law, and with a loud voice gave himself the signal for the knife to fall. Besides, who could restrain these depraved individuals, when they perceived that the person, the scarecrow of the criminal codes, was nothing but a jest? The council war loses its time, with sentencing and resentencing convicts already condemned to life imprisonment. Additional sentences have been given of 10, 20, 100, and 200 years in prison. In Nomia, there are individuals who have been condemned to death three times and afterwards pardoned and left at liberty for the rest of their lives. In 1891, the Maritime Tribunal of Nomia condemned to death a convict named Jamakal, who in consequence of sentences incurred in the colony would not have been freed before the year 2036, that is, in 145 years. A woman named Mace, sent to New Caledonia after having killed her two children, married, got a land grant, and killed another child. An old potter of Boreo, who had been sentenced for the rape of an older daughter, was rejoined by his wife, his victim, and by another younger daughter. He drove the older to the lowest prostitution, prepared the younger for the same mode of life, and went on with his flourishing pottery trade. The effects of such colonial organization are evident. A quarter of a century has already elapsed since the arrival of the first convoy of convicts in New Caledonia, yet there are still no roads there. Nomia has neither sewers, embankments, nor docks. In a short time all the land will be the hands of incendiaries and murderers. We can see from this how much confidence ought to be placed in reports of inspectors who maintain that the holders of the land grants are true farmers, some of whom might with perfect safety be pardoned and set at liberty. A report of the facts scrupulously in order, that they may serve to counterbalance the assertion that has constantly been made. Change the environment, and the criminal disappears. Now here everything has changed. Race, climate conditions, all the causes of crime are removed. And in spite of everything, the born criminal continues his series of crimes, while the honest man pays his expenses. What better proof could we have of the supremacy of organic connection over environment? These facts show further a long series of deceptions on the part of bureaucrats, who represent the most deplorable measures as excellent. In fact, M. Pardon, the governor of New Caledonia, in his report for 1891, praised the system in us there, and stated that he had employed 1,200 convicts upon the roads and placed 630 in agricultural labour with the farmers, declaring that they were watched by the guards without any danger. The holders of land grants had increased to 123. The penalties were respected, and did not even arouse feelings of revolt, while industry prospered. The truth, he should have added, is that aside from the enormous expenses for the support of the criminals, not less than 900 francs a head, it fails to take into account the great proportion of the criminals who commit their crimes, only to get themselves sent to this Eden. In order to understand the economic harm done by penal colonies, 
it is necessary to note that the delinquents who are not peasants are more than half of the criminals deported. Now, it is not at 25 or 30 years of age that one learns a new trade. Moreover, the sluggishness, the repugnance to work, which is one of the characteristics of the born criminal, is something which we can hardly hope to see bettered in a hotter climate, itself an incentive to crime, nor in the neighbourhood of savage populations, whose tendencies are so nearly allied to those of the born criminal. It is then natural that recidivism should increase instead of diminish, for we know that this is the rule, not the exception with the born criminal. It is advantageous to sentence to deportation, therefore, to only occasional criminals and criminals by passion. Subchapter 191. Surveillance. All those of us who know anything of delinquents and of the police know that surveillance occupies a large part of the time of the officers of public safety, and this with the expense of more than four millions without any real advantage, for the crimes are in great part committed by the persons who are being watched. But the surveillance itself is a cause of new crimes, and it certainly is a cause of the distress of delinquents. For by denouncing them to respectable people through their personal visits, the police prevent their getting or keeping employment. Crime, as Ortolan has truly said, leads to surveillance, and this prevents those who are watched from finding work, a circle that is even more fatal when they are sent to a residence far from their native country. The penalty of surveillance, says Frigidaire, has accomplished nothing since his introduction. It offers no guarantee, and it holds at the promise of a security that does not exist. Add to this the enormous number of arrests, the loss of the government on account of the expense of imprisonment, the arbitrary arrest for forgetting to salute an officer, for addressing a suspect, or for being out a few minutes after hours, which reduces these unfortunates to the position of slaves in the hands of the police. Curcio. Enemies, says Machiavelli, must be conciliated or exterminated. By surveillance we do neither the one nor the other. We only irritate them, and as to this or little more than this, that all our institutions for the repression of crime amount in the end. End of section 26section 27 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Cesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on the volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 9. Absurdities and Contradictions in Criminal Procedure. Subchapter 192. Our methods and expedients in criminal procedure are no better than we have seen our penal institutions to be. Decisions in criminal cases are nothing more than a game of chance, where nothing is certain but the publicity which leads to new crimes. Subchapter 193. The Jury. The lack of uniformity in the verdicts brought in by juries in different years and different countries shows the inefficiency of the institution. Thus, Cagliari reckons that there are 50% of acquittals, while Upper Italy shows but 23%. Venice shows a difference of 9% to 15% as you pass from the small towns to the large ones. The cultivated classes, says Tiani, are never represented on the jury. And in fact, numerous cases prove to us only too clearly, the complete ignorance of jurymen. Thus, in a vote with regard to a homicide, a ballot was found on which was written yes or no. It was counted in favour of the prisoner. When the juror was asked why he had written so strange a vote, he answered, because the ballot had printed on it, the juror must answer yes or no. There is no guarantee of the incorruptibility of the jurymen, who, having no account to render and nothing to lose by an acquittal, often levies tribute upon justice, as is proved by numerous acquittals secured by bribery, even after the criminal has confessed. More than this, the jury of itself is a case of popular corruption. Borghetti notes that many respectable peasants are corrupted by serving on the jury, and he adds, It is the area where the mafia achieves its triumphs. Moreover, the injustice towards the poor that springs from that corruption is a great cause of immorality. For the poor accused person seeing that justice quite other than equal for all, believes himself almost justified in indemnifying himself at the expense of a society which has condemned him, and regards his sentence as unjust, even when it is not. In answer to those who maintain that juries are a guarantee of free government, we may recall that the history of England shows us how often juries change their opinion according to the will of the government. 
But besides, what has this argument to do with cases that are not political? Furthermore, in those cases where the government remains quite indifferent, public opinion to which the most respectable juries are involuntarily subservient is often easily misled by criminals and their defenders. And where will you find a greater tyranny than that of ignorance? The jury writes, Pironti, often acquits the man who steals the public money for the purpose of protesting against the government, or perhaps acquits a criminal because he was a brave soldier. I will add that this excessive mildness in dealing with criminals leads them to new crimes, and we may understand why in a brawl a comrade of the aggressor said to him, Kill him and you will have a jury trial. If you merely wound him, you will go to the police magistrate. Where a matter must above all be decided on its merits without any reference to feeling, it is not the direct opposite of justice to leave it to be decided by popular instinct, by the feeling that happens to predominate in the crowd at the moment. And what can be done about the errors of the jury, springing often from cases that is impossible to foresee, as in the Galetti case in Bresica, where a blot of ink upon the yes of a juryman caused the acquittal of a man who ought to have been condemned to death. It is vain to urge in support of the jury the necessity of modernising the process of justice, as well as other institutions. The jury existed already, through a rudimentary form at the time of the Twelve Tables and the Germanic Gericht. It is just as modern as cremation, the retended innovation of the modern suedo hygienists which was already ancient in the time of Homer, and quite as commendable in practice. Have we not done everything to bind upon magistrates the duty of justifying, giving the reasons of their decisions, and of not giving them in the form of oracles? This notwithstanding the guarantees offered by their past, by their special studies, by their experience, by the fact that appeal may be taken from their decisions. And then we think we have discovered a new source of liberty and justice in permitting men without experience, without responsibility, to sentence by a simple yes or no, like children and despots, without giving any reason for their acts. And in Italy we aggravate the evil by decreeing that this irresponsible sentence shall be revocable when it is in favour of the criminal, and least subject to appeal when it is against him. Every magistrate must justify the condemnation or acquittal which he pronounces for libel, theft or assault. But when it is a question of robbery or murder, the popular magistracy gives its decision without any other guarantee or reason than a yes or no. Worse than that, the juror may still more easily let the criminal go unpunished by casting a blank ballot, which, even if the law does not interpret it as a definite expression, in the conscience of an ignorant juryman who is inclined to make mental reservations, it is always a compromise between truth and injustice. If even these precautions prescribed by law to prevent the inconveniences of the jury system were only observed, one of the most important assuredly is that the jury shall communicate with no one until they have pronounced their verdict. They take an oath to observe this obligation, but in reality, as all the world knows, they do not keep it and communicate, even publicly with the counsel for the defence. Why, on the other hand, should the right of exclusion without cause be given to the defendant who challenges the better jurors? Just those who, by their honourable character and their intelligence, will be most capable of resisting seduction and rhetoric. How can we believe that no man could follow a trial like that at Ancona, in which 147 witnesses were interrogated and 5,000 questions laid before the jury? Furthermore, how shall those who have nothing to lose by quitting resist threats of death? even when responsible judges allow themselves to be intimidated. And finally, if tried judges, if an assembly of experts can in certain crimes highly disentangle the truth, which can only be understood through a knowledge of toxicology, surgery and psychiatry, how can it be done by individuals who are not only not specialists, but are quite ignorant of any science whatever? And this at a time when division of labour is required in things much less important than justice, are we not abandoning to chance something that ought to be conducted according to the strictest rules? Objection is made, it is true, that the average number of acquittals in jury trials is no larger than those cases decided by the judge. This objection is far from being exact, for the average in some regions is twice as great. Even if it were true, there is a great difference between the two cases. Before a case is brought to trial before a jury, it is already being submitted to a long series of tests and judgments such as those of the praetor, the examining judge, the royal procurator, the section of acquisition, the president of the court, the procurator general experts, etc. 
After all these, it is difficult for any proof of the innocence of the accused person to arise, for there is not so much in regard to number as to quality that the acquittals are at fault. They show a deplorable generosity toward murderers, homicides, and those guilty of insurrection, and also by an unfortunate perversion toward forgers and persons who steal public money, a fact which is certainly one of the causes of the constant increase of crimes of this kind. The objection that in England and America the jury system works well has no weight. In the Anglo-Saxon race, the feeling for justice and duty does not fall as often as it does with us. Further, they do not try by jury those who have confessed their guilt, while with us these cases, which will amount to half the total number, give rise to the greatest scandals. Then there is a smaller number of criminals tried by jury in England, one to 132,770 inhabitants, or in Italy there is one for each 8,931, an enormous difference not sufficiently accounted for by our greater criminality. In England, moreover, in many cases such as insurrections, bankruptcies, etc., there are special juries, and the habeas corpus does not forbid, as some imagine, preventive arrest by the police, but gives the accused a right to secure within 24 hours the intervention of the magistracy, High Court of London or the County Court, to decide whether his detention should be contained or revoked. In all difficult cases, the coroner calls about him a veritable jury of specialists, physicians, or chemists. The jurors, moreover, take oath to conform to the instructions of the judge with regard to the law and keep the oath scrupulously, thanks to their respect for the law. Public opinion in England, moreover, would revolt against the previous verdict in which the instructions of the judge on points of law were disregarded. Besides, this if the verdict appears unjust, the judge can suspend the execution of it, at least until it has been sanctioned by his colleagues. We may add that the jury cannot leave the courthouse until the verdict has been rendered, a measure that prevents many bad influences. But even in England, the jury system is not without his objectors. As early as the time of Elizabeth, they used against the jury the words heard by Cicero against corrupt magistrates. Quas fames magis quam fama cum and in 1824, the Westminster Review, attacked the jury system violently, and went so as a court, the phantom of justice. Subchapter 194. Appeal. Injustice makes judgment bitter, wrote Bacon. Delay turns us sour. As much may be said in our day when, thanks to appeals, the penalty is no longer either prompt, certain, or severe, and whereas the judgment of the trial court is preceded by a regular, complete argument, that of the appellate court is based merely upon a written statement of the cause, often very irregularly and incompletely drawn up. This fatal edifice is crowned by the most ample right to reverse the decisions of the lower court, not based as would be just. Just as is the practice in America, England and even France, upon substantial errors and errors of fact, but almost always upon matters of form, on account of which a very costly judgment may be reversed for a simple mistake in grammar made by an unfortunate clerk. Subchapter 195. Pardon. As if the right of appeal were not enough, we have also the right of pardon so profusely employed in Italy that pardons are here a hundred times as numerous as they are in France. Now, how can we reconcile this clemency with the rarity of cases of moral reform? Who is not aware that criminals liberated after having passed through the graduated prison system, which is much more of a test than simple imprisonment, still give very poor results? How can we say that justice is equal for that it is destined to bring the disturbed juridicial condition to equilibrium, and that it is based upon fixed, immutable laws, free from all personal influence, when all that is needed to blot out the whole thing is a simple stroke of the pen, the signature of a man who may be the best man in the country, but is after all only a man. The system of pardons is founded upon a supposition that the right to punish exists only in the will of the ruler, but we use it to mitigate justice when it is too severe, answers Frederick. Very well, if that is so, you have not true justice, and you ought to change its methods, says Filangieri. Every pardon granted to a criminal is a derogation of the law, for if the pardon is just, the law is bad, and if the law is just, the pardon is an attack upon the law. By the first hypothesis, law should be abolished, and by the second, pardons. We may add, as a last consideration, that pardons are contrary to the spirit of equality and animates modern society, for when it favours the rich, as is too often the case, 
it makes a poor suspect that there is no justice for them. Rousseau's words in this connection may be remembered. Frequent pardons announce that crimes will soon have no further need of them, and everyone knows whither that leads. Subchapter 196 Criminological Prejudices It is still worse that there should be installed into judicial practice a series of prejudices which make every judgment useless. We deplore, for example, the principle that when there is a doubt as to the intent of the criminal, he must be presumed to have had the less evil intent, and when we cannot prove two of the crimes he was aiming at, we must always presume that it was the less serious. Now it is that contrary of this that is the case with born criminals. The law, then, by following an hypothesis that is the direct opposite of the fact, endangers the safety of society. But it is still worse when the law is more lenient with attempted crimes, when denies the intention, even when the criminal has betrayed it by his threats and by his steps which he has taken to put it into execution. Thus, one who administers a substance that he believes to be poisonous, when it is not, is guilty from the point of view of common sense, which does not stop for the magic formulas of the old jurists, for he is dangerous as if he had administered a real poison, the more so, since we know the pertinacity with which prisoners repeat their crimes on a large scale. To take the opposite position is virtually and insist on seeing the victim quite dead before taking steps to protect him. This is to rob ourselves, through love of abstract theories, of a practical and concrete means of protection. So much the more since we know the tendency of the born criminal to divulge his own crimes before committing them. Further, it is absurd that our laws should be moulded towards recidivists who do not fall again into the same crimes. They are no less dangerous on that account, but quite the contrary. The English statistics show that those who have committed crimes against persons upon relapsing commit more especially crimes against property in order to escape justice. The criminal who always relapses into the same crimes is almost always a semi-imbecile, perhaps less dangerous. For such, the increase of the penalty is less urgent, while the man, who at short intervals commits several kinds of crimes, shows greater intelligence and greater versatility in crime. Since were Lacanaire, Gasparoni, Disruis, and Holmes, who knew how to combine theft, swindling, and poison with forgery and assassination, men of this sort are the most dangerous and the hardest to recognize and arrest. Again, the importance that is assigned to public trials is an error. The public trial is almost always only a useless and often dangerous repetition of the recorded results of the preliminary investigation, for the witnesses simply repeat their depositions, which are already on the record. Now, it is difficult for the memory not to become confused before an imposing tribunal, where the crowd is annoying and the lawyers ask captions, or even threatening questions, while it is much easier to recollect and recount a fact exactly in a small room for two or three persons only. The same may be said of the arguments of prosecution defence, and this with the more reason, because the written argument, which is an immense advance on the spoken one, is permanent, and the memory for words is much weaker than that for things. According to the experiments of Munstenberg and Bigam, the average in areas of memory is greater for the auditory series, 31.6%, than is for the visual series, 20.5%. The vaunted oral trial is, then, absolutely contrary to modern progress, however much it may be regarded as one of the pillars of justice. Finally, when we cannot clearly prove that a person accused is a recidivist, or even when his crime has been committed in youth, we should at least take account where all his evil antecedents in order to class him among suspects. What we want to arrive at is the degree of fear with which the individual must be inspired to keep him from doing harm. And the legislator does not believe that anthropological and psychological characteristics may be of service to him in solving the question, he ought at least to reject the demonstrated criminological facts. Subchapter 197. Erroneous Theories There are many jurists who are deeply versed in scientific matters and the current of the scientific movement with regard to the criminal who have not been able to gouge at depth accurately for want of physiological ideas or of direct contact. These men have maintained that the great numbers of insane and feeble minded to be found among criminals, and consequently the limited responsibility of many criminals for their crimes, lead inevitably to the reduction of the penalty. They do not understand that the new anthropological notions, while diminishing the guilt of the born criminal, impose upon us at the same time the duty of prolonging his sentence, 
because the more irresponsible criminals are, the more they are to be dreaded, since their innate and atomistic criminal tendencies can be neutralized only by selection and sequestration. These tendencies are like a swelling wave, which is turned back upon itself when it encounters a strong die, but which sweeps on and becomes threatening if nothing checks it. Our jurors have not limited the Dutch, but have thought that they could check the evil by lowering the dogs more and more, hence the increasing tendency to give every opportunity of defence to the criminal and to facilitate pardons, while nothing is done to increase the security of society and the certainty of the repression of crime. Now, if a general relying upon the power of philosophy allowed himself to be guided solely by that, or by an abstract strategy founded upon the history of ancient battles, without regard to modern ballistics, it is not certain that he would conduct his unfortunate soldiers to an inevitable death. Now, a penal justice requires at least as much practical knowledge as does military strategy. Metaphysics in this matter can only be a negative resource, yet the practical results must often depend upon the opinion of persons, venerable indeed, but inclined to substitute metaphysics for strategy, who dream with open eyes of free will independent of matter, and of a right to punish based not upon pressing social necessity, but upon abstract violations of jury disorder. Not only do they not think of eliminating the true causes of crime, such as alcoholism, associations of children, etc., but by introducing precipitately all the innovations that the civilized world has contrived in favor of the criminal. They forget the precautions necessary to mitigate the evil consequences of these intermediate institutions for conditional liberation, etc., and they forget finally the new means devised for the defense of society. It is also to be deplored that the high priests of justice regard the form procedure of more importance than the protection of society, so that it has passed into a proverb that the forms more than the substance of the procedure are a supreme guarantee for both parties, and that form dat esri, four words that are the greatest proof of human blindness in judicial matters. Subchapter 198. Cause of this state of things. The cause of this fatal retrogression toward theory is to be sought, first of all, in that law of inertia and exaggerated conservatism by means which a man, when he has been drawn along by extraordinary circumstances or by bold and fortunate rebels, turns back with terror from every change, however simple and logical, and even in some cases men submit to the change, notwithstanding their repugnance, is because the time is so ripe and the innovation so apt that they are carried along in spite of themselves and forced to accept it. But here is in religion and philosophy, the truth is hidden by formulas, whose mystic and opposing appearance prevents the discovery of their insubstantial character. Whoever, with uplifted religious feelings, hears for the first time rabbis or brahmins reciting mysteriously their Hebrew or Sanskrit prayers, attaches to them a profound significance, whereas if translated into the vulgar tongue, they would appear quite simple. In the same way, the public does not understand the legal vocabulary, and finds the jurist the more profound the less it understands him. Often jurists do the same, and think more of themselves, the more they entangle themselves in their hieroglyphics. We understand from this why it is that the public cannot take juries seriously when they affirm, for example, that to authorise another person to commit a crime is not to be guilty of an overt act, or that when a convict's second offence is different from the first, he is not a recidivist. Ferrero finds another cause for these errors. In indo-emotional activity, in intensity of the human mind to reduce a minimum the number of mental associations necessary for any work whatever. In practice, then, the little interpretation of the law prevails over all considerations of justice. This is the case with the bureaucracy of great governments. We know that the most common voice of this class of functionaries is the habit of applying literally the rules and laws given for their guidance. For well, these can be but the imperfect indications of the will of the lawmakers, who, not being able to foresee everything, can only lay down general rules. The official ought to interpret these general rules according to the particular case, but instead, the letter of the rule becomes standard truth and even reason itself. The employee of a private establishment with an eye to his own interests does not let himself so easily fall into the habit of carrying out a general rule without reflection, but interprets the directions he receives according to the circumstances of the case. Now, what happens to codified laws which are supposed to serve merely to guide the magistrate in particular cases is they become just to him even when applied to the letter. To decide conscientiously, the judge ought to make himself a personal criterion for the special case that he has under his eyes, and judge it according to the general spirit 
that emanates from the written law. The Roman jurisconsults also recognised that the civil law needed to be supplanted by what they called the natural law, which was nothing else than the expression of that feeling of justice that revolts against the application of general rules to particular cases to which they are not adapted. But all this requires an intense intellectual effort, a fatiguing labour accompanied by a tormenting sense of responsibility. It is much easier and more convenient to apply the general directions of the law by deducing their logical consequences. As soon as the mind has become accustomed to this way of working, a professional ideo-emotional stagnation is produced, which leads the judge to consider the literal application of the law as his whole duty. He soon comes to exclude every collateral idea that might lead to an equitable solution of the question. The amount of injuries suffered by the victim and the causes which brought about the crime are not in any way taken into account. These considerations help us understand why the sciences all began with a deductive method. Even the physical sciences, which formed the nature of their subject, would naturally hold themselves closer to nature, started with deduction. Primitive physics and chemistry, for example, considered of a series of deductions drawn by force of logic from a principle established by the observation of facts at random. It was only later that men came to realise the fact that to learn the laws of nature it is necessary to reason less and to observe more. In the beginning, pure logic was preferred to observation and experience, because it was a less fatiguing psychological process, accepting the presence of a smaller number of intellectual elements in the mind. The employment of pure logic is, then, the effect of an audio emotional inactivity prior to the period of infancy, which appears in the period of old age by the well-known law of degeneracy and atavism. What is the science of the Middle Ages but an invasion of Greek subtlety into the field which the thought of antiquity properly submitted to the method of observation. Just so the absolutism of the deductive method in modern judicial sense is a sign of decrepitude. The law of audio emotional inactivity explains to us why so often the law of rude and barbarous peoples is distinguished by a certain sound common sense as compared with the marvelously logical but marvelously absurd subtleties of the law of the most civilized peoples. End of section 27. Section 29 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 2. Penalties According to Criminal Anthropology. Fines, Probation System, Insane Asylums, Institutions for the Incorrigible, Capital Punishment. Subchapter 210. Of all the criticisms raised by punishment, the most important is surely that which concerns its application, especially since the fruitful labours of Ferry, Garofalo, Van Amel, Fiazzi, and Sigio have not only corrected what there was irrational about the repression, but have brought into harmony with our juridical ideas. Now, when once it has been demonstrated that the penalty is not equivalent of compensation to offend society, or a sort of excommunication inflicted by lay priests with more thought of the crime than of the criminal, we see that punishment must change its character. We must have in view the welfare of society more than the punishment of the criminal, and the criminal and his victim more than the crime. The fear inspired by a man who suddenly commits a murder for a question of honour, or for a political idea, is very different from the fear we have of a man who puts a climax on a life of crime with an assassination for the purpose of theft or rape. In the first case, the punishment is almost useless, the crime itself being so grave a punishment that it is certain the offender will never repeat it. In the second case, every delay and every mitigation of the penalty is a peril of honest men. Thus, in case of assault, it is absurd to establish, as it goes to, a great differentiation according to the seriousness and duration of the effects especially since antiseptic methods now hasten the cure. For the murderer does not measure his blows, and it is only purely by chance if they are not mortal. On the contrary, in crimes of this kind we must observe carefully to see whether the guilty person is a respectable man, and whether he had serious provocation. If this is the case, he belongs in the category of criminals of passion, while the crime has a slight motive, or has been premeditated with accomplices, and the person in question are habitual criminals, the slightest assault, the unsuccessful attempt, 
or to be punished as a serious crime, in order to prevent fatal relapses into crime. In this case, we ought to take no account of the quarrel of the two parties, who are not at all interested in what happened to others, for the state has the general welfare to care for. It is impossible, says Ferry, very rightly, to separate the crime from the criminal, as it is impossible in drawing up penal code to suppose an average criminal type, which in reality one never meets in any case. Now what does the judge do? Before him is a pair of scales. In one of the pans he puts the crime, in the other the penalty. He hesitates, then diminishes one size and adds to the other, expecting thus to measure the social adaptability of the criminal. But having once pronounced the sentence, the judge does not concern himself to know whether the person condemned falls again into the same crime. What does he know of the application of the penalty, and of the effect that it has upon the criminal to be deprived of his liberty? Further, when a criminal is sentenced to twenty years, but reformed in ten, why keep him there for ten years longer, when another, term it will be useful to remain in prison longer, is liberated at the end of five years? Crime is like sickness. The remedy should be fitted to the disease. It is the task of the criminal anthropologist to determine in what measure it should be applied. Or what should we say of a physician who stopped at the door of a hospital ward, should say to the patients brought him in, Pneumonia, syrup of rhubarb for 15 days, typhus, syrup of rhubarb for a month, and then, at the end of the time named, turn them out of doors, killed or not. In order to avoid these faults, the penalty should be indeterminate, and should be subdivided according to the principle of Cicero. A natural hominis descender est natura juris. We must make a difference according to whether we have under our eyes a born criminal, an occasional criminal, or a criminal by passion. In the case of every criminal, in whose case the crime itself and the personal conditions show that repatriation of the damage is not a sufficient social sanction, the judge should give sentence of imprisonment for an indeterminate crime in a criminal asylum, or in the institutions, agricultural colonies or prisons, for occasional criminals, adults or minors. The carrying out of the sentence should be regarded as a logical, natural continuation of the work of the judge, as a function of practical protection on the part of special organs. The Commission for Carrying Out Penal Sentences should include expert criminal anthropologists representing the judge, the defence and the prosecution. These men, together with administrative officers, would stand, not for neglecting and for getting the prisoner as soon as sentence is pronounced, as happens now, but for a humanitarian work which would be efficacious for the protection now of society against the liberation of dangerous criminals, now of the individual against the execution of a sentence which, in his case, has been proved to be excessive. It is apparent, then, that continual liberation is bound up with the principle of the indeterminate sentence. Subchapter 211. Penalties Other Than Imprisonment we are as much as possible to avoid the short and repeated sentences to prison, which, as we have seen, is a score of crime, and especially of associated crime, the most dangerous of all. They prevent any cure, and render impossible any continuous effort, and they give the criminal a sort of distinction, for there are many prisoners who mark on their caps the number of their sentences. We might say, writes Crone, that most countries have adopted the principle of sending to prison as many men as possible, as often as possible, and for as short a period as possible. He might have added that they do this in a way to make the prison do as little good as possible and as much harm as possible. I have seen in prison eleven children arrested under the very grave charge of being a band of malefactors for having stolen a herring, and four others who had stolen a bunch of grapes. At the same time, three ministers in the legislative chamber were defending a thief who had stolen twenty millions. According to Jolly, there have almost always been in France as many as three million men who have passed at least 24 hours in prison. Each year, more than 100,000 individuals step in to keep up or raise this formidable number by taking the place of those who die. Berenger reckons that the isolation, and we may add, the imprisonment, of half the persons sentenced might be dispensed with. Of 300,000 persons convicted, 57,000 were for violation of police ordinances, etc. 7,000 or 8,000 prison for debt, 5,500 foreigners expelled from the country, and 13,000 or 14,000 awaiting transfer, and 12,000 serving sentences of less than six days. The short sentences, almost always served in company with habitual criminals, 
can have no intimidating effect, especially with the ridiculously short sentences of one and three days possible under the penal codes of Holland and Italy. The effects, on the contrary, are disastrous, since they make it impossible for justice to be taken seriously. By taking away all fear from the minds of the person convicted, they drive them irresistibly to new offences on account of the dishonour already incurred. Accordingly, other repressive measures must be substituted for imprisonment for minor offences, such as confinement at home, security for good behaviour, judicial admission, fines, forced labour without imprisonment, local exile, corporal punishment, and conditional sentence. Let us look into these new means. Subchapter 212 Corporal Punishment, Confinement at Home Corporal punishment for minor offences would be an excellent substitute for imprisonment if applied in a matter in harmony with our civilization. Fasting, the douche, and hard labour would be incontestably very efficacious, and at the same time less costly and easier to apply in varying degrees. In England, whipping has been reintroduced, and according to Tissot, with success. Now this useful would be the confinement of the guilty person in his own home, a measure already employed in the army. Subject to 213. Fines. After corporal punishment, the penalty which is most easily adjusted and most efficacious, provided is guaranteed by bond, is a fine. Applied in proportion to the wealth of the culprit, it will contribute to diminish the enormous judicial expenses while striking the criminal rich, who escape punishment most easily on their most valuable side, the side from which they are most often impelled toward evil. Bonfield de Marsagny truly remarks that a fine is the most liberal, the most divisible, and the most economical, the most completely remissible punishment, and therefore the most efficacious. The more we advance, he says, the more value money has in this sense, since the number of pleasures it can buy becomes illimitable. Further, the number of those who use money for pleasure increases also, so the more we advance, the more useful the fine becomes. Fines ought always to be employed for the punishment of those guilty of minor offences, thus diminishing greatly the number of imprisonments. According to the Code of Criminal Procedure in Holland, proceedings against a person guilty of a misdemeanor are not begun if the offender on being called is willing to pay the maximum fine. The case goes on only in the event of refusal to pay. For offences for which the penalty would be not more than a month's imprisonment, this function could be exercised by the Chamber of Advice, which could stop the proceedings upon the payment of a fine by the defendant. Those who refused to pay would be sentenced to labour, and if they refused to submit to this, they would have to serve a prison sentence made as severe as was consistent with health and life. As for the objection that the fine is difficult to proportion, it is not deserved to be taken seriously, for while a rich man does not care as little for one day in prison as a vagrant does, a fine of 10,000 francs from him would be the equivalent of a few francs from a poor man. Subchapter 214, Indemnity A fine permits also the indemnifying of the victim, and in this way we strike at the root of crime, so much the more since the greatest number of criminals from cupidity are drawn from the professional and other well-to-do classes. The penal judges themselves should be obliged to fix the amount of damages to be paid in order to avoid the delay and discomfort of a new trial in the civil court, and the public prosecutor, by virtue of his office, should call for the fixing of damages in cases where, whether through ignorance or fear, the victims take no action. Bonville de Marsagny proposes to grant the victim a special lien upon the property of the convicted person. The indemnity should be collected by the state along with the expense of the trial, and if necessary, a part of the returns of the prisoner's labour should be retained in favour of the victim. Subchapter 215. Reprimand and Security the judicial reprimand as substitute for punishment in the case of minor offences is already admitted in the codes of Italy, Russia, Spain and Portugal. Also in the canton of Vaud and the Roman law which prescribed. Monit lex sanctiquem ponet. However, if admonition can be efficacious in cases of the pranks of the young, brawls and insults, it is not serious enough for the offences of criminal lords without security, which is really a suspended fine. The magistrate obliges the culprit to deposit a sum of money which shall guarantee society against his relapse. The deposit is made for a definite time, but which is restored to him if his conduct has been 
irreprehensible. This practice is allowed in the United States and in Denmark, and it is certain that the obligation to deposit a sum of money and the fear of losing it in case of relapse are much more effective in preventing writing of violence than a few days in prison. The security for good conduct is no less useful when a magistrate in place of inflicting punishment demands of the defendant a guarantee that he will not disturb the peace of another, or that he will maintain good conduct, or abstain from certain definite acts. He warns him that in case of a new offence he will be subjected to more serious penalty than would have been inflicted for the first transgression. This measure has been adopted into the Spanish Code, and in England it has been in operation from early times under the form of reconnaissances to keep the peace, and of good behaviour demanded by the justice of the peace from bad characters, or from a person who has threatened another, always upon the demand of the person threatened, supported by evidence. The same method has been authorised since 1861 as an accessory penalty in convictions for crime. Subchapter 216. Probation System, Conditional Sentence. The best preventative institution for minor or occasional criminals is probation system, widely used in the United States, especially for young criminals. A young criminal, not a recidivist, is not put into prison, but receives an admonition from the judge who warns him that the first relapse he will be sentenced, and he is placed under the surveillance of a special officer of the state. If this officer finds that, in his family, he is not receiving a proper education or sufficient oversight, he is put into a special home for neglected children. If he commits a fresh offence, he is again brought before the court and is sent to a reform school. This system has given such excellent results in Massachusetts that the idea was suggested for extending it to adult criminals. A law of 1878 instituted a special official, the probation officer. This officer is supposed to inform himself with regard to all persons convicted of misdemeanors by the courts of Boston and to determine, by the aid of the information received, whether the offenders are capable of being reformed without the need of the infliction of a penalty. He is present at the trials of all those for whom repressive measures do not seem to be necessary. After having made known the results of his investigations, of which the principal aim is to discover whether there has been a previous conviction, he asks that the culprit be released on probation. If the court consents to this, the culprit is put on probation for a period which may vary from two months to twelve under conditions imposed by the court. The probation officer formally undertakes to see that the conditions are carried out and has the right at any time during the period of probation to arrest the culprit for any case whatsoever and to bring him before the court again or to have him undergo a sentence which had been suspended. When the term of probation has expired, the probation officer asks that the sentence be annulled, but in certain cases he may ask that the time first fixed be prolonged. The number of persons released on probation in the city of Boston, guilty of drunkenness, receiving stolen goods, petit larceny, and assault and battery, reached 2,803 during the period from 1879 to 1883. Of these, 223 did not conduct themselves properly during the term of their probation, were brought to court again and had to undergo the penalty. 44 took flight and could not be apprehended. In 1888, of 244 persons put upon probation, 230 appeared to be reformed. Many of these promises, without doubt, have not been kept, but on the whole the desired effect seems really to have been attained. The officer declared that nearly 95% of the persons under his charge the previous year had maintained good conduct and had been released. Only 13, recognised as incorrigible, had had to undergo punishment. The experiment has been so successful that the law of Eighteenetti extended the application of it to the whole state of Massachusetts. An analogous system was put into operation in England by the Probation of First Offenders Act of 1887. But while in America, the concurrence and cooperation of the probation officer guaranteed the good conduct of the culprit, in England the pledge of the offender himself is required, or at least the concurrence of a bondsman whose assistance will be the most efficacious, since he is stimulated by the thought that a fresh offence will forfeit the bond. Further, the English law demands special grounds for release on probation and let his magistrate to fix the time without the intervention of any special officer. According to a letter of Colonel Howard published by Professor von Litz, the number of persons continually released between 1887 and 1897 reached 20,000, with 9% of recidivisms. In Belgium, this institution, introduced by law in 1888, bore immediate fruit. 
the Minister of Justice reported to the Chamber in 1891 that of 449,070 persons convicted, 27,564 were conditionally released, and only 2% relapsed into crime. These persons admitted to probation had been convicted for damage to property, blackmail, fraud, breach of trust, defamation of character, seduction of minors, marriage, brokerage, indecent exposure, thefts, alteration, unintentional injuries, and probation of lost objects, mendicity, vagabondage, the carrying and sale of forbidden weapons, unintentional homicides, kidnapping, attempted rape, arson, and fraudulent bankruptcy. The crimes handled in this fashion, then, were mostly those that are committed by occasional offenders, and only a few, such as born criminals, commit. In France also this new institution has been tried since the passage of the Beringo Law in 1891. M. Dumas, Director of Penal Affairs, reported in 1893 upon the first nine months' experience with the law. The correctional tribunals have pronounced 11,768 conditional sentences, of which 7,362 were for imprisonment and 4,406 were fines. This is out of a total of 162,582, of which 97... 1,245 were prison sentences, and 15,337 were fines. Hence, the sentences suspended represented 7.5% of the prison sentences and 6.7% of the fines. In New Zealand and Australia, in the first period of two years, according to the report of the Minister of Justice, the results of the experiment were excellent. Of 121 persons submitted to probation, 58 had conducted themselves properly. Nine did not fulfil the obligations imposed, and when had taken flight, and fifty-three were still in a state of probation at the end of the second year. From the 1st of October, 1886, to the 31st of December, 1888, in New Zealand, according to the report of Captain Hume, sentence was suspended and replaced by a probation for 203 persons, of whom 70% appeared to be reformed and 5% were arrested again. Subchapter 217. The Reformatory at Elmira. Another method of applying the principle of which we have been speaking is found in the Elmira Reformatory, which was created by Brockway under the inspiration of my Homer Criminal, as he himself says, and of which Winter, Way, and Ellis have given good descriptions. To this establishment are regularly sent only young men between 16 and 30 years of age, guilty for the first time of a minor offence. The law grants unlimited authority to the board of directors who may set the prisoners at liberty at any time before the expiration of the sentence. The liberation is to be based upon a strong conviction that the culprit is reformed. The only formality which accompanies it is the word of honour that he gives the superintendent. However, though the board can shorten the sentence for the better prisoners, it cannot lengthen it for the others. Brockway concentrates all his efforts upon gaining a knowledge of the young criminal, of his psychological conditions, of the environment in which he has lived, and of the causes which have contributed to debase him. From these he deduces the means to bring about his reformation. He sets himself to develop the criminal's muscular system by douches, massage, gymnastics, and by a proper dietary, and to strengthen his will by making him take part in procuring his own liberation. Immediately upon arriving at the prison, the prisoner takes a bath, is enclosed in the uniform of the prison, is photographed, examined, and vaccinated. For two days he is shut up in his cell to meditate upon his crime and to prepare himself for reformation. The third day he is brought before the superintendent, who places him, according to his tendencies in schooling, in a school or industrial class, and he is made to understand his duties and the conditions upon which he may regain his liberty. He is instructed in a trade, more than 75% of the prisoners know none, which shall permit him to earn his living after his liberation. This is the first care of the management. The young prisoners are divided into three classes, the good, the medium, and the bad or least corrigible. Each prisoner is marked monthly according to conduct, work, and progress in school, with a maximum of three for each, and to pass to the highest class he must obtain the maximum of nine marks each month for six months. Promotion to the first class carries with it certain advantages, especially with regard to correspondence, such as receiving visits, having books, and eating at a common table instead of in a separate cell. Finally, the better prisoners are permitted to take walks together in the field, and responsible tasks are given to them, 
such as superintendents of the other prisoners. But just as they may win a place in the first class, so by negligence or bad conduct they may fall out of it. In this case they are put back into the third class and must submit to harder work in order to regain their position. Brockway, taking account of the aptitude and physical strength of each prisoner, fixed at the beginning of each month the amount of work that he must accomplish in order to obtain the maximum number of good marks. Each week there is published in the reformatory the summary, a paper conducted exclusively by the prisoners themselves. It contains a review of the political events of the week taken from the better American newspapers. In addition, there are items with regard to the life of the institution itself, lectures that have been held, promotions and degradations, and the liberation of prisoners. I have been receiving this paper for a year and find that no justice or Italy or France is so rich in news and especially in information as regards criminality. All the work of the institution, even to the superintendents and guarding, is done by the prisoners themselves, so the expenses are reduced to a minimum. At the same time, the work of the prisoners is chosen with a view to fitting them for life in society and not to making the institution pay a profit. The prisoners in first class are intentionally exposed to various kinds of temptations. After six months, Brockway proposes to the board that they be given conditional liberty. The board has a right to refuse permission, but as a matter of fact, always authorises the liberation when Brockway considers it advisable. The release takes place, however, only after permanent employment has been found for the prisoner. After being liberated, he must give account of himself regularly for the first six months at least, and receive complete liberty only at the end of a year of good conduct. This is then the probation system perfected. No one is a warmer partisan than I myself of this reform, which is the first practical application of my studies. I believe firmly that the individual and physical study of each criminal, with practical individualized instruction, can but have excellent results when applied to criminaloids. In these it will increase especially the habit of working. But for born criminals, this method does not seem to me equally efficacious. When I see that 49% of the inmates of the Elmira Reformatory are completely lacking in moral sensibility, that 12% have left home before they were 14 years old, that 37% come from drunken or epileptic parents, and that 56% show no signs of repentance. I do not believe that they can be reformed by hot and cold baths, great activity, and a sound education. I feel this the more since the promising children are there in limited numbers and are mingled with the adults. In fact, if we examine the detailed statistics of 1,722 prisoners set at liberty after remaining at Elmira for an average of 20 months, we find that 156 are settled in the other states, 10 are dead, 128 have not yet finished the term of their probation, 185 cannot be liberated until the expiration of their full sentence, 271 have been given partial liberty after having completed six months probation satisfactorily, 47% were arrested for other offences during the time of their probation, 126 did not furnish the reports required and disappeared, 79 have had to be returned to the reformatory, 25 returned voluntarily, having lost their employment, leaving out the 10 who died. We have 533 who were not reformed. This is, say, 31%, a proportion closely approaching that which I have given for born criminals. Moreover, the supervision of the individuals under probation is so superficial that if we count as recidivists those who have been lost sight of, we shall approach much more nearly to the reality than if we presume that they are reformed as Brockway does. But notwithstanding these defects, this system, together with the agricultural colony system, is the best possible substitute for the prison. Subchapter 218. Asylums for the Criminal Insane. There is another institution which we believe destined to promote harmony between humanitarian impulses and the safety of society, namely asylums for the criminal insane. We might argue indefinitely upon the abstract theory of punishment, but the whole world is agreed upon one point, that among real or supposed criminals, there are many who are insane. For these, prison is an injustice and liberty a danger to which in Italy we have opposed only half measures, such as violate both morality and the social safety. The English who have arrived at reforms by the practice of true liberty 
have been trying for a century to fill up this most dangerous gap in the social structure, and have in large measure succeeded through the institution of asylums for the criminal insane. Beginning with 1786, dangerous lunatics were confined in a special ward in Beltlam, of which they could not be released except by the authority of the Lord Chancellor. In 1844, this measure appeared to be insufficient, and the state resolved to confine 235 of the criminal insane in the private institution of Fisherton House. But the number of these unfortunates increased continually, and special institutions were finally erected at Dundrum in Ireland in 1850, at Perth in Scotland in 1858, and at Broadmoor in England in 1863. New law was ordered that not only should those be received there who had committed a crime in a state of insanity, who had become insane during their trial, but also all prisoners who, whether from insanity or from idiocy, were incapable of undergoing prison discipline. These last are separate from the others and placed in particular sections. If cured, they are returned to prison, and others remain in prison as long as a royal order does not authorise their release. The number of these criminal maniacs in 1868 was 1,244. The character of the attendants, the attraction to the comfort of the inmates, and the arrangement for their employment and entertainment are all excellent. Yet many English philanthropists think they have not yet done enough, and complain that there are many persons in the ordinary prisons who should be confined in these asylums instead. In America, there are similar institutions, including an annex to the great penitentiary at Auburn. Now I ask myself, is it possible that institution which has been found useful by the most oligarchical nation in the world and also by the most democratic, which in 24 years has been so greatly extended without yet fully meeting the demands upon it. Is it possible that this is a mere luxury, a caprice of Anglo-Saxon race? Does it not rather correspond to a sad social need, and will not we, here in Italy, desire to see it take root and spread abroad in our land? Even in Italy and in France, the number of the criminal insane appears to be much smaller, this is because the public mind has not yet grasped the fact that a great number of criminal acts proceed from morbid impulses. If at times insanity is recognised as the sole cause of a crime and the trial is stopped, the authorities do not concern themselves further. Besides, many of these unfortunates have periods of rationality in the midst of their insanity and are supposed on this account to be merely feigning. From another point of view, the presence of these unfortunates in penal institutions is an offence to the moral sense, and is not without danger both for society and for discipline. They can neither be cared for nor washed properly because of lack of fit quarters and of suitable organisation. Further, they often act violently without sense of shame towards the other prisoners, and are so much more dangerous since they have sudden fits of excitement, often for the most trivial reasons. Thus an insane prisoner killed another of the convicts because he would not black his shoes for him. At the same time, they obstinately resist the prison discipline, show themselves indifferent to punishment, discontented and defiant, and make themselves a the centre of the pretext of continual insurrections. If they are kept isolated and chained in cells, as is too largely the custom, inaction and insufficient food and light soon make them the prey of disease, even if they do not themselves put an end to their unhappy existence. On the other hand, to send them to ordinary insane asylums gives rise to other inconveniences. They take their vices with them and become the disseminators of sodomy, flight, rebellion and theft, to the detriment of the institutions and of the other patients, who are terrified by their savage and obscene manners and by the unhappy reputation that has preceded them. There is another class of the insane who, at a certain period of their lives, have been victims of a criminal impulse. These have not the depraved tendencies of the first class, but they are not less dangerous, for they are often irresistibly driven to savage and unforeseen acts. They wound persons and burn buildings, surmounting with remarkable clearness of mind all the obstacles that oppose them. These are those of them who feign the most perfect tranquillity in order to obtain their liberty or to combine secretly for an escape or a plot. They do not avoid society as other insane persons do, but tend to associate among themselves, and as they preserve the restlessness of mind that they had before they became criminal or insane, they continually imagine that they are maltreated or insulted, and succeed in inspiring others with their false ideas, and in giving form little by little to plans of flight or rebellion. 
This again differentiates them from ordinary lunatics, who are quite incapable of such enterprises, but like somnambulists, live isolated in an imaginary world. All alienists are in agreement as to these facts, and I myself have had direct proof of them in the institutions of which I have been director. Thus air, an insane person already in prison for receiving stolen goods, complained incessantly of the injustice of the courts and of our treatment of him, which he did not find sufficiently respectful. He wrote absurd letters of protest to the king and to the prefect. One day he appeared entirely changed. He had become humbled and well-behaved. He had set himself to plotting with three other parties for a slaughter of the attendants, and a little later, while the attendants were engaged in distributing the soup at noon, he and his companions tore up part of the paving of the court and began to throw the stones in all directions. A few years later, an epileptic homicide did the same thing and nearly succeeded in putting the whole force of attendants to flight. Another insane criminal, a homicide with hallucinations, was so intelligent that although he was a poor shoemaker without education, he was able to write his autobiography in a style worthy of Cellini. This man conducted himself properly for two years, but one day there was discovered hidden in his bed a bar of iron which he had prepared for the express purpose of striking myself. Another day, having made a picklock of some pieces of wood, he opened two doors, let himself down from a window, and escaped. All instigators who have treated of this subject give examples of the danger of unexpected relapse into morbid tendencies on the part of individuals apparently harmless. The Burgomaster of Graz some years ago became the victim of a religious monomaniac who had already threatened the life of another person. Hatfield, before making his attempt upon the life of George III, had attempted to kill his wife and three children. Confined in Bedlam, he there killed an insane person. Booth, the assassin of Lincoln, had once thrown himself into the sea, to speak, as he said, with a colleague who had drowned himself. The harm of the unrestrained liberty given to insane criminals ends by extending itself to the whole nation. This is not simply because these unfortunates turn their homicidal thoughts towards the heads of the nation, but especially because, being endowed with a very clear mind and a tendency to form associations, they succeed, when the moment is favourable, in forming a baptism band. This is the more dangerous because the leaders, lacking balance of mind, are unable to control themselves. Backed upon the mind of the mob by the very fascination of their strangeness, and succeed in drawing them blindly after them. They are, we might say, firmer gems, powerless by themselves, but terrible in their effects when they can act at a given temperature and upon predisposed organism. Historic examples of this are to be found among the epidemics of insanity in the Middle Ages, among the Mormons and Methodists in America, in the incendiaries of Normandy in 1830, and in those of the Commune in Paris. We know now that, leaving aside the influence of certain rare idealists, the Commune was the effect of an epidemic delirium called forth by defeat and the abuse of absinthe, but especially by the great number of the insane, ambitious, homicidal, or even paralytic, free too soon from the asylums, who, finding in this overexcited population a propitious soil, unite and put into action their disastrous dreams. Le Bourde cites at least eight members of the commune who were notoriously insane, such as Eude, Ferre, Gopil, Lunier, and Florenz, and such was B., who nevertheless was elected by 10,000 votes. The horrors of the French Revolution also were often provoked by the delirium of homicidal maniacs like Marat and Terriogne. The Marquise de Sade was president of the section of the pikemen. The only remedy for all these evils is unquestionably the institution of asylums for the criminal insane. If these received legal recognition and the position were unequivocally fixed, the continual conflict between justice and public safety would cease a conflict which now is renewed every time one of these unfortunates come to trial and an attempt is made to determine how far he was driven by morbid impulses and how far by the perversity of his own will. In doubt, the judges exaggerate themselves, now by injustice, now by imprudence, and later when they blot in the sentence of a man who appears insane or acquits him altogether. The former, when as or as, too often happens, they condemn, perhaps to death, one whom an alias would recognise at once as insane. Many will object, it is true, that if we allow ourselves to be led by these considerations, 
which would end by punishing no one. But the same objections were raised against those who opposed the burning of those insane unfortunates whom men called witches. This position should not be ascribed to a sentimental pity, dangerous to others, for the measure is preventive even more than humanitarian. Since if those unjustly convicted are numerous, those imprudently acquitted are not less so. The thing to be done then is to prevent them from returning to society, to which they are a great source of danger, until we have every assurance that they have become perfectly harmless. It may be objected again that it is easy to confuse those who feign insanity with those who are really insane, and in fact, the number of these is very great among criminals. But the most recent studies have shown us that mistakes are made only because so many observers are ignorant of the connection between moral insanity and crime, and because, moreover, it is very difficult to make a true diagnosis, since many of the persons pretending insanity are really predisposed to it, so that in a short time they become actually insane, or are genuinely insane persons who, ignorant of their true disease, easily pretend an artificial one. Further, these patients often present very rare forms of mental disturbance, and on this account the distrust of the physician is quite rightly aroused. Jacobi tells that he had to change his opinion four times about an insane person who appeared to be feigning insanity, but proved to be really insane. A thief who was pronounced by Delbruck to be feigning insanity starved himself to death. Another pretended that he had in his right leg a disease that he had in reality in his left. A homicidal monomaniac imitated in prison a form of insanity which he did not have, and did this, as he told me, to escape sentence. But if some criminals really succeed in feigning insanity, the perpetual seclusion in a hospital for the insane will be punishment enough, even if modern society, not content with defending itself against them, still wishes to revenge itself upon them. Insane criminals, in fact, complain incessantly of being kept in the hospitals, and demand without cries to return to prison. There is, for example, the case of Trocerello, who would not be allowed his consul to defend him as insane, preferring to be executed to being immured in an insane asylum. Would not the asylum for the criminal insane be the best means of making such criminals harmless? I do not know whether Vecker merely pretended to be insane, or was really so, but if he had been permanently confined in an insane asylum, the lives of several men would have been spared. Weidmeister objects, further, that the asylums for the criminal insane in England are often the theatre of sad scenes of blood, and require for their maintenance three times the expense of the others. This is true for the tendency to make plots. Very rarely in the ordinary asylums is, on the contrary, very frequent in the criminal asylums, since the inmates know that they will never be released, and furthermore, being conscious of their impunity, destroy clothing and utensils, attack the attendants, wound and kill. In 1868, there occurred at Broadmoor 72 cases of which attendants were injured, two of them very seriously, and the daily expense especially great because of the damage done by the insane and the high pay given the attendants reached five francs for each insane person. There is nothing, however, to wonder at in that, or should it cause any serious opposition, for it is natural that the bringing together of so many dangerous individuals should bring great dangers with it, especially to the poor attendants, who notwithstanding the high wages, so not remain long in the service. But if it were not for the asylums for the criminal insane, these things would occur in the ordinary asylums. Besides, the subdivisions recently introduced by Orange at Broadmoor have greatly improved conditions. First, the convicts are separated from the others, and those who have been indicted but not convicted. Finally, the ordinary prisoners who have been sentenced for short terms of crimes of little moment are returned to the country asylums. The government has carried the reform to completion and removed all inconveniences by setting aside one wing at the working prison for convicts who become insane while in prison. The statistics of asylums for the criminal insane show that they have a noticeably lower mortality rate than the general asylums. This is an encouragement to establish more of these institutions, at the same time proof that conditions in them are not as bad as has been represented. The expense does not appear to be so excessive when one compares it with the cost of caring, not for ordinary insane persons, but for the violent insane, who needing double watchfulness occasion a considerable expense. It is necessary also to take into account the expenses occasioned by escapes, frequent in the case of the violent. In Massachusetts, this expense has been estimated at not less than $25 a day, while the escaped lunatic is at large. 
This is even one of the reasons that led the state to erect an asylum for the criminal insane. We may add that the expense could be considerably diminished by transferring to the asylum a number of the better penitentiary guards and advanced pay. In this way, the frequent changes of attendance would be avoided. At the same time, men accustomed to this sort of danger and not easily intimidated would be secured. Finally, the number of inmates might be cut down by removing criminals who become inoffensive, by eliminating those who come from prison in an accurate state of insanity, and are therefore, as the experience of Gutsch and Bruxelles shows, more likely to be cured, and also by retaining in the prison infirmary, under strict surveillance, those prisoners who are suspected of feigning insanity. End of section 29「Section 31 of Crime as Causes and Remedies by Cesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4. Practical Proofs of the Utility of These Reforms. England, Switzerland. Subchapter 239. The utility of these reforms is proved by the recent statistics of London and Geneva, where there has been a perceptible decrease in criminality, while on the contrary, crime is increasing in countries like Italy and Spain, where such reforms have not been applied. In the period between 1829 and 1838, there were a court at Geneva for each 100,000 inhabitants, 79 criminals convicted by the criminal court, and 1,000 by the correctional tribunal, while between 1872 and 1885, there were a court 12 of the former and 300 of the latter. Is to say, between the two periods, the serious crimes decreased by five six, and the minor offences by two thirds. This is certainly a great honour to the city, and the facts are even stronger for the crimes committed by the Genovese themselves had decreased nearly nine tenths in the last eighty years. What are the causes that make Geneva an oasis of morality in the midst of Europe? Guinand attributes it in the first place to the fact that foreigners who have been for some time residents in Geneva, have taken up the customs and morals of the natives. And the observation of Jolly is to the same effect, namely that the immigrants at first contribute largely to the criminality, but as they become established in their new country, they gain in morality and honesty. But Ladin murders by way of objection. The assimilation of foreigners to the natives does not prevent immigration. The same causes consequently continue to be active, and if on one side of the population of Geneva annually assimilates a certain number of foreigners, the result of moral influence is neutralised by new immigrants whose influence is the other way. Nor can we look for the cause in education, since we have seen that this very often increases at least the minor forms of criminality. The sole reason remaining is, then, that Geneva, see part 2, chapter 6, is certainly that place in central Europe where there have been established the greatest number of institutions for mutual aid, which, without degrading the recipient's remedy, the greatest evils of poverty, and also preventive institutions for children, for degraded women, against alcoholism, etc. The proof of this conclusion appears more clearly still in England, especially in London, if we compare the criminality there in the years 1892-93. to With those of the ten years preceding, we find an increase of 28% in the offences against persons, and 18.9% in those against property, caused by a desire for vengeance and taking the form of arson or the destroying of crops. But in other crimes, theft, receiving stolen goods, forgery, offences against the public order, etc., the decrease was respectively 8.8%, 36.3%, 34%, 34 and 22.2%, with a total absolute decrease of 8%. Now it must be noted that in these 10 years the population increased 12%, so that even if there had been as much as an absolute increase of 12% in the criminality, it would mean that relatively to the population, crime was not on the increase in England. The degree there in the criminality of minors, which in Italy continues to increase, is still more remarkable. In 1868-69, there was recorded the conviction of 10,000 children less than 16 years of age. In the succeeding years, the figures fell to 9,700 and finally to 4,000. Thus we find that, taking into account of the increase in population, England recorded in 1868, 69 and 70 46 juvenile criminals to the 100,000 inhabitants. In 1893, there were only 14, a real decrease of 70% on the 
while it appears that in France in 1889, the number of juvenile offenders had increased 140% in 50 years. Criminal classes of England are composed of individuals at liberty, known to be thieves or receivers of stolen goods, and of persons under suspicion. Here also there is an improvement. In 1867, this last category comprised taking prisoners and those at liberty together, 87,000 individuals. This figure fell later to 50,000 in 1881 to 38,960, and finally in 1891, 1992, to 29,826. The suspected houses fell from 2,688 to 2,360. We do not have here those accidental variations in figures common in statistics, for they show such a decided difference that no doubt can remain. They extend even to unpublished crime. This great decrease in criminality is actually due to preventive measures, especially those which have to do with children, and to the moral and religious fight against alcoholism. We find an incontestable proof of this in the great diminution of crime in London, as compared with the smaller cities and with the country. This is exactly the opposite of what is observed elsewhere, since the general rule is a greater criminality of the principal cities. And while the city of London, which has the largest population of any city in the civilized world, records 15 suspected persons to 100,000 inhabitants, the country shows 61 and the other cities 50. Further, while London has 3.4 suspected houses to each 100,000 inhabitants, the country has 3.9 and the other cities 8.4. We have another proof of the influence of preventive measures in the diminution of alcoholism which has taken place in just those districts of England and Switzerland, where the religious and purely ethical societies vie with the state in striking at the evil at its very source. While in France the sale of alcoholic drinks increased from 365,995 in 1869 to 417,518 in 1893, and from 1.82 litres to each inhabitant in 1830 to 4.2 in 1893. In England, on the contrary, the consumption per capita has fallen in recent years from 7 litres to 5, and Switzerland from 11 litres to 7. Subchapter 240. Born Criminals. It would be a mistake, however, to imagine that the measures which have been shown to be effective with other criminals could be successfully applied to born criminals, for these are, for the most part, refractory to all treatment, even the most affectionate care being at the very cradle as Barnardo finally became convinced, such as Jack, whom he placed in conditions best fitted to reform him, but who escaped repeatedly to live a life of eager bondage, while the less advanced papals are lingering over the utopias of the old jurists and believing that reform is possible for criminals, are taking no measures against the continually rising tide of crime. The English, more provident, have recognised that although they have been able, by their efforts, to eliminate the accidental criminal almost entirely, the born criminal still persists. They are the only nation to admit the existence of criminals who resist or cure, the professional criminals, as they call them, and the criminal classes. It will not be useless for the benefit of those who limit the causes of crime to education and environment. To verify this with figures, while crime in England has decreased by 8%, Recidivism among male criminals has remained stationary or nearly so. The English statistics, in fact, show 41.7% of recidivism in 1892-93 and 45% in 1894-95. In the case of the women, recidivism has increased from 54.6% to 60.4%, and this notwithstanding the fact that the preventive institutions for women in London are much more numerous than those for men. But all efforts break down against the corruption encouraged by prostitution, and against the increasing alcoholism of women. No one ever knew of a man, says Paulusi, who has reached 500 convictions for drunkenness, like Tessie J, or even 250, like Jane Cakebread. We have seen in this connection how the introduction of agricultural colonies has lessened theft and vacant bondage in Westphalia. We must say, however, that this system can be of use only for occasional criminals, or for vagrants who are such from lack of work, while it is of no value for born vagabonds. We have a proof of this in an experiment which we tried in Paris. According to the economist Francius, 1893, a certain person arranged to obtain positions in stores, factories, etc., at four francs a day, for all persons presenting a letter from himself. 
In eight months, he offered this letter to 727 beggars who complained that they were starving because of lack of work. More than half, 415 of these, did not even call for the letter. 130 got the letter, but did not present it to any employer. Others worked for half a day, drew their two francs, and did not return. In short, out of the whole 727, and the eight continued at work. Taking simply those who took the letter, we say that out of every forty beggars able to work, only one has a sincere desire to do so. Even if the young people whom Bernardo sent to Canada were reformed, out of those who emigrated to the same country from the reform school at Red Hill, forty-two percent returned worse than before, notwithstanding the one thousand pounds spent for the Reformation. Jolly. End of section thirty-one. Section 32 of Crime, Its Causes and Remedies by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Hardy. Chapter 5. Practical Application to the Criticism of Criminal Law. To Expert Testimony, Pedagogy, Art and Science. Subchapter 241. All these facts prove abundantly that criminal anthropology not only solves the theoretical problems of law, but suggests useful lessons in the struggle of society against crime. While ancient penal science, the more it rose into the exalted regions of jurisprudence, the more it lost touch with practice and less it knew how to protect us. Subject 242. Political Crime one of the newest and at the same time most practical applications of criminal anthropology is that which takes into account the fact that men's hatred of the new is the judicial basis of political crime. From the study of the physiognomy and biology of the political criminal, it establishes a difference between a real revolution, a useful or productive thing, and mere revolts, which are always sterile and harmful. It is a fact now definitely recognised and one of which I have given proofs in my crime politique, that those who start great scientific and political revolutions are almost always young, endowed with genius or with a singular altruism, and a fine physiognomy, and far from presenting the insensibility common in born criminals, they are, on the contrary, marked by a real moral and physical hyperesthesia. But if on the matures of a great social and religious idea we pass to rebels, religious eyes, and presidenticides, such as Fraichi and Gatau, to the promoters of the massacres of 1793, such as Carrier, Jordan, and Matt, and to the anarchists. We see that all, or nearly all, are of a criminal type. These are rebels. Subchapter 243. Application to Psychiatric Expert Testimony. Medical experts and practical penologists who have studied criminal anthropology have become convinced of the value of this science in recognizing the real culprit and deciding how far an accomplice has participated in a crime. Hitherto, these things have had to be determined from unreliable indications, such as prison confessions and vague official information. I will cite as proof of this the following examples. 1. Bresson Pierre, 37 years of age, was known as a thief had been arrested under charge of having stolen 20,000 francs upon the railroad. In prison he feigned madness, pretended that someone had poisoned him. It was soon plain that he had committed many other thefts, since he was found in possession of a number of documents and passports, among others that of a certain Torelli. The result of an anthropological examination was as follows. Mean cranial capacity, 1,589cc. Cephalic index, 77 Type of physiognomy, completely criminal. Touch, nearly normal. Tongue, 1.9 mm, between points perceived separately. Right hand, 2, 3, left hand, 1, 2. The sensorial mechanism. General sensibility and sensibility to pain, very obtuse. 48 mm and 10 mm, respectively, on the adjustable Rumkorf coil, as against 61 mm and 24 mm for the normal man. An investigation with a hydrophysmograph confirmed me in my observation of his great insensibility to pain, which did not change the physiomatic lines. 
the same apathy persisted when he was spoken to at the robbery on the railroad. While there was an enormous depression, a fall of 40 millimetres, when the Turley theft was mentioned, I concluded, therefore, that he had had no part in the railway robbery, but that he had certainly participated in the Turley affair. My conclusions were completely verified. 2. Maria Gall of Lucera, city six years of age, was found dead in her bed, her face to the mattress, and her nostrils bloody, bruised and lacerated inside. Suspicion at once directed itself against her two stepsons, M and F, men of bad reputation who had been seen roaming in the neighbourhood during the day and alone had an interest in the death of the victim, since she was about to purchase a life annuity which would have disinherited them. At the autopsy there was shown to be all the internal marks of advance, putrefaction and asphyxiation, and the esophagus was found an intestinal worm resting upon the opening of the glottis. Two experts pronounced it to be the case of asphyxia, produced by violent suffocation through the victims being held with her face against the bolster, the worm having been drawn there only through a fit of coughing. Another expert admitted the asphyxia, but was not willing to deny the possibility of it having been caused by the worm. Called in, in my turn, as a consulting expert, I was able at least to observe that death from asphyxia produced by intestinal worms are found only in infants and insane persons, and that then marked phenomena of reaction appear, which in this case were completely wanting. Further, that the witness, C, declared that he had heard stuffled cries and the sound of blows on the night of the crime in the direction of the chamber of the victim, and especially that M, the accused person, was judicially and anthropologically suspected of the crime, which he had been openly accused by his brother, who, much less criminal than he, was less obstinate in his denials. M was, in fact, the most perfect type of the born criminal. Enormous jaws, frontal sinuses, and zygomata, thin upper lip, huge incisors, unusually large head, 1,620 cc, tactile obtuseness, 4 mm right, 2 mm left, with sensorial mancinism. He was convicted. 3. A rich farmer, S., returning from market with 2,000 francs about him, was asked by an unknown man seeking work to take him into the carriage with him. From then on, this person did not leave him. They supped together and were seen towards evening going along the high road, where the following night the unfortunate farm was found assassinated, bearing the marks of strangulation, his head shattered with great stones and his purse empty. Four witnesses called the judge's attention to the sinister physiognomy of the unknown man, and a young girl declared that she had seen, in the evening, sleeping near the murdered man, a certain Vazio, who was observed the next day hiding himself when the gendarmes approached the neighbourhood. Upon examination, I found that this man had outstanding ears, great maxillaries and cheekbones, limerine appendix, division of the frontal bone, premature wrinkles, sinister look, nose twisted to the right, in short, a physiognomy approaching the criminal type. Pupils very slightly mobile, reflexes the tendon quicker on the right side than on the left. Great tactile obtuseness, more in the right hand, 5 mm, than in the left, 4 mm. Motor and sensorial mansonism. Large picture of a woman tattooed upon his breast with the words, Remembrance of Selina Lura, his wife. And on his arm, the picture of a girl. He had an epileptic aunt and an insane cousin and investigation showed that he was a gambler and idler. In every way, then, biology furnished in this case indications which, joined with the other evidence, would have been enough to convict him in a country less tender toward criminals. Notwithstanding, he was acquitted. Subchapter 244. Proof of Innocence. Criminal anthropology can not only help us to discover the real culprits, but may also serve, or at least rehabilitate, Innocent persons accused were convicted. Such a case occurred where a little girl, three and a half years old, was violated and affected by an unknown man, and her mother accused successfully six young men who lived on the same staircase and were familiar with the child. They were arrested, but all denied the crime. I picked out immediately one among them who had obscene tattooing upon his arm, a sinister physiognomy, irregularities on the field of vision, and also traces of a recent attack of syphilis. Later, the individual confessed his crime. A case observed in my clinic and published by Rossi in 
una centuria di criminali revealed the innocence of a convict a certain rosotto Giancito, as a consequence of a series of false declarations and a letter received from his brother-in-law begging him to give false testimony was condemned to imprisonment for life for highway robbery examining this man before my students i found to my great surprise that this was the most normal individual i had ever investigated he was fifty years old his height was one point seven three meters he weighed seventy four point five kilograms his hair and beard were abundant mean cranial capacity one thousand five hundred seventy five cc cephalic index eighty four and he was without facial anomaly his sense of touch was very fine one point one millimeters for the right hand one point zero for the left and point five for the tongue his general sensibility was normal fifty and sensibility to pain thirty he was ignorant of thieves slaying and was not cynical he showed the condition of mind common to the average man he was fond of work which had been his only consolation during the long years of his captivity his conduct had always been exemplary even in prison he had shown no vexation except at his unjust condemnation and his separation from his family married at nineteen years he had never had intercourse with any other woman than his wife and his family included neither insane persons nor criminals while i was examining him not yet knowing anything of his antecedents i said to my students if this man had not been sentenced for life he would represent to me the true type of the average honest man it was then that the unfortunate man quietly answered but i am an honest man and i can prove it he put in my possession numerous documents proving his perfect honesty such as deathbed declarations of the real authors of the crime with which he had been charged he swore before the justice of the peace they had no part in the crime attestations of prison directors etc his neighbours of whom i made inquiries with regard to him declared that he was a perfectly honest man subchapter two hundred and forty five pedagogy to our school is owing still another application direct to no less useful namely the application of pedagogy anthropological examination by pointing out the criminal type the precocious development of the body the lack of symmetry the smallness of the head and the exaggerated size of the face explains the scholastic and disciplinary shortcomings of children thus marked and permits them to be separated in time from their better endowed companions and directed towards careers more suited to their temperament and sometimes it may even point the way to a cure through immigration moral education and medical treatment subject 246 art letters in literature itself we can see a last application of this new science not only in the interpretation of masterpieces in which genius has already anticipated some of the results of criminal anthropology as shakespeare in macbeth and lear and Wirtz in anthropdeten but also in suggesting new forms of art as in the admirable works of dostojewski tottenhaus and schild and schun in zola's betwemain Garbarg's Corporal Tenebro, Og Andre Skildringer, Ibsen's Hedda Gabler, and Des Nudios Innocente. And why should we not count among our triumphs the new applications that have been made to the most distant branches of science? Thus, Max Nordau has found in our science a basis for the criticism of artistic, philosophical, and literary creations. In the same way, Ferry and the Ford have made an application of it to the criticism of the great masters of painting and the drama and now sigel ferrero and bianchi have applied it to modern history and politics when a collective crime rises suddenly as a strange and explicable phenomena in modern society the researchers into the special crime of mobs explain it for us admirably at the same time they teach us to defend ourselves against such crimes as the preventive measures counseled by philanthropy otherwise a cruel reaction would certainly follow with universal approval and the wound would be poisoned instead of healed end of section thirty two